going to be talking about a lot of things today. If you want to audio tape, that's fine. No videotaping allowed, period, under any circumstances. I suggest that you all take notes because the truth is, is that no matter how smart we think we are, and me included, we usually retain only about 10% of anything that we hear. This is going to be intensive. For about six hours, I'm going to bombard you with information. So if you don't take notes, when you leave here, you're going to say, now what did he say about that? And uh, it, 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 the purpose of this is to leave you with something. I want you to go out of here with a, a good understanding of the information that I'm going to cover. My purpose is not to change your religion. My purpose is not to uh, make you believe everything that I say. On the contrary, I'm the only one in the world that will tell you, listen to everyone, read everything, believe absolutely nobody, including me, including your mother, including your pastor, your preacher, your priest, your Uncle Bob, and anybody else that you can think of, unless you can prove it in your own research. And research doesn't mean getting a book off the library shelf and reading it and saying, well, he said it, so it must be true. Because I wrote a book, you see. And I'm telling you, don't believe me, unless in your own research, you can prove what it is that I'm telling you. Because this is the age of deception. And if you don't believe that, you might as well go home right now, because you're in the wrong place. This is the age of deception. And everybody today is living in a fantasy world, and they're promoting agendas that they don't understand, because somebody has told them that it's the right thing to do and they generally believe it. Most people go to the church that they go to simply because their parents did and for no other reason. Most people who are Democrats are Democrats because their parents were. Are they Republicans because their parents were? If you ask them what is a Republican they couldn't tell you in a hundred million years. They don't know. They vote that way because that's comfortable for them because that's what they grew up with. Most of us do what we do because we grew up in it. So there is an awful lot about this environment around you shapes who and what you are. It's the truth. I had a uh, woman at the post office where we lived the other day say, I listen to your radio station every day. It's wonderful. But when Bill's show comes on, I turn it off because I don't want to be brainwashed. What is she admitting to? She's admitting that she's already been brainwashed because she is unwilling to listen to opposing viewpoints. That's the biggest number one sign of brainwashing that there is. It didn't matter that it was my show. It's any show. Any opposing viewpoint. Anything that opposes the status quo, if you won't listen to it, you're already brainwashed. You've closed your mind and you are at the mercy of whatever manipulation they want to throw your way because you've already determined that they're telling you the truth no matter what. You don't investigate. You have accepted blindly. That's the most dangerous thing that can happen to anyone. The moment that you say, this guy right here, I like him. I like what he says. He's right. I'm going to listen to him. And anybody that says anything different to him is wrong. You've just totally destroyed yourself. Because the truth is, he's a human being. I'm a human being. This young lady is a human being. Bill Clinton is a human being. Okay? When you mistake, when you mistake people for righteousness, or when you mistake people for the message, or when you mistake people for government, or when you mistake people for religion, you're making a big mistake. Because people, for the most part, are a big mistake. Does everybody understand what I'm trying to tell you? We are subject to temptations. We are subject to our own carnal desires, lusts, and, and uh, um, well, I could probably go through a list of about 500 things that 
can make an average, normal, good thinking, good doing person for most of the time, at some point in their life, do something that's absolutely terrible. Most of us are here and not in jail because most of us, when we did whatever it was that was so terrible in our life already, and everybody here, without exception, has done something like that, we got away with it, didn't we? Okay. The concept that imperfect men can rule imperfect men is absolutely ludicrous. The concept that you can give someone power and they're not going to abuse that power is also ludicrous. It is wrong for us to ever get into that kind of thinking. And the more power you give someone, the more opportunity they have to abuse or misuse that power. And the easier it is to fall into temptation for them. Now, I've got to tell most of you right now, I don't like Bill Clinton any more than you do, but it's wrong. It is absolutely wrong of us to judge Bill Clinton. What we can say is we don't want him as president. He shouldn't be running the government. But unless you've walked in his shoes, unless you know what temptations he's fallen prey to, or what people have offered him to be and do what he is and what he does, being imperfect humans ourselves, it's not right to do that. If you're a Christian, you know, judge not lest ye be judged, right? So it's wrong for us to do that. It's okay to call him a communist because he is. Okay? It's okay to tell the truth. Truth is what I'm all about. And believe me, sometimes I get caught in the deception just like everybody else, but it's not as easy to catch me in the deception as it is to catch most of you. Because I've been caught too many times, and I learn from my mistakes. And I spend 99% of my time searching out the truth where none of you have ever looked. Some of you may have looked in some of the areas and some of the things that I've looked in, but I can guarantee you there's nobody in this room who has looked where I've looked as long as I have looked as diligently as I have done it. Okay? Now, what I'm going to try to do today is sort of give you some of what I've learned. And you can take it for whatever you think it's worth. I hope that you will take it out of here and use it to search for your own truth. Truth is not always cut and dried. It's not always black and white. You can't get into the concept that, hey, this is right and that is wrong and there is no in-between because that's not true. There are all kinds of in-between all the time. And truth is elusive, folks. I have to tell you this. It's elusive at best and it's hard to find. And the moment you think you know it all, you have lost yourself again. It's one of the major things that I've discovered in my life. Is by the time we reach an age where we understand we need to learn something that we don't really know at all, it's usually in the late 30s or sometime in the 40s. If you've discovered that earlier than that, you are the exception, you are not the norm. Because it isn't true that during the first years of our life, we're just discovering the world around us. We're subject to the authority of our parents and... Doyle, why don't you go ahead and put it up here. It won't bother me a bit. All right. <clears throat> we're subject to the dictates of our parents, the authority of our parents, our preacher, our minister, um, high school teachers, principals, the community at large. And isn't it true that during those years we're basically trying to serve some sense of discover who we are and what the world is about and not really what the truth is. Sort of fit our way into it whether we think we belong or not. And isn't it true that during those years the major preoccupation with most people is to be liked by everybody else? Isn't that what most of us spend most of our time in high school doing? Trying to be liked by everybody else? 
so that instead of looking for the truth or doing the right thing, we do what we think the other children around us would like for us to do so that they will like us. Now, it's not bad to admit that because it's a human thing. And every person in their younger years goes through that. Then we get into our later teens and our early 20s, and, and what is the major preoccupation on everybody's mind? Sex, right? Anybody who says no, I'll call them a liar to their face. It's sex. Whether you'll admit it or not, it's the truth. And because to be involved in that activity, or to have someone, whether you're involved in actually having sex or not, but the sexuality of being with someone else, you have to have a job. And you have to have a car. And you have to be able to talk the talk and walk the walk, right? So that takes up our life. And then sometime, usually in the later 20s, some guy sets out to get a girl and she traps him. <laughs> right? So they get married. Some people don't. And that's to their great credit because personally, folks, after having lived my life and being honest with myself, any woman who marries a man before he's the age of 36 is a fool. Because most men aren't ready for that. They're not mature enough and you're just asking for trouble. But people have done it and succeeded. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. <laughs> But that's what in, we're all wrapped up in that stuff. And none of it really means anything. Because it's all going to happen to you anyway. If you are just doing the right thing, you're going to attract the right people. And if you're a man, the right woman's going to come along. And if you're a, a woman, the right guy's going to come along. If you're involved in doing right things. But the problem is, we try to make it happen. And that's where we get in trouble. And we ignore all the most important things that we should be involved in in our life that really matter because this these other things are just natural things that are going to happen you can't make somebody like you in high school whatever in the world made us think that that we could make people like us if we just go along and do what we're supposed to do and just be ourselves people are going to like us but we think we have to make it happen or we think if we do this or we do that, Susie's going to like us more and uh, we're going to have the hot date we've always dreamed about. Well, you might, but as soon as Susie finds out that it's all phony, it's all going to fall apart anyway, right? Okay. So by the time we're in our late 30s or sometime in our 40s, it's usually when we begin to discover what's really important in life. Now, if you don't believe that, look around in this room and look at the age of everybody in here. See, if I was lying, this room would be full of 16-year-olds and 20-year-olds and 25-years-olds, but it's not, is it? What's the average age of everybody in here? Late 30s and 40s, right? So I'm telling you the truth, aren't I? By the time we reach that stage, if we make a concerted effort to learn everything that we need to know, and begin to really do the right things, we don't have enough time left. That's why I devote every single moment that I have in my life to this. Because there just isn't enough time. And even if I do the very best job that I can possibly do, I can't complete the task that I need to, to complete before I'm going to pass on into another reality. And so it's so important to me that you get something from me and take it and continue with what I'm doing. The whole nation needs to be doing this. Now I'm going to talk about this country and what it's all about. Some of you are going to disagree with me. And during this talk today and tomorrow, I'm going to make some of you angry. And I want you to understand this. 
If what I'm telling you up here is not true, it's not going to bother you. You're a rapist! Did that bother anybody in here? Anybody get bothered by that? No. You know why? Because there's no rapists in here. If I said, you're a rapist, and somebody got up and started yelling at me and ran out the door, you'd know I hit somebody, wouldn't you? Okay. On my radio show, I use the term sheeple a lot. I can always tell when I hit the targets, boy, I get the letters. How dare you call me a sheeple? <laughs> that person wouldn't have wrote that letter if that person wasn't a sheeple. Because they would have known I wasn't talking about them. Right? Only the person that the arrow hits gets angry. So the reason I'm telling you this, if you find what I'm talking about disturbing, I'm hitting you with some truth that is bothering you. That's really bothering you and you need to look at it really closely. Because it wouldn't be bothering you if it wasn't true. If it wasn't pinging on you personally with something that you know inside of you is not right, it's not going to upset you. And that's the truth. Okay. <clears throat> There are a lot of people who are extremely critical of my radio broadcast because they say I spend too much time on symbology and history and the mystery religions and all of these things that they write me letters and say, it doesn't, I, I don't care about that. It doesn't mean anything. Why don't you get into some nitty gritty? Well, they don't understand that is the nitty gritty. He who does not study and understand history is doomed to repeat it. And the same play has been being performed throughout the history of the world by what we call the builders, the controllers, the puppet masters, whatever you want to call them. And I'm going to start right at the beginning and tell you exactly who they are and how to identify them. Okay? Because there really are puppet masters, there really are controllers, there really are builders, but they're not engaged in building buildings, they're engaged in building people. They're building what they call the perfect race. They're perfecting humanity in order to control nature. They're building the utopian world that they perceive that we need. I said, who's we? We who? You didn't ask me about this. You know? And that's the problem with these guys. They have placed themselves in, a, in an elitist attitude to tell the rest of us what we need. And the truth is, we don't need them to do that. Okay? They haven't got the right to do that. They think they do, because they think we're just a bunch of stupid cattle. And i got to tell you, for the most part, most people prove them right all the time. Not intentionally, but because the knowledge, the truth has been withheld from the people. And that's how they manipulate people, is by withholding the truth and controlling them with the lies. Okay? Now... First, I got to start off here. I got to ask you a question. What's the most important thing about this country that you can think of? And I want to see some hands and hear some answers. This is a participation sport when you come in here with me. Okay? Yes, sir. Recognition of God-given rights. God rights. Okay. Individual liberty. Individual liberty. Freedom. Freedom. No king but King Jesus. Sound money. Sound money. Okay, now I'm going to ask you another question. Which one of those, because somebody already gave the right answer, which one of those do you think is the right answer? Everybody all at once. Freedom. 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 Why? Because none of the rest of them would exist without it. You couldn't have any of the rest of them without the freedom to do it. You give somebody the power, 
to say you can't have one king but King Jesus, and you're not going to have King Jesus, you're not going to have Christianity, you're not going to have a church. In fact, if they catch you saying the word Jesus, they're liable to chop your head off and throw your body to the lions. Isn't that correct? Okay. The greatest thing about this country, whether you agree with me or not, it's the absolute truth. If you take this away from any person or any group of people, you have no country freedom. You have no religion. You have no sound money. You don't have any of it. You're subject to the control of the people who have taken your freedom away and who are now subjecting you to their will because that's what lack of freedom is. Being subject. You know what subject means? To someone else's will. Freedom means you're subject to your own will. As long as what? As long as you take responsibility for your actions and you never hurt the person or property of any other human being. Period. If you do, you put yourself at war with someone else. Is that freedom? No. Then you're taking someone else's freedom away. You have become the bad guy when you do that. How many of you have heard of Dave Emery? Talk show host. KGO, San Francisco. Anybody? The other day he called me that famous fascist. Do I sound like a fascist? <laughs> no. But you see, that's part of the manipulation. Because. Pardon? He has a one-track mind. No, he has an agenda, is what he has. <laughs> yeah. He's not really thinking. He's fulfilling an agenda. He has an agenda. He's a socialist. He doesn't want people to listen to me who tell you that freedom is the most important thing in the world because socialism can't have people walking around saying like things like that. Because socialism doesn't give you freedom. They want you to think it does. Aren't they trying to bombard you with the delusion that liberals are for freedom? Liberals are for socialism. Liberals started out being for freedom when there wasn't any. Being for freedom was liberal. Being conservative was for the power of the king. Remember? All of our founding fathers were liberals. Believe it. They were also traitors. So when somebody calls me a, a traitor because... Uh, I'm supposedly against the government. It doesn't bother me. I'm in damn good company. But you see, I'm not a traitor. Because what is the government? We are not the government. No, we're not even supposed to be. What is the government? The government is a contract signed by the Founding Fathers, which is called the Constitution for the United States of America. That is the government. That says what the government can do, what the government cannot do, when it can do it, when it cannot do it, where it can do it, where it cannot do it. Are you parties to that contract? Huh? Nope. No, you're not. How can you be party to a contract you didn't sign? You can't be. So it's a contract entered into between the signatories representing the first 13 colonies in order to establish a union of independent sovereign states for their mutual benefit and protection. Correct? Am I right? Okay. Only those who signed it and those whom they legally and lawfully represented are really bound to it. Is that correct? Yeah. No. <laughs> now, don't get into all this posterity stuff, because posterity is only bound to it if they want to be. How do you get bound to it? You're in a territory which wants to become a state. 
and by vote you agree to become bound to it and are accepted as a state of the union. You understand that? Okay. Why? Because you elected representatives to act in your behalf. Is that correct? Okay. Is that a democracy? No. no. Is this a democratic country? No. no. Was it ever meant to be? No. Never. no. Never. So why do we hear all this talk about democracy all the time? It's the agenda to brainwash the American populace into accepting democracy, which is what? The first step into socialism. Why? No, because in our human failings and in our temptations, if it's one man, one vote, the majority is going to vote themselves everything, right? And if you vote yourself everything, what is that? The state owes me a job. We're going to vote that the state has to give us all a job. We're going to vote that the state is responsible for making sure that I have X number of dollars a year, so we're going to vote that there's going to be a minimum income for everybody in the country. That's socialism. Lenin, V.I. Lenin, you all know who he is? The man who founded the Soviet Union? V.I. Lenin said, democracy is indispensable to socialism. You can take a free people, make them into a democracy from whatever they were before, and they will vote themselves into slavery every single time because they are weak. They want the benefits. They want the check from the government. They want the job from the government. They want a car from the government. They want medical care from the government. They want everything from the government. What's the fallacy in that? The government doesn't have anything to give you unless they first take it away from you. Right? Now, for somebody who works and is productive, they don't like that. That's not good, is it? Somebody, however, who is a weak victim, that's great, isn't it? Because they don't have to do anything anymore, do they? They can just sit back and be provided for. Have you noticed all across the country right now, they are creating victim classes of people? Why do you think that is? Because victims need care. Once you create a victim that needs care, you have another vote for socialism, don't you? Most of it is a scam. When I grew up as a boy, I lived all over the world. I remember one period of time when I was in junior high. That's seventh and eighth grade. I lived in Midwest City, which is right outside of Oklahoma City. I went to Midwest City Monroney Junior High School, which had just been built. We were the first students in that school. Nobody locked their doors. I never knew a girl that got pregnant. Never, ever, not once. Never knew anybody who was divorced. Never knew anybody whose home was robbed. I had my bicycle tire cut one time by a kid who didn't like me. <laughs> Big deal. You know, what's that? Three bucks for a new tire. And, of course, I bloodied his nose. <laughs> we both got whipped by our parents. Him for slitting my bicycle tire, me for bloodying his nose. I didn't care. He didn't care either. We lived in a different world than we live in today. Everybody earned a living. Everybody who wanted to work had a job. I don't care who it was. And the only thing that could hold them back would be the lack of an education, which was available to everybody, except in some extreme rural areas of this country where there really was poverty, lack of education, and inability to get good work because they didn't have that education. Now you see people coming in this country complaining about these things that have no legitimate complaint. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not pinging on immigrants. 
Because if I lived in a place that was so terrible I couldn't support my family or put a roof over my head or even find a toilet to go to the bathroom, I would be coming across this border just as quick as they are. You can't fault them for that. It's illegal. You can fault the government for allowing it to happen because it's illegal, it's unlawful. And they're always talking about we've got to follow the law. Truth is, we only have to follow the law that they think is okay. Why do they want these people coming across our borders? Because these people are helpless. They're without money, they're without a home, they're without a job. What are they? Victims. What do victims bring? Give them the vote and you're going to have socialism. That's why they don't try to stem the flood of immigration. It furthers the agenda of socialism. I feel sorry for those people. They're being used. And their only thought is to find a good place where they can have a good life for themselves and their children. They're being used and abused. And they all become good little Democrats. They all vote socialist. And they all want their handouts from under Uncle Sam. There are some who came into this country many years ago of many different nationalities who have learned the American way. Our good Americans are not immigrants. They are Americans. And they've established and have a sound place in this country. They're part of it. But they're being used. They can't speak the language. Because they can't speak the language, it's hard to find a job. When they find a job, it's not at the pay that they would like to have. So they look to the government to solve their problems. Does everybody understand what I'm telling you? You've often wondered, why is it that they don't do anything about this flood of immigrants coming across the border? And I'm not talking about just Hispanics from Mexico, Central and South America. I'm talking about from all over the world. They come here for a better life, not realizing that in coming here and being manipulated and used as they are, they're going to destroy all of their chances for ever having the American dream. They're going to help bring about socialism, which will put them back into slavery again. And that's got to stop. You have to understand the agenda, you have to understand who's bringing it about and why before you can see the manipulations and how people are being used and manipulated to bring it about. How many of you believe that this is a Christian government? How many of you believe that it was founded as a Christian government? I hate to tell you this, but you're wrong. This country was built by Christians because that's the majority of the people who originally came here. And a lot of the things that they believed in is reflected in our laws and in our traditions and in our government. But the government was never meant to be Christian. Have you ever seen the government in church? Have you? Does the government go to church? No. Does the government pray? No. What is the government? It's the Constitution for the United States of America, the Bill of Rights, and the amendments lawfully made thereto. You see, you're mistaking people for the government. The founders of this country, by and large, were Christian. Many of them weren't Christian, but pretended to be, were deists, and you can find that in their writings. Many of them were members of the secret societies. How many of you believe Thomas Jefferson was a Christian? I'm not afraid. I believed it until I read the truth about Thomas Jefferson and studied his life. Thomas Jefferson hated Christianity. Thomas Jefferson tore up the Bible. Thomas Jefferson wrote his own Bible because he said the God of the universe could not possibly be that terrible God represented in the King James Version of the Bible. Don't be afraid to raise your hand in here, folks. Nothing that I'm going to say is intended 
as a personal slant or insult or attack upon anybody in here. But I need your cooperation in order for us all to learn. See, I wasn't afraid. I raised my hand. That's what I believed most of my life until I really studied Thomas Jefferson and found out what he really was. He was a deist. So was Benjamin Franklin. How many of you knew that Benjamin Franklin was the master of the Masonic Lodge in Philadelphia? How many of you knew that he was the master of the Lodge of Nine Muses in France? Have you ever studied the Lodge of Nine Muses? Boy, you better. How many of you knew that when Benjamin Franklin was in the colonies, he pretended to be a pious Christian, although he was not seen in church too much, pretended to be a pious Christian. However, he entered into a sexual relationship and a living arrangement with two different women and sired children by both of them, never married either one. How many of you knew that? How many of you knew that when Benjamin Franklin went to France, he surrounded himself with prostitutes and drank champagne almost 24 hours a day and just reveled in orgies? How many of you knew that? You'd be surprised what some ugly old men are capable of. <laughs> See, these are things you don't know because you were taught something different and it makes you uncomfortable to hear what I'm telling you only for the reason that you've been taught something else and you've been reared with it and you've had accepted it. It's hard to let go of something that you have learned and accepted that is not true. You don't want to let go of it because then you have to give up your comfort zone. How many of you know that George Washington was a Freemason? How many of you know if you're a Freemason, you cannot possibly in your wildest dreams be a Christian? It's absolutely impossible. And I can show it to you in their own words. So how could George Washington be a Christian? And you don't even know the slightest, teeniest bit about his real involvement in the secret societies. He founded a military order, a secret order of his military officers, the generals and senior officers of the revolution. What's the name of that order? The Knights? Of Cincinnati. also known as the Knights of the Golden Circle. What sprang out of the Knights of the Golden Circle many years later? The Ku Klux Klan. How many of you knew that? No, see, you don't know these things because you're so willing to accept that what you know is right without investigating. And until you break out of that mold, I'm going to tell you right now, you're never going to know anything about the truth of this country who founded it and why and where it's going, what's happening today, and what the consequences are going to be for us down the line. You see, all of this has happened over and over and over and over and over again throughout the history of the human race. These people know how to lead us wherever they want us to go because they study history and we don't. What was Rome? What was Rome? A republic? What kind of republic? A constitutional republic. They had a constitution. Did you know that? It was a republic. Did you know that? <laughs> what happened to Rome? It fell into oligarchy and then into dictatorship, then into rampant immorality and socialism, declined, fell, and became the Vatican. Anybody here doubt that? I can prove every word of it. The Roman Empire never fell. It changed its name. The emperor became the pope. This is the truth. 
The old pantheon of Roman gods became the pantheon of saints, and they are identical in name and everything else. Now, I'm not trying to hurt Catholics. I'm not saying that you belong to the wrong religion. I'm not telling you to change your religion. I believe in freedom. I'll fight for you to be a Catholic or a Buddhist or a Baptist or whatever you want to be. But when you come to talk to me, I'm going to tell you the truth about all of it, whether you want to hear it or not. And the only way to escape that is to get away from me. Okay? We are all manipulated. All of us. Do you have the freedom to choose your religion? Do you? Well, it depends upon a few things. So, however you answered that, whether you answered it loudly or quietly, you were right. Doesn't matter. If you were reared in a family that did not indoctrinate you into any religion, then by the time you reached the age where you could be responsible to make your own decision, yes, you could choose your own religion based upon honest study. If you're a child and your mother is Jewish, what are you? You're Jewish. And how are you reared? Jewish. So from the time you're a little baby, you are taught to be Jewish. Do you have a choice? No. Is Jewish a race? No. So is it true that if you're born of a Jewish mother, you're a Jew whether you want to be or not? No. You're a Jew because you're taught to be a Jew from the time you're born. Same with Catholics. If your parents are Catholic from the time you're a little child, you're required to go to catechism. What is catechism? Brainwashing. Brainwashing. What is teaching this little Jewish child that he's a Jew, whether he wants to be or not, and teaching him how to be a Jew all the time he's a little baby up until the time he grows up? It's brainwashing. What is it when your parents take you to the Baptist church from the time you're a little bitty baby and require you to go to Bible school and teach you all of these things from the time that you're that small and can't make a conscious choice of your own and don't know what is right is wrong. What is that? Brainwashing. Is it right? Depends on your viewpoint. Personally, I think it's wrong. I think everybody should be able to make a choice based upon honest investigation and finding out what is right to them. Now, a really devout Christian would tell me, I'm full of crap. A really devout Jew would tell me the same thing. So would a devout Catholic, and so would a devout Buddhist. Because they don't want to hear it. Why do they do these things? To make sure that the religion survives and prospers and grows. Somebody else would say, oh no, it's to make sure that the child is raised in the proper religion. What is the proper religion? I could ask everybody in this room and get just as many different answers as there are people in this room. Isn't that true? Now, let me ask you something else. If this government were Christian, which Christian is it? Seventh-day Adventist? Certainly not Branch Davidian. <laughs> Baptist? Come on. A relationship with what? A relationship with Jesus Christ? Can you have a country that is Christian and have freedom? No. What if... In a hundred years, the majority of the population changes their religion to Buddhist. Now, what kind of country is it? You can't assign a religion to a country. A country doesn't exist except on paper and in your mind. The religion belongs to the people. Does everybody understand that? Let me show you something here. How many of you have seen this? What is that? 
Where have you seen it? Pardon? Where have you seen that? Jehovah's Witnesses, that's true. Where else? How many of you watch Pat Robertson? You don't recognize that? He had that for a long time. It's the symbol of what great Christian broadcasting network? Who's on TV in? Huh? What does it mean? This is the marriage of church and state. Is that what you want? What happened the last time you had the marriage of church and state? Anybody who disagreed got what? Burned at the cross, placed on the rack, chopped into pieces, tortured, murdered, burned. Now don't get me wrong, I believe in freedom. If that's what you want, you're entitled to want that all you want. But I gotta tell you, you try to bring this into being and I'll fight you with everything I've got. Because I don't believe in burning people at the stake. I don't believe in placing them on the rack. And I am a Christian. I don't believe in persecuting Jews because they're Jews, because they killed Jesus Christ, because I guarantee you there's not a Jew living on the face of this earth today that even knew Jesus Christ, much less killed him. That's what's called what? Corruption of blood. Our Constitution forbids corruption of blood, doesn't it? Because it's wrong. <coughs> By the same token, I don't like Jews who say, we're the chosen race and the rest of you are a bunch of stupid cattle. And we're going to rule the world someday. You know what I say to them? <laughs> <laughs> Not if I can help it. Because why? Because it's this! Only it has a star of David instead of a cross in the crown. Is that what you want? You see, that's democracy. When you have enough people who believe like you do to force your will upon everyone else, you become the bad guy. What does freedom say? What is freedom? The right to choose. As long as I don't hurt the person or property of any other human being, I can believe what I want, go to whatever church I want, be whatever I want, read whatever book I want, do whatever I wish, and do it abundantly and with prosperity. And without freedom, I couldn't do any of it, and neither can you. When you ask for this, you're asking for enslavement. And right now, you might be the slave master, but who's going to be in charge 50 years from now? That's the uncertainty about these things. You might be on top now, but just wait a little while. It never fails. If you study the history of the world, you'll find whoever the oppressed is today will be the master tomorrow. A lot of what's happening in the world today is because this happened yesterday. Make no mistake about it, everything that is happening in the world today is because of race and religion and the persecution caused by those two different things throughout the history of the world. Is everybody up with me? I know that some of you don't agree with me, that's okay. I'm not telling you you have to. But I want you to go out of here thinking about these things and think about what is it that you really want. You want to be free so that you can be what you want to be and worship where you want to worship? Or do you want to cause a situation whereby you're in charge so that you can force your will upon everybody else so that they'll get pissed off enough to overthrow you and do the same thing to you? Because that's exactly what that brings about. Exactly, it's never failed. Study history, you'll see. It's the truth. So, gee, if our founding fathers 
were deists and they were members of the secret societies and some of them were masquerading as Christians and some of them were just flat weren't Christians weren't masquerading at all why did they create this country they came here to create a new world not a country how many of you really read what they wrote they didn't come here to create a country they came here to create a new world what did they call it they called it the new world didn't they what else did they call it the grand experiment the great experiment remember reading those words and just read right over them didn't really understand what it meant they came from a world that was oppressive, ruled by kings and queens and popes and prelates and bishops and lords and barons. Who just because they didn't like the way you look could chop you into quarters and throw you to the pigs if they wanted to, anytime they wanted to. And if you didn't believe the religion they wanted you to believe in, they'd burn you at the stake or torture you. In some way, make your life absolutely miserable. They came here to create a new world, free from all of that. But they knew that they could not be safe in the new world if the old world was the way that it was. How do you get rid of kings and queens and barons and lords and emperors and prelates and sultans and emirs? How do you do that? That's exactly right. A new world order. From the beginning, that was the goal, ladies and gentlemen. That's the absolute truth. From the very beginning, that was the goal. What do you think new world means? What do you think it means? So they did something that was unheard of, never been done in the history of the world. They set the cattle free. They said, ah, you're not really a serf. You're not really a slave. You're not really as dumb as they say you are. You're not really a bunch of cattle. Now you're free men. You got brains. We're even going to write this contract to guarantee your freedom. But we know you won't keep it because you're human. And they wrote about that, didn't they? Didn't they tell us all the ways that we would give it up? Didn't they write about it? Didn't they warn us over and over and over and over again in all of their writings? They knew we would give it up because we're human and they were geniuses who understood human nature probably better than any single group of men that's ever lived throughout the history of the world. They understood it perfectly. What did Ben Franklin say when he came out of the Constitutional Convention after everything was signed, sealed, and delivered? Somebody said, hey, Ben, what have ye wrought? See? A republic, if you can keep it. He knew. They all knew. What was it really about? Why did they give it to us if they knew we would give it up? And they did know. Make no mistake about that. They knew. What do you think the fight over federalism was all about? They wanted to make sure that at some future point, the great central government would seize control. And they even pretended to fight over this. Like all of these secret society people do. It's called the Hegelian dialectic. We want all these people to do something. So you and I are going to get together. We're going to create two different causes. We're going to get all these people wrapped up in it. We're going to pretend to fight against each other. And this fight is going to bring about the conclusion that we really wanted in the first place. And they're all going to think that it was done accidentally by them and we didn't have anything to do with it. 
How many of you understand the concept of Hegelian dialectic of manipulation of political resolutions? Mm -hmm. If you don't, you'd better read Hegel and you'd better study it because that's what's happening. That's what the abortion issue is all about. Can government decide the abortion issue? Can you decide it with laws? If you could, everybody would obey the law, there wouldn't be any issue, would there? The Supreme Court has already made the law, haven't they? Thank you. I've been saying that for 20 years. It's the truth. The whole issue is designed to create a conflict which cannot be solved except by some world body. What do you think the ozone holes are about? How many of you understand the ozone holes? How many of you don't? Okay, it's about time somebody explained it to you. Because this is one of the biggest cons going. And what's it designed to do? Create a conflict between people who need to pollute the atmosphere and people who don't want it polluted to present the, prevent the depletion of the ozone layer so that we're all not fried by the sun's rays coming from the great Apollo up there riding across the sky in his chariot. And by the way, if you want confirmation of what I said about the Founding Fathers, if you really believe that they were Christian, go look at the city that they laid out from the air. Look at the symbolism that they built into it. All deist, all Masonic, all Jacobin. It's another word for Jacobin, Illuminist, Illuminati. Go into the Capitol building, stand right in the center of the rotunda, and look straight up at the dome where nobody ever looks. And what do you see? You see the apotheosis of George Washington. Riding across the heavens in the chariot of Apollo. Who is Apollo? George Washington. He's become God now. And around the perimeter of the Capitol dome, you see all the old gods of the Roman pantheon. They're all there. Zeus, Mercury, Prometheus, all of them. What's that doing on the inside of our capital dome if this country is a Christian nation? Can you tell me that? No. And you never will be able to in a million years unless you turn around and admit the truth. The truth is, is it never was, never was intended to be. The people in government for many years have been Christian. Are they now? Most of the people in our government now are not Christian, and that's part of the problem today. They have no morals, no ethical standards of behavior. And therefore, anything goes. They are a pack of pathetic, chronic liars, which is the sign of a socialist every single time. Socialism believes in what? The supremacy of the mind of man, not in God. Anytime man has supremacy over everything, everything becomes what? Subjective. Subjective. If you're God, how can you do something wrong? And that's the whole problem with this crowd now. They don't have anybody to answer to. You see, whether you believe in God or not, the human race must have God. They must have a superior power to which they must answer. If they do not, then everything becomes subjective. And if I want to slice your head in half, by God, there's nothing wrong with me doing it because I'm God. You understand that? That's really what's wrong. When man has nothing or no one to answer to, man can do no wrong, can he? Okay, here's the problem with the ozone hole thing. How many of you have noticed that every time they show a picture of an ozone hole, it's always over or near one of the poles? How many of you have noticed that? Every time. Because it has to be. It's the only place it occurs, and it's not really a hole at all. And it has nothing to do with what we do. It has nothing to do with CFCs or anything else 
that we do here on this earth, period. Because here's the truth of it. How many of you have also noticed that whenever that hole occurs, it occurs at that particular pole in the wintertime? Why is that? Well, the earth is tilted on its axis. So if this is the North Pole up here, we have the earth right here, and we have old Saul over here giving out his rays. What has to happen to form ozone, folks? Sunlight must interact with gases in the atmosphere. Which gas? Oxygen. oxygen. When sunlight strikes oxygen in the atmosphere, it causes a chemical reaction which splits O2 into two single O's. So O2 becomes, what is that? Ozone. ozone. Each one of these is ozone. But what is it also? It's what's called a free radical. It doesn't like to be in that position. It doesn't like to be unattached. Okay? Some like people I know. Can't be without a mate for 10 seconds. And so they always choose the wrong one, which ensures that they're going to break up and they can't be without a mate for 10 seconds. Believe it or not, most of us go through that little period. We think we have to be with somebody all the time. Not true. Okay. These, because they're free radicals, they don't like that state of being, don't last very long. As soon as they find something to latch on to that they can oxidize, they will. Or as soon as they can find another free radical of oxygen, they will form once again O2. Or if they can find another radical of oxygen and an atom of hydrogen, they will form water. They don't like being apart, so ozone doesn't exist very long after it's created anyway. It's in a constant state of creation and attaching itself to something else and disappearing. So ozone is in a constant state of flux, becoming and unbecoming all the time. And it's caused by the sun rays interacting with oxygen in the atmosphere. What do we call that layer? There is no such thing as an ozone layer. What is it called? Because what are these? These are ions. Ozone is an ion of oxygen. Okay? It's called the ionosphere. So why don't these freako environmentalist liars call it what it is, the ionosphere? Because it would be the truth, and we can all prove that the ionosphere is not disappearing. It's where ionization of gases takes place due to interaction with the sun's rays, energy from the sun. Everybody understand that? So instead they say, there's an ozone layer. Oh, really? Hmm, can you taste it? Can you touch it? Can you feel it? <laughs> it's the ionosphere. And this whole thing is a hoax. Because here's what happens. As sun streams toward the earth, you can see down here at the South Pole where they're having summer, sun's rays are hitting all over the pole, aren't they? But up here, they're not hitting a portion of the pole. At the pole that is experiencing winter, what do they have there that's unusual about the rest of the earth? They have six months of darkness. There's six months when the sun's rays are not hitting that part of the earth or the earth's atmosphere. And so there is no interaction between the sun's rays and the oxygen in the atmosphere. And so what is absent? Ozone. Is it a depletion of ozone? No, it's just a place where the chemical reaction does not take place. It is absolutely perfectly normal. And when the Earth moves around to the other side of the sun, and the southern hemisphere, 
is then experiencing winter because the sun is then over here. The hole jumps magically from the North Pole to the South Pole. And all of the CFCs that we are leaking and using on the face of this earth have magically migrated to one spot over the pole where nobody's leaking anything and depletes all the ozone right there. You see, if this was really true, where would the holes be? Los Angeles, London, Tokyo, there's a biggie. Phoenix, right? Do you know that the state of Arizona is the only state in the whole 40, or whole 50 United States that knows this? <laughs> and has passed a law saying, screw you, we know there's no ozone holds, we'll use CFCs all we want, and we do. <laughs> we educated our legislators, not to the fact that if they, that, that, that this was a, a hoax, we did that, of course. But even though they knew it was a hoax, they didn't want to go along with it until we put pressure on them saying, hey, we're not going to support this scam, period. This is a scam, and you know it is. We put political pressure on them that they were going to lose their jobs unless they did what we wanted them to do. And so they did. Now, we don't always get our way in Arizona, because why do you think it's called Phoenix? and the valley of the sun and the sun devils that's all out of the mysteries Phoenix is a Masonic city if there ever was one on the face of this earth no nope. Phoenix is a symbol Phoenix is the symbol of resurrection death and resurrection Phoenix is the bird that rose up out of the ashes yes sir why the hoax? What is the end result of the hoax? What do you have to have to solve this problem? World government control of the atmosphere. You see, they do it by stages. Give them the atmosphere. What do they want next? The biosphere, maybe? How many of you know about the biosphere? Do you know that the UN inspectors were just at Yellowstone National Park and determined that there has to be a buffer zone around the park? So the National Park Service is buying up private land and kicking people up off their land and closing roads to make this buffer zone, which will be absolutely off limits to any human habitation, occupation, or use forever to protect the environment within the park. Do you know that this is just one little step toward seizing all of the wild lands, wildlife, natural resources, metals, and minerals up on the earth under the control of a one world government? Did you know that it's all been outlined in treaties for years? So why aren't you upset about it? What are you doing about it? Ah. What are you upset about it? I am. What are you doing about it? Silence. <laughs> Who's we invited the Chinese communists to come set up house. Yeah, but you see, these are all symptoms of things. It's the symptom that we're being controlled by some very, very smart manipulators who understand how to make us do their bidding, even though we may not want to. How many people are here? How many people should be here? Okay. How many people cares versus how many people don't care? And the degree of care is not whether they really care or not, it's whether they perceive that there's a problem, and that will tell you how effective the masters in control have been in brainwashing the population. They don't perceive that there's a problem. If they did, they would be here wouldn't they? It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with what we're talking about. You could replace me with anybody who could get up here and do the same thing and you'd have the same result. Because the perception does not exist that there is a problem.
amongst the general, what they call, masses of population. And by the way, when you hear politicians and uh, talk show hosts and newspaper reporters using the term masses, those are Marxist, socialist speaking Americans never use that term. Americans say the people, the American people, my fellow Americans. Only a Marxist, socialist, or a communist will use the term masses. And you're hearing that on talk radio and in the media all across the country all the time and on television, even Dan Rather uses that term. Dan would rather be read. Okay, are you beginning to get sort of a feel of where we're going and, and, and what this is really about and how important it is that we understand it? And understand this, I'm going to say it one more time. I'm not trying to change your religion or what you believe or anything. I'm trying to confront you with some truth in the hopes that you will use that information and that truth in order to come up with some decisions and some actions on your part so that we can change this. Turn it around. There is only one uniting common bond amongst all Americans. What is it? Freedom. If that isn't the most important thing in your life, you're not going to do a thing to help us save this country. In fact, more than likely, whatever you're going to do is going to help us destroy it. And I say us because it's the truth. If you want to really know what's wrong with this country, when you go home, go in your bathroom privately so nobody else can see you do it. Close the door and look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. The truth is, what's wrong with this country is the American people have lost the knowledge and the motivation and the meaning of what it was all about to begin with. It was always about giving the common man freedom. Why? Because, folks, our founding fathers knew that if that would work, that would be the new world order. If we could accept it and be responsible and hang on to it and make it work, that would be the new world order. A direct result of it would be that giving the common man real freedom would topple every king and queen and sultan and emir off their thrones all around the world. And that's exactly what it did. Isn't that true? And they knew that they couldn't have any kind of a new world or new world order of any sort unless they got rid of the kings and queens and sultan and, and emirs and, and uh, lords and barons. That's why they called this the grand experiment. Because that's what it was. If it would work, it would be the new world order. If it wouldn't work, it would be whatever they thought that it should become. You know what they think it should become? You know what they're trying to make it now? A world totalitarian socialist government headed by a, quote, benevolent, unquote, dictatorship. They're going to present you with a Messiah. The whole world will accept this person as a Messiah. You can call him the Antichrist, whatever you want. I don't care. It's going to be the answer to all your problems worldwide. And the whole world is going to bow down to this person. Whether you believe in Christianity, the book of Revelations or not, I'm telling you this is what's going to happen because I've talked to them face to face. And they don't even hide the fact. That person will wear the throne of the world. Behind that person will be a council of what they call wise men who will really be the rulers. This poor guy is just going to be the fool they stick out there to take the brunt of the public wrath whenever it's necessary. And you can knock him off if you want to. They just put somebody else up there. That's why I've said over and over and over again, 
So what if you impeach Clinton? So what? Who's going to take his place? Huh? Al Gore. <laughs> and if you bump off Al Gore, who's going to take his place? <laughs> Whoever else they want to put up there because you don't have a choice. You think you have a choice? You don't have any choice, even if you vote. Because the choices that they give you to vote on all belong to them. Why do you think Charles Collins and Rosemary could not get in the debates? Could not get on ABC, NBC, the Communist News Networks, or any of the rest of them. Why do you think the American people were never shown them as a choice? Because you're not going to get a choice. They will put two or three up there for you to vote on. All belong to them. They'll even make it like they're really against each other. They'll make you believe it. They'll even throw you some trash about one of them, so maybe you won't vote for him, thinking the election's fair because ah, that's not a moral person. And then who do you put in the White House? The most immoral person that ever lived on this planet. <laughs> William Jefferson, Communist Clinton. You don't have a choice. That disappeared a long time ago. There's not a nickel's worth of difference between the Democratic and Republican Party and hasn't been for an awful long time. And it doesn't matter which one is in the White House, we still go toward the New World Order, don't we? We still go more and more into socialism, don't we? But if they were truly different, that wouldn't happen, would it? So, I guess that, uh, <laughs> what time is it? Anybody got the time? 2.30. Let's take a very short break. Let's hold it to 10 minutes because I've got an awful lot to cover, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, we are also going to do another Groom Lake trip. How many of you are interested in Area 51, Groom Dry Lake? That's going to be almost the entire subject of tomorrow's lecture. We're going to do an awful lot about that tomorrow. It's one of the major manipulations that's going on. It's something everybody is curious about. It involves uh, tremendous technology and uh, a lot of mystery. And uh, it's extremely interesting. So, pardon? Uh, that's going to be in uh, August. Uh, let me see, June, July, August. It, I think it's the end of August, around the 1st of September. Is that Labor Day? Labor Day. It's going to be over the Labor Day weekend. We'll be going there. Is anybody here who went the last time with us? Gary. Stand up and tell them about our Groom Lake trip, Gary. And they were testing behind us because they knew we were there. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. Just keeping up with you was tough. <laughs> <laughs> How about the people that came? All really nice people. Fantastic people. Only the best people ever come to our activities. And I'm not exaggerating at all. They are the greatest 
most gracious, most polite, most concerned people that I've ever met in my life. And that's why they come. That's why you people are here. You care. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here. And that's the truth. So many of you fit into that category that I was just talking about. Some of you just grouchy old codgers and you know it. <laughs> like, like I get sometimes. <clears throat> now, if I get a little impatient sometimes on the radio or anywhere else, it's because I've been doing this for so many years, folks. I don't want to be rude to anybody. I really don't. But I've learned a few things. One is there's no time left to suffer fools. There just isn't any. So if I'm confronted with a fool, I just let them know it, get it off my chest, get rid of them as quickly as I can, and hope that that is enough of a shock that maybe they'll get out of their foolishness. Okay? Because there just isn't any time. We're going down the tubes on a roller coaster. There is no time to tell you all that you are brilliant, wonderful American people and that, uh, you know, with people like you, we don't have any problem. We're going to turn it around right away and, you know, pass the hat and put some money in there and hoorah. Bullshit. <laughs> it ain't true. And I ain't going to tell it to you. You're never going to hear that from me. We're in this situation because all of us, me included, were dummies for most of our lives. And unless we change that, we are never going to turn anything around. And that is the cold, hard truth. Whether we like it or not. And we all, at some point in our life, have to go in the bathroom, confront our own self in the mirror and say, Bill Cooper, you've been a fool for most of your life. What is the matter with you? You've got to stop it right now. You gotta stop being stupid. You gotta become a real American. You gotta care about things. You gotta find out what the truth is so you know what to care about. And it's hard to say. I know because I've done it. I couldn't be up here if I had not confronted myself in that manner. You've got to do that. You have to do it. If you can't, you can't make a change. You'll never understand. You'll always be saying, well, I ain't no sheeple. I ain't no fool. I know everything. I know what America is. Okay, just hope that I'm not around when you say those things. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> There's lots of things um, that you can do, that you need to do. But... Uh, I want to uh, just sort of give you a few things that are recent so you'll, you'll know. And these are not really terribly serious things. Some of them are. But they're just things that you will all understand. And you'll understand them quickly. Listen to this. How many of you know who Alvin Toffler is? How many of you have read his books? What was the first book? Future Shock. And then after that was what? No, the third wave came after the second wave. <laughs> yeah, he, he wrote a whole plethora of books. Now there's some people you can listen to who are not gurus, God's not whispering in their ear. They don't have a crystal ball. But they are what I call the inner circle. They know what's coming. They're part of it. And when they write or they talk, you'd better listen to them. One of them's Henry Kissinger. Listen to Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger doesn't just get up and jaw. If he says something that's important, listen to him. Whether you like him or not doesn't make any difference. But I've discovered that most people who ever meet him really like him a lot. He's very charismatic, very polite, very gracious, very nice guy. He's also one of the biggest traitors that's ever lived. But isn't he in good company? Really? Another one is Alvin Toffler. And there's lots more, and I'm not going to go through the whole list. But Alvin Toffler, whatever he writes, is generally going to happen. Another one that you have to read is foreign relations. 
Foreign Relations is published by the Council on Foreign Relations, and you can subscribe to their publication. Whatever they write in there usually happens about two years later. Whatever it is. It's almost like magic. If they're not involved in any of this, how come what they write about always happens? Almost everybody in government belongs to the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission, or both. Toffler admits to having been a Marxist in the third wave. He wrote it on page 24. Now, when a socialist admits that they were a Marxist, what does that mean? They still are. Toffler says in the third wave, it requires governments that are simpler, more effective, yet more democratic than any we know today. What's that a code word for? Socialist. It is a civilization with its own distinctive world outlook, its way of dealing with time, space, logic, and causality. What's that mean? World outlook, world government, world control. Causality, social engineering. Do you understand what I'm saying? They speak in a code that they understand perfectly. The average person hasn't got the slightest idea what they're talking about. And if you don't study them and their symbology and what they believe in and what their agenda is, you'll never know. You could read this and never know what this guy is saying. Oh, that sounds nice. That's what most people say. Oh, that sounds nice. Doesn't it sound nice in a way? Yeah. But if you really understand, it's not nice at all. What they're saying is, screw you, we're going to enslave you. We're going to engineer how you live, how you think, how you work, everything. Hitler tried it, didn't he? You see, this is a big de deception that Hitler was a right-wing guy. Hitler, and you better learn this if you never learn anything else in your world. Hitler was a socialist. Nazi means National Socialist German Workers Party, doesn't it? Hitler socialized Germany. All control is always on the left. Always. If you're left wing, you're for control of yourself and other people. A scale measures two extremes. On the far left, you have total control of everything and everyone, and, by the way, ownership of everything and everyone, by the state, which is more important than anything. It's called communism. On the right, all the way at the extreme, you have the total absence and lack of any and all control by anybody over anything or anyone. That's called anarchy. Anarchy sucks. Communism sucks. Socialism is just a little step above communism and usually degrades into communism and it also sucks. Usually anything close to anarchy also sucks. And so do all those people who want to engage in those things. To tell you the truth, they're in a mind state that sucks. A constitutional republic is somewhere in the middle of these two extremes and provides safeguards to protect individual freedoms and creator-endowed liberty. Whether you believe in God or not, if you don't understand that freedom and liberty must be creator-endowed, then you are opening the door for somebody to take it away from you because they don't have to answer to a creator. You understand? So even if you don't believe in God, you better start. If you want to stay free, if you want to stay free, if you don't care about freedom, you don't have to believe in God. You see, there must be something that human beings answer to to protect us from ourselves. Because the minute we become God, how many of you in here want me to be God? I don't want me to be God either. Because I know 
who I am. I know the temptations that I'm subject to. I have seen what power can do to people and I might fall prey to that same corruption that would allow me to use that power wrongly. Even Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, was tempted. What was it that Satan offered him? The world. What is it these people are after? The world. Jesus turned it down. They're not gonna. If you were to give me the world, you know, I'd be hard put to turn it down. Because then I could make it the way I want it to be. Is it the way I want it to be the way you want it to be? You don't know that. You don't know, and that's the big problem. Why would you even want to take a chance? I'm a pretty good guy. But you don't want to take a chance on giving me the world or anybody else. You don't want the world. You don't want vast amounts of power. Because you're a human being. And power will corrupt you and destroy you and you will use it to destroy others. And that's the truth of the matter. You don't want it. Toffler said in the third wave on page six, this book is based on what I call the revolutionary premise. <laughs> That's Marxist if there ever was a Marxist statement in the whole wide world. Here's what he, here's also what he says on page nine. Now if you don't understand the ordo ab chao technique, Order out, of, order out of chaos. By the way, that's the motto of the 32nd degree of Freemasonry. Ordo ab chao. We'll just devolve everything into a state of chaos, and out of that we will bring order to the world the way we want it. And everybody will get down on their knees and thank us for restoring order and security to their lives. And they will be willing to give up anything to us for that favor. Quote, in the United States today, as in many other countries, the collection of second and third waves creates social tensions, dangerous conflicts, and strange new political wave fronts that cut across the usual divisions of class, race, sex, or party. All the old polarizations and coalitions break up. End quote. How many of you women thought Gloria Steinem was doing you a favor? Gloria Steinem is a communist who created the concept of feminism to destroy American family life. Feminism is not good for you. Being a responsible woman is good for you. Being a good person is good for you. Whether you choose to do it in business or in the home doesn't make any difference to me. And yes, you should get equal pay for equal work. And yes, you should have the vote and all of this other stuff. But feminism? Feminism is war between women and men. It was created intentionally to destroy the basic unit of freedom in this country, and that's the family. Toffler even admits that there's a plan. On page 10 of his book, quote, Life may indeed be absurd in some large cosmic sense, but this hardly proves that there is no pattern in today's events. In fact, there is a distinct, hidden order that becomes detectable as soon as we learn to distinguish third wave changes from those associated with the diminishing second wave, end quote. There's always been a plan. They call it the great work, the great plan, the lost word. There's all kinds of words for it. It exists. It is being brought about. It is conscious. It is working its effect upon us 
now, today, as I speak. Now, I'm going to just give you a little demonstration of the degree of control that is already in effect in this country concerning communications. Now, if you're smart, you know that if you turn the dial on your radio and on your TV set and on every news story, it has the same slant in the same words and it's the same stories, you know that the news and the media are controlled. If you don't, you're not playing with a full deck of cards. Okay? It is absolutely absurd to believe that all these different networks, news stations, newspapers, and radio stations are all owned by different people, yet they all carry the exact same stories every day, worded in the exact same way, with the same agenda and the same slant. You see, if they were all separate and independent, that could never happen in a million years because no two people ever attached the same importance to the same event or the same slant on the same story unless they're handed it. Two federal agencies are looking into a goof that led four extra states to get an emergency warning broadcast meant as a test for just one radio station which caused all radio stations in those four states to go off the air. It's automated. They can cause one state to go dark as far as communications are concerned or two states or three states or all 50 with the push of a button. It's called FEMA. <laughs> Relay points in Florida, Hawaii, Louisiana, and Ohio got the confusing signals. Now both the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Federal Communications Commission are looking into it to determine the exact cause and to be sure that there wasn't a functional error of the system, said FEMA spokeswoman Barbara Yeagerman. This was no accident, it was a test to test the system because they've never done it before to make sure that they could cause selected radio stations in selected states to go off the air at their push of a button. It's the first time that they've ever made such a test but they can't tell the public that they can do that anytime they want anywhere so they say oh it was a mistake. It was a goof. If you wake up some morning and you can't get any radio stations on your radio, you better dig a hole. I wrote about this in my book. I said the day will come when this will happen. Only it won't be a drill. It'll be to cause total confusion and panic in the population so they can do what they want and what they need to do rounding up the people that they need to round up and need to get rid of in order to bring about their one world totalitarian socialist state. Without communications, what is the mob? Huh? Chaos. Without communications, without leadership, most people are helpless, useless, and dangerous. Don't believe me? Go back and look at all the videotape that you failed to make of the LA riots, which you should have made and should be studying over and over and over again. Also study how long it took for those supermarkets in LA to run out of food. And what happened to those supermarkets when they ran out of food? Did you know that over 50 people were murdered during those riots in LA and not one single person has been prosecuted for any of those murders to this day. And did you know when you bring it up in the city of LA that the people attack you? Emotions were running high. It should be forgiven. We don't want anybody to be prosecuted. Hey, that's dangerous. Think it can't happen here? Think again. Some of the people you've lived around all your life, when society breaks down, will turn into your worst enemies, the baddest people you've ever seen. They will kill, rape, murder, and steal. Right now, they're nice people. And I gotta tell you, you can never for sure determine who in the world's gonna do what when that kind of stuff happens. 
You just can't. You don't know. You can't really determine who's going to stand up and fight for freedom when they suddenly realize that they're going to be enslaved by this new world order. Some of the people will surprise you. Some of the people who tuck their tail and run will also surprise you. Because they're some of the people who are standing up right now talking the squawking the loudest about how hard they're going to fight. You'll be amazed at who comes out of the woodwork to really fight and who runs and hides and turns squealer and rats on everybody when it does. But don't make the mistake that you can determine who's going to do what now because you can't. The only reason I can make this statement is based upon solid research of history because this ain't the first time it ever happened. Nor is it going to be the last if the human race has anything to do with it. We've been doing this since the beginning. How many of you have heard Hillary Clinton's latest quote? Commenting upon the release of subpoenaed documents, she said this, quote, I'm not going to have some reporters pawing through our papers. We are the president. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> How many of you voted for Hillary? <laughs> At Yellowstone National Park, United Nations delegates who surveyed the area last year called for a buffer zone around the park. So the Park Service is choking off the local economy by refusing to maintain certain highways and by buying up any property available. Of course, there will be plenty available as more and more owners are denied the use of their own private property, which causes businesses to shut down and economy to slow. Blah, 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 blah. Closing it off. Buffer zone means no human occupation. Now, what started this? How did they target Yellowstone Park and for the American public to be able to accept that? Remember hearing about a mine up there that was polluting everything? What was the name of the mine? Huh? I heard it. New World, don't be bashful. The New World Mine. You think that's an accident? No. Who do you think went up there and staked out the claim and started mining the New World Mine to pollute everything to cause this to happen. Huh? You think some miner went up there and staked it out and decided to name it the New World Mine? You see, these people are arrogant. They love to flaunt what they're doing in our faith. They like to slap us with it because they think we're so stupid. And like I said earlier, most of the time, most people tend to prove them right. They laugh at us, constantly laugh at us. <laughs> Look at those fools. We got to stop that. We must stop it. Cleveland radio officials were baffled after a botched test of the government-operated emergency alert system disrupted programming on all local stations, went off the air simultaneously, and there was nothing that the local stations could do to get back on the air until FEMA released that button. No, they can't do that. folks. So you know all this uh, stuff here is a scam. There's lots of scams. The global warming is another scam. <clears throat> the truth is, 
with all of the rural and uh, geodetic temperature and and weather monitoring stations around the world if you take all the data from all of those and put it together the truth is the temperature is actually getting a little cooler not warmer how do they perpetrate this global warming hoax it's very simple they take the temperature readings where the temperature is affected by some outside source such as in the middle of a city right they just change the place where they're taking the temperature so that the temperature is affected by something else artificial usually man created like parking lots where is the temperature greater in the park or in the parking lot in the parking lot. Now I want to uh, go a long way back into history now because I'm going to start with a few things that you need to know and it's going to explain a few things that you've been seeing and then we'll come up to modern time and then the last couple of hours are going to be spent on what's going on and what you can do about it. Okay? But first we have to understand history. We've got to. If we don't understand history, if we don't understand symbology, if we don't understand race and religion, you cannot possibly understand what's happening today or why, who's bringing it about, and what you can do to combat it. It's absolutely impossible. A lot of people think they can, but they can't. And I'll give you an example of how you can't. Isn't it true that most Americans have been spending a lot of time for a lot of years trying to figure out who in the hell is destroying this country? Haven't they? Well, if you've been spending all that time, what's your answer? Logically, from what you yourself have discovered, not what I've told you up here. The answer is you still don't know, right? Isn't that correct? You look around for the enemy and you can't find the enemy. It's because you haven't looked in the mirror. And that's the truth. You've looked everywhere. Except right here. <clears throat> I've searched my entire life to find the devil. And I finally found him. You know where he is? Right here. And I can let him take over or I can cast him out. But he doesn't exist anywhere else. Don't believe me? Take all human beings out of a complete area and see what happens to that area. And this has nothing to do with the environment, the atmosphere, or anything else. I'm not an environmental freak. What happens? God's plan takes hold. The laws of nature rule. Everything functions as it should, and there is no evil anywhere. Now that ought to tell you that evil exists in the hearts and minds of man. That's where you're going to find the devil. If there is one, he's in us. If you don't believe that, try that little experiment. Just try it. Evil exists only where man exists. Okay? Is there evil on the sun? No. <laughs> Why not? No, there's no men on the sun. There's no men on the sun. We're not there. The only place you'll find evil is where you find a man or a woman. And the more men and women you find, the more evil you're going to find there. It exists within us. Why does it exist within us? Well, we're going to find out some of it. And we're going to find out why certain things are happening. Okay? If we go back as far back into history as we can possibly go,
And if we can imagine, no matter what you believe, okay, because what I'm going to recount to you now is the official hidden version of mankind that is taught in the mysteries. It's not what I believe. It doesn't have to be. And it doesn't matter whether it's what I believe or what you believe or what anybody else believes. What matters, folks, is that these people are running things. And if they're running things, what they believe will affect us, and we better know what the hell that is. Because that's what's driving them. Drives them. Whatever's driving them that's going to affect us, we have to understand to be able to combat it. A general that goes upon a battlefield without a knowledge of his opponent inner, enemy commander, his, uh, his abilities, his tactics, his forces, the weapons at his disposal, and the morale of his men, is most probably going to lose that battle. Those of you who have been in responsible positions in the military, you understand that. Here's their version of history. And like I said, it doesn't matter whether you agree with it, believe in it, or not. It's what they believe. It's what's driving things today. And you better understand it. They believe that way back at the dawn of the history of the human race, there was a golden age. How many of you have heard that? The golden age. So many people read about it in their writings and don't understand what it is and don't even ask a question. They just take it for granted. I did that for years. Golden age. Oh, that's nice. Keep reading, thinking that I understood what I was reading. I didn't understand what I was reading until I figured out what they're talking about. The golden age was the age of innocence in man evolution. This is their story, remember, so don't get upset if you believe a different one. Man could not think. It was an animal. It was innocent. Innocent. He went about his business living according to the laws of nature with the other beasts and animals and plants on this earth. What does religion call it? Garden of Eden. Religion says it's the Garden of Eden. God made Adam and Eve, put them in the garden to take care of the garden. They lived in innocence alongside the beasts of the field and the lions and tigers and the plants and the trees. Back during that time, man was, they say, vegetarian. Ate roots and plants and nuts and berries just like many of the animals did. Man lived in harmony with nature. At some point during that time, some man had an original thought. What is that called in religion? Original sin. Man wasn't supposed to think. <laughs> okay, this is what they say. Had an original thought. And with that original thought, he picked something up and he used it to kill an animal. Bonk! You're eating the root that I was going to eat. Bonk! And he killed it. And it was dead. He decided to take a bite and see what it tastes like. It tasted good, so he became a meat eater. And a tuber eater. And a berry eater. And a nut eater. And vegetable eater. And somewhere along the line, man had learned to use this club. The man that could use the club was more powerful than other men. Just like today, folks, there are people who seem to catch on quicker than others. Doesn't mean the ones who haven't caught on yet are stupid, or they don't have a brain, or they're worthless. It just means they haven't caught on yet. And so the guy that had the club became the king. I'm the king because if you mess with me, I'll hit you with my club. You haven't learned how to pick up a piece of wood and hit me with it yet. So I am your master. 
That worked until other men watching him learned how to pick up a piece of wood and said, uh-uh, you ain't the king, I'm the king. Well, we the king. Let's all be king. And then men had to be wary of each other. That was the consequence of that. Men then had to be wary of each other. Then came a day when, lo and behold, fire fell from heaven. A streak of light came out of the sky and struck a tree and caught it on fire. And that tree was burning. Wow. Now you'll never understand the significance of that until you understand the significance of this. Back in those times, according to the mystery schools, man was pretty much helpless. And man, unlike the animals, didn't have this big coat of wool. May have had some hair, more than we do now. But he didn't have this big woolly coat. He lived mostly in the tropics. If he went too far out of the tropics, he would die because he didn't have the means to protect himself from the cold. Man understood instinctively that the sun provided the conditions for life on earth. How did he know that? Because when the sun rose in the morning, he was damn thankful to see it, wasn't he? It was warm. And it lit up the earth, and he could see. He could see what he was doing. He could see dangerous animals coming from sometimes miles away. And he instinctively knew that the sun was giving of itself for him and for the plants and the other animals on the earth to live. And in giving of itself, it would all of a sudden sink down and disappear and die. Man lamented that passing. And he would spend the night huddled in fear, praying that the sun would come back and save him from the darkness. So the sun became the savior of man as it rose every morning and died every night. Man learned to confront the prince of darkness and a battle raged between the forces of light and the forces of darkness every 24 hours. That was the beginning of the first religion according to the mysteries. And the first man who learned to predict what happened in the heavens became the first priest. And the priest was the one who sat the first king on the first throne. By using what? The gift that Prometheus brought to man. Who said that? I heard the word. What is it? fire. Prometheus is another word for what? Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Lucifer was what? The great angel of light. In the mysteries they believe that the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is a metaphor for the evolution of mankind. Now remember this is what they believe that man was being held prisoner in the bonds, the chains of ignorance in the Garden of Eden by an unjust and vindictive and terrible God. He was set free by Lucifer through his agent Satan with the gift of intellect which was brought to man with fire. The story of Prometheus Bringing the gift of fire from heaven to mankind is a story of Satan enticing Eve and then Adam through Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, they believe that the great fall of man was not a fall at all. but was a tremendous gift from Lucifer, who is their God. What does Lucifer represent? The intellect, knowledge. 
Some man went to that tree when it was burning after it was struck by that lightning, after Lucifer was flung out of heaven by God. In Greek, he was called Prometheus, gave the gift of fire to man. Fire has ever since been the symbol of learning, knowledge, intellect. Why do you think every great book of learning has inside the front cover a lamp with a flame or a torch? Why do you think after they killed him, they put an eternal flame on the grave of John F. Kennedy? It represents the conquering of nature and the universe by the mind, the intellect of man. It represents the apotheosis of humanity, the perfection of the race which they seek. Deep stuff, huh? It is deep stuff, but you have to understand it in order to be able to combat it or to be able to work it to your will instead of being worked to their will. Whoever picked a burning branch up from that burning tree and learned to keep it alive became the ruler of his universe. Fire can only come from God. God lived in fire. Fire was God. Fire represented the ability to think. Fire represented the intellect. Why do you think every major religion in the world, bar none, up to a certain point in history, kept a fire burning on the altar which was never allowed to go out? It was the representation of the sun. All life, all energy, everything flowed from the sun. Sun was the representation of the power of God in the priesthood to the common profane humanity. The sun was God and was worshipped by almost every tribe and nation and people upon the face of this earth. It's important that you understand this because you're going to see the symbology everywhere. How many of you have really been to Dealey Plaza? What did you see there? Uh, at the time we were there, we didn't know the look of the things that we do now. You didn't see anything, did you? No. People go there every day, they don't see anything. <clears throat> How many of you knew that the ancient pyramids were never burial chambers. Never. Okay, some of you are up to date. Most of you aren't, though. Most of you don't know this. They were not burial chambers. They were temples of initiation in which the candidate was placed in the sarcophagus, suffered a mystical or symbolic death, lay three days in the coffin, alone, and then was raised by the grip of the lion's paw, given a new name, and sent through the initiation in the passageways of the pyramid. How many of you knew that the sum total of all of the knowledge of the primitive peoples was built into the pyramids to be passed on to the initiates? The mysteries are old. Freemasonry is old. Rosicrucianism is old. Ancient. It began when the first man picked up a branch burning and learned how to keep it alight. And he learned by hiding the method by which he maintained the fire and by telling the common man that God dwelt within the fire and by learning to predict the movements of the heavens, he could control all of the people in the realm that he could communicate to. And he became the first priest. The priests have seldom been kings, but the priests have always been be the power behind the kings. Without the okay of the priests, the king cannot mount the throne, or could not in those days. Okay? So they learned several things. 
they learned that by being able to predict the natural events in the heavens, to be able to keep a fire burning on the altar, and to be able to start a fire from nothing and not be able not teach that to anybody else, they could control large numbers of people who in those days thought that that was magical. And then their lives depend upon knowing when to plant the corn and when to harvest, when to till the ground and all of those things. These are the things that the priests learn to teach them. And of course, if they made a wrong guess or a wrong prediction, what was it? We've done something to displease God. Therefore, we must make a sacrifice. Right? You're it. For some reason, they were partial to virgins. In South America, it was whoever the captives were. And they would create wars just to get captives so that they could have sacrifices to appease the gods. All throughout the history of the world, these people have been the ones who have hoarded, collected and hoarded the sum total of the knowledge of humankind. They call themselves the illumined ones, and in those days they were truly illumined, enlightened. They're the only ones who had the knowledge. The rest of the people were deprived. Over long periods of time, some knowledge would either leak out to the people or the people would make discoveries or would have original thoughts of their own and pass it on. So as man became more educated, the machinations of the Illuminati became more complicated and more clever. And the more they had to really hoard and guard the technology and the knowledge and the, and the, and the, uh, the truth that they held. They called what they knew the esoteric and what you know are the profane the exoteric. In other words, the esoteric is the inward truth, that which is withheld, that which is guarded, not known by what they call the masses. The exoteric is the outward form that they throw to the people, the metaphors that they tell. One of the ways they put it that I wrote in my book is that they speak directly to God while the people bow down to stone ta statues which can neither hear nor speak. Now it doesn't mean they're really speaking to God. This is a metaphor, remember. What it means is they're really communicating the truth. This is what they believe. It doesn't matter what we believe in their world. And if they're controlling us, we have to understand what it is that they believe and why. You see, they believe that through the use of the intellect, man himself will conquer nature. And what happens when you conquer nature? You're God. Isn't that true? They believe through the use of science and the intellect of man, man will conquer nature and the universe, and man will be God. Now, does that ring true according to religion? Of course it does. Isn't that the promise of Satan to Eve in the Garden of Eden? God lied to you. He lied to you. He's withholding your true nature. You see, he doesn't want you to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, ye will surely become as gods, and ye will not surely die. Isn't that what he said? So aren't the mysteries saying the same thing? Only they're reversing the benevolence and malevolence of the two. In traditional religion, you say that the god of the Garden of Eden who put Adam and Eve there was a benevolent, good God, and they were living the good life. And if they hadn't have sinned, they'd still be there living and taking care of the animals in the garden and be living a blissful, wonderful existence. 
And they're saying, hey, that guy that put them there and kept them in the bonds of ignorance wasn't doing them a favor. They were really slaves in this, this ignorant state, this innocent life, this golden age. Lucifer set man free, gave him the gift of intellect, the use of which will make him God. Now, it would amaze you to know how many people really believe in this. It would absolutely amaze you to know that some of the major religions in the world, disguised as Christian religions, actually worship Lucifer in secret. You would be amazed to know how many people believe that Jesus Christ and Lucifer were brothers. And that there was a battle between who was going to save mankind from itself. Jesus won that battle. He had his chance. He failed. Now it's Lucifer's turn. You might also be shocked to know that Tom Valentine believes that. And he said it. In an interview with Richard Noon. And it's recorded in his book, 5-5-2000. What's the name of that book? Ice, the Ultimate Disaster, 5-5-2000. Get it and read it. It would amaze you to know how many supposed patriot leaders that you all look up to believe this. That are really not patriot leaders or in, at all, but are functioning in the Hegelian dialectic to move you in the wrong direction or to pitch you against each other or to just find out who in the hell you are. There's one that's traveled all over the whole country. And wherever he is, he is the religion of whoever he's talking to. It's true. And some of you know that. When he's talking to Christians, he's a Christian. When he's talking to Christian identity, he's a Christian identity. If he's talking to Nazis, he's a Nazi. Talking about Bobo? If he's talking to Mormons, he's a Mormon. If he's talking to people who hate Mormons, he's left the Mormon church. If he's talking to the New Agers in Sedona, Arizona, he's tried every religion in the world, and he's never found one that he could believe in. That's Bo Wright's. Don't believe me? Go get all his tapes, talking to all these different groups, and listen to his own words. Now, I don't care what religion the man is. I believe in freedom. You know what I care about? He's lying to a lot of people. That matters to me. Some people tell me, well, I, that doesn't matter. He's doing good. I mean, you know... Maybe he has some failings. Every time he speaks to a different group, and every time he gets caught, he says he's never going to do it again, but he does. And just recently on his radio show, this man was talking about how he put his son through past life regression and how he believed in reincarnation. Now, the only reason I'm telling you this is so that you will be aware that you're being manipulated by a lot of different people and that you can't allow it to happen. You cannot believe anyone anymore. This is the age of deception. If you don't learn anything else today, I hope you learn that. This is the age of deception. Who's the great deceiver? So you better be careful if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, I hope you at least believe in God. But if you don't, you're lost. We're all lost. Without God, there can be no freedom. There can be no creator-endowed rights. There can be no protection of those rights. And we are all lost. I don't know about you. I don't want to be lost. 
It's a terrible state to be in. Coming up through history. These people have always been the ones who have guarded technology, who have guarded knowledge. Why do you think it was that nobody was allowed to read a book in Europe for thousands of years? Do you really think that it would have hurt them if the common man could read books? Not just religion, but everything. They couldn't control man with the hidden knowledge anymore. What upset the balance of power in the world more than anything? The printing press. Why do you think President Bill Clinton calls me the most dangerous radio host in America and is sick the IRS, the BATF, and the FBI on me? Because I didn't believe them when they told me that I was just one lonely little person and there wasn't anything that I could do. I've never believed it. Many of you are sitting here thinking that right now. Well, I'm just one lonely little person and nothing that I can do. This is all terrible news, but what can I can do? And you'll go home and you won't do anything because you convince yourself that you can't. Well, you see, I just never believed that. I just couldn't believe that because you know why? Because I'm a Christian. And I'm not trying to insult you or say that if you're not a Christian, that's bad or anything like that. But that enabled me to come out of it because I looked back at what Jesus Christ, one lonely, helpless, solitary human being, did and enabled me to do whatever I want to do. See, he lit the way for me. So I wrote a book called Behold a Pale Horse. Had this big manuscript. Took me years to write it. Nobody will publish it. Well, I had this crazy feeling that if I was doing the right thing, somebody would publish it. Because I just believe that if you're doing the right thing, God will help you. And it's never failed in my life that any time I'm doing the right thing, God always helps me, provides for me. If I'm doing the wrong thing, he smacks me down real quick. So somebody published this. Who published it? The enemy. Light Technology Publishing in Sedona, Arizona. A New Age publisher wanted to publish my book to warn the world about what they were doing to us simply because it had something about UFOs in it and they're really all caught up in that. I started not to put that chapter in there. So the enemy published my book for me. Been stealing all my royalties ever since, but I don't care. Because my goal was not to make money, it was to open people's eyes. I don't care if she steals my money. I really don't. God provides for us, not her. So I published the book. The book made a big hit, I gotta tell you. People were so scared of that book, you couldn't get it in any bookstore in this country. Now, folks, I'm telling you this not to build myself up or make you think I'm anything super, because I'm not. But just to show you that if I'm just one lonely little human being with a family that I must support, just like you, and I have the same brain that you have, if I can do these things, so can you. That's what's important. Not that I did it, but that if I did it, you also can do it. The whole world was stacked against me. And I mean the whole world. You don't know what attack is. I've been attacked physically, mentally, we've been intimidated, followed. We've had weird people show up at our door at 2 o'clock in the morning with purple hair. We've been shot at, shit on, and everything else that you can imagine. We've been called every name in the book. I have been attacked by the White House, the FBI, the ATF, the IRS. The Communist News Network, CNN, ABC, CBS, and NBC, all of the major talk radio hosts in America, Rush Limbaugh, 
And I'm still here. And if I can do it, you can do it. And when all this started, I thought, God, I've got to counter this somewhere. And then one day there was a Stanton Friedman character on, uh, on uh, Chuck Harder. And he was just calling me every name in the book. Anti-Semitic, white supremacist, Nazi. And Chuck Harder, yeah, yeah, I know about that guy, Cooper. <laughs> so I called Chuck and I said, hey, Chuck, you don't know anything about me. Why do you allow that to happen? And give me 10 minutes on your show just to correct the, the thing. We don't want anybody like you on my show. Anybody like me? But you don't even know me, Chuck. Well, I, I, I know about you. Okay. So I sent him a copy of my book, autographed it to Chuck from Bill. You know, read this. Got a fax from him. I can't repeat what he said in his fax because it might offend some people in here. So I said, okay, I got to get my own radio show. You can't do that. I can't. Why, why not? You know, radio today is like the road to Galilee. Jesus went along the road to Galilee. He'd find a rock and sit down and start talking. He didn't do what a lot of Christians do today. He didn't go out and try to grab them by the air and force them to learn and tell them if they didn't learn they were going to hell. He'd just sit on the rock and start talking. And the pastors by the one to keep going. He let them go, never said a word to them. The ones that stopped, he'd just keep on talking. And pretty soon there'd be this big crowd there and he would teach to them. Well, I found the road to Galilee. It was called a satellite. And I arranged through the Becker Satellite Network to get up on satellite. And I knew that there wasn't a radio station in this world that was going to carry my show. But I was going to be on satellite right there. And anybody coming along that wanted to pick it off a of satellite could just do that. you know. And I wouldn't try to force them or make them or anything. And KDNO did it. That's why some of you are here. And a lot of other stations across the country did it. A lot of low power FM stations did it. And a lot of people in this country have satellite dishes and listen to satellite radio that I never even knew about. First two weeks I was on satellite, I knew that nobody was listening to me and all of a sudden I got hundreds of letters. Whoa! Jesus was right. Find a rock and sit on it and start talking and somebody's going to stop and listen. He's never steered me wrong, ever, in my whole life. So I had a radio show. Pretty soon, WWCR called me and said, Hey, you're hot. We want you on our station five nights a week. I said, I don't have any money. Well, we'll put you on for a reduced rate and we'll see how it goes. We still don't have any money. Sat down with Annie and we decided, well, if God wants us to do this, God will provide the money. And so we signed a contract for a year with no money. And we did it. And God provided the money. Everything I've ever needed has been that way. When I was doing a series of videotapes on the Kennedy assassination, I needed Kenny, Kennedy material, didn't know where to get it. I needed speeches. I needed documentaries of his life. We were just driving down the road one day. Remember that, Annie? There was a little thrift store there. And I never go to thrift stores in my life. All of a sudden, I pull into the thrift store and park, and we all get out, walk in. What's right in front of the door? A whole rack full of Kennedy books, materials, records, and tapes. All used, all in various stages of decay and decrepitation, but it's exactly what I needed. And how much did it cost? I bought the whole rack for, I think, like 12 bucks. <laughs> now, if you think that happened by accident, you're nuts. I needed it. I was doing the right thing. God provided it for me. And that's the truth. And I'm not up here giving you a sermon. I'm telling you about my life. You've got to determine what your life is. We were doing that. And we were finding out that a lot of people read newspapers and were getting the wrong information in newspapers. And people were attacking me in the newspapers and printing lies, just generally lies in the establishment press. 
So I said, well, we're going to have a newspaper. You can't do that. Nobody will carry your newspaper. Nobody will read it. I don't care. I'm going to have a newspaper. So, did a newspaper. Didn't do a tabloid. Didn't do a newsletter. We did a newspaper. You'd be surprised how hard it is to do and how easy it is to do. And because we printed the truth, everybody wanted it. And I mean everybody. And because we wanted the Washington to know that we printed the truth, we sent a free copy to every representative, every senator, every member of the president's cabinet, the president, vice president, and every agency head in Washington. So we'd know. We got you pegged. We're printing the truth. And a lot of people are reading it. Oh, they didn't like that. They still don't like it. Pardon? I don't know. Bill gets one. I don't send her one because she's not an officer in government. <laughs> even though she may think she is. <laughs> this is my hometown paper. It's published by a guy named Glenn Jacobs. He's just one lonely, helpless, broke little guy who happens to have a house full of kids and a wife who, by the way, gives him hell about printing this paper because he doesn't make a lot of money and it takes most of his time. But this is what he does. This is a Round Valley paper. This is where I live. This is our paper. Pass this around and see what's in this paper. You see, there's hope, folks. And you know who's doing these things? One lonely, broke, individual, helpless people with families to support like the rest of you who are not doing what most of you are doing, saying, I have a family to support. I'm just one lonely, helpless, broke individual. I don't have any money. <laughs> don't say that to me. You can do whatever you want to do. And if you're doing the right thing, God will provide for you. I promise you that. It's a promise straight from my heart. I have lived it. I know how it works, and it's the truth. You find out what the right thing to do is. Make sure it's the right thing and God will provide for you to do it. Now Annie is the worrier in my family. Whenever we are running out of money or whatever is happening, she begins to worry. And when she worries, I tell you what, she lets me know. And what do I tell you, Annie? Trust in God and just do it. And God will provide. And God has always provided. Always. Sometimes it looks hopeless, but it's never hopeless. Believe me. When you just think everything's going to collapse, what you need will turn up if, and get me, understand this, folks, if and only if you're doing the right thing. Okay? If you let greed come into it, selfishness, if you're trying to do something to hurt someone else intentionally, God will not provide for you. If your number one goal is money, God's not going to provide for you. He's going to put stumbling blocks in your way. Doesn't mean you can't get rich. You can. Lots of crooks and terrible people in this world have got rich. But you're going to have stumbling blocks. You're going to have a hard, terrible life. And all of those people do. Always. They're not happy people. Then we decided to start a radio network. And do something nobody else has ever done empower the people to take back the airwaves. And they said, guess what? <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> well, we've done it. And we're still doing it. Now, I'm sort of jumping out of sequence here with this, and I've got to because Rosemary's leaving, and I want to make sure she leaves with this information. I think it's important because she's a leader in the Patriot community, and in this community, and, and a lot of others. 
So I'm going to tell you what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how you can be a part of it, and how you can alleviate the burden of expense on you and your community. We decided that one or two radio stations here and there is not enough. It's not enough to educate the American people, to bring them out of the wilderness, so to speak, and into a place of safety. Because this is the information age. Power is information, not money, today. People who don't understand what's happening are going to be the victims in this war. They're not going to have a choice. So we have to give them that choice by giving them information. We have to educate the American people. We can't do it just by depending upon the good graces of people like Richard Palmquist to run my program and others on his radio station. He did it by the grace of God for a long time without anybody asking him to, and I thank him for that, and I don't think anybody should hold any animosity toward him because he took it off, because he was never required to have it on in the first place. I never asked him to put it on there. He did it because he thought I had a message and he wanted to, to run it. After a while, I guess money became a problem to Richard. He sent me a bill I couldn't pay because we don't have any money. Nothing. Everything we have is put in trust for the children. Right now, between all six of the trusts, I think there's about maybe four thousand dollars total. And most of that doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to us. Subscriptions people have paid to purchase Veritas and, and other things. It's committed. Okay? But it is important you have your assets in trust. Annie and I own nothing, have nothing, don't want anything. Everything is in trust for our children and for the nation. We have a charitable trust, which is the Independence Foundation Trust, which everything that is not used in the other trusts goes as a donation to the Independence Foundation Trust, which gives back to the nation that which it holds. Okay? Here's what we're doing. We put together what we call the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. WWFN for short. Worldwide Freedom Network. <clears throat> we have purchased a satellite transponder for 24 hours a day. Do you know how much that costs? <laughs> Do you have any idea what that costs? Pardon? One thousand a what? A day? That's close. That's very close. We don't have the money. I just told you how much money we have. <laughs> we purchased this for a year. Because we know that if we're doing the right thing, God will provide that money. And God never fails to do it if we're doing the right thing. So we have the satellite transponder. It's satellite GE-1, the most powerful satellite in the sky. Transponder 7, write this down, folks. Satellite GE-1, transponder 7. 7.56 is the audio frequency, wide band. So it's GE1, transponder 7, 7.56 wideband. We're up there with scheduled programming. We can't put 24-hour-a-day programming up there yet because we don't have the money for the telephone uplink to the transponder, to the satellite uplink to the transponder for a 24-hour-a-day period. It costs us 10 bucks an hour to do that. Okay, so the listening audience so far is making donations and providing in donations $10 here, $5 there, $50. I think there's been a couple of $100 donations. 
in order for us to put additional programming up on the satellite. The programming up, that's up there is paid programming. Any of you in here who have ever dreamed of having your radio, own radio show can now realize that dream. We only have one rule. You don't say anything on our network unless you can document it. If you can't document it, you don't say it. If you make a habit of saying things you can't document, we just take you off the network. Other than that, you're welcome to broadcast on our network. We don't even have to agree with what you say as long as it's true and you can document it. Okay? For you to have your own radio station, or own radio show, I should say, on our network costs you $30 an hour. That's the lowest rate in the industry in the world, not just in this country. In the world. It is not only the lowest rate, but it undercuts the lowest rate by so much it would amaze you. The next lowest rate is $65 an hour on Jeff Baker's Amerinet. Okay? It's $30 an hour if you want to have a show on our network. You can have one show a week, one show a month. Five shows a week, I don't care. If you have five shows a week on our network, it's a flat rate, $600 per month. Where does that money go? Where's the money go? Goes to pay for the satellite. Not one red cent of it goes in my pocket or anybody else's. Period. Okay, we're up there. Who's going to hear us? Anybody got any ideas? No, we have created a network of affiliate radio stations made up of you. Micro broadcasting on FM bands. Okay, we now have over 700 affiliates. Over 700 affiliates, some of them outside this country in foreign countries. Some of them in Canada, some of them in Mexico. Okay, now. So we have a big listenership already. Plus, I'm on shortwave. My show is on shortwave. 9955 kilohertz. It's WRMI out of uh, Miami. Worldwide. Uh... What time, Pardon? What time? Five until seven Eastern Daylight Time, Monday through Friday. Now, let me tell you about these micro broadcasters. This is the most incredible thing I ever saw because there have always been people who call themselves pirate radio stations. That's not what we are. We're not pirate radio stations. We're not breaking the law. We don't want to break the law. We have discovered that most people don't know the law about broadcasting and anybody in this room can own your own radio station tomorrow if you want it. Today, if there was a place across the street where you could buy the equipment. Okay? And I'm going to tell you how to do this, because I want you to do it. Somebody in this room, right here today, within a couple of months, is going to have their own radio station on the air, right here. Maybe several of you. And I don't care if you carry our programming or not. What I care about is that you provide your community with an alternate source of news and programming. That's important. Because the communists and the socialists have taken over all of the media in this country and nobody's hearing the truth. You had a voice here. It's gone. Whoever the new owners are, I guarantee you, aren't going to be like Richard Palmquist. Some of these stations are so small that they only transmit a couple of blocks from the transmitter. How many houses are in a couple of blocks? Quite a few people live there, huh? So even though they're not transmitting to a whole city, if they're transmitting a couple of blocks in every direction, they're hitting a lot of people. And if they provide programming on a regularly scheduled basis, those people can always know that they can tune in at 6 o'clock and hear this program. Right? That's what's important. You can't just decide, well, we're going to broadcast two hours tonight, 
And, and then we're going to be off the air till Friday, and then Friday morning we're going to broadcast an hour, and then on Sunday we're going to broadcast six hours. Because if people don't know that you're always going to be on the air at these certain times, they're just simply not going to tune in anymore. So you have to provide continuity. Okay? Some of these micro-broadcasting stations are broadcasting out to a quarter of a mile in every direction from the transmitter. Some of them are going out five or six miles in every direction, hitting a lot of people. Some of them are going out 10, 15 miles in every direction. We have one of our affiliates made the Arbitron ratings recently. We have four stations that are broadcasting with 90, 95 watts of power, which is powerful. We have one that just went to 120 watts. Yes. I'm, I'm going to cover that. But right now, I want, to, want you to know the potential. When you hit 100 watts, you're on your own. Because that's when you've come into the purview of the FCC, but only under certain circumstances. Okay? Here's what we discovered by studying the law. The FCC virtually has no authority, period, except to license broadcasters who are engaged in interstate commerce, period. They do not have the authority to punish, fine, seize equipment, try, prosecute, or anything else, anybody, even the people they license. They can recommend those things to other agencies, but they don't have the authority to do any of the things that they have been doing. If they come to you and issue you an apparent violation notice or a notice of apparent violation and say that you have been fined ten thousand dollars that's unlawful they have broken the law they have no authority to do that whatsoever and you have been denied due process no charges have been brought against you you have not been tried you have not been convicted of anything have you when confronted with someone who knows the law these people run like hell it's happening all over the country. You would be amazed at how quickly this is growing into a groundswell of grassroots broadcasting. And who started it? One lonely, broke, helpless individual with a family to support who didn't have the money. I got on WWDCR and said, this is what we're going to do. You guys are all going to go out and buy these little broadcasting transmitters, and we're going to start this, and we did. And it's a success. How many of you, are there anybody in here listening, that listens on one of our FM affiliates? Anybody in here from any place? Okay, this is unusual. Usually there's at least one or two. We're on the air between 5 and 7 p.m., my show, we have other shows, 5 and 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight. There may be a low-power broadcaster in this area who's carrying our programming. I don't know. Go through your FM band slowly during that time. If you hear my voice, you've got a station near you. If you don't, you need to make a station near you so that everybody can hear. Either me or somebody else or your own programming. You could just play music for 24 hours a day. It's up to you. Here's how you can do it, folks. For less than $1,000, you can have your own radio station. And when I say less than $1,000, I'm not exaggerating in any way, shape, or form. It's the truth. And if you all get together, and share that cost. You can have a community-owned radio station that you all donate time to and help run for 25 or 50 bucks a piece. Okay? 
you must be less than 100 watts to be safe. You can be over 100 watts if you're not broadcasting interstate or across any international boundary and you're not engaged in commerce, which means no commercials. Okay? If you're going to have commercials or go across a boundary, you better not have 100 watts and you better not have commerce. Okay? So you've got to be less than 100 watts, no commerce, And it's got to be intrastate. What's intrastate mean? Within your state. Within your state. Your broadcast cannot go across a state line or an international boundary and should not be able to be received by ships at sea. Okay? If you stick within those parameters, the FCC has absolutely no authority, no jurisdiction over you whatsoever. We wrote a letter to the FCC folks. Said, please, tell us about your regulation of intrastate broadcasting on the FM band. Guess what we got back? The FCC does not regulate intrastate broadcasting. The FCC regulates interstate commerce amongst broadcasters over 100 watts of power. I've read the letter on the air several times. We've also prepared a great legal dossier from all of the confrontations with the FCC across the country. And guess what? The FCC is leaving all of us alone. Because we're not violating the law. We're within the law. We're doing the right thing. And we know what we're doing, and we can quote the law to them. And they don't want to see us in court. Recently, the FCC tried to intimidate one of our 95-watt broadcasters. He wasn't intimidated. Neither were we. The FCC said, well, in that case, we'll help you get a license. <laughs> so that you can broadcast with even more power. So the FCC is helping that station get a license. How about that? I have a station in Eager, Arizona, 101.1 FM. 101.1 FM Eager. Classic radio, like you always wished it could be. And it's not usually your voice that does that, though. Yes, it is. It's, it's a little girl that does it a lot of times. That's the little girl that does it most of the time. <laughs> but occasionally I do it too. We start off with. We started off. <laughs> We started off with 25 milliwatts of power. With 25 milliwatts of power on the mountain where we live, surrounded by 7,000 people, we were going out six miles. We added a little one watt amplifier to it. Now we're going 15 miles in every direction. We own the valley. There's a commercial station there nobody listens to anymore. <laughs> they don't listen to them anymore. Everybody in the valley is listening to 101.1 FM Eager. When we're not carrying regular programming from the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network on my station, I play oldies all the time. <laughs> and you can listen to my station for 24 hours and never hear the same song repeated twice. Can you, have you ever heard any music station in the country where you can say that? No. no. So that's one of the reasons they listen to 101.1 FM.
besides the wonderful programming that we give them when we're giving them programming. Yes, Rosemary. Can they shut off the satellite? Yes, they can. <laughs> I, I know that probably as good as they have done that to me. When I have really been hitting them with some hard programming that they just don't want the American people to hear, they have turned off that transponder just as cold as, as if you stepped into an ice water shower. And there's nothing you can do about it. But they don't do it all the time. And they don't do it that often because they don't want anybody to know that they can do it. So as frequently as they do it, they only do it when I'm really into something that, that's really dangerous to them. And they can always say that it was some technical glitch or something. Yes? Pardon? Oh, wow, there's all kinds of satellites up there all over the sky, folks. And there are people who do nothing but make their living brokering transponders on satellites. They sell satellite time. So you have to, uh, the, way I, the way we found out is just by word of mouth, I wanted to get on the radio. I didn't know how to do it. And somebody said, well, call this guy Becker in Kansas. I called him. That was the first satellite I ever was on. After that, they've been calling me for years. You want to buy some satellite time on blah, 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 blah? You want to be on the Inspiration Channel? Uh, we, we would sure like to have you on the Outdoor Channel. How much is it? $600 an hour. No, thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> but God always provides. Okay, now you're going to be amazed at how cheaply you can do this. Now, if you don't think these, these prices are cheap, you go down to your local satellite dealer and ask them what their prices are. Cheapest price they can give you, okay? Here's what we can give you. We can give you an eight foot, excuse me, it's a seven foot, isn't it, Danny? Seven foot Orbitron dish, which is the best there is. We can give you a seven foot Orbitron dish. We can give you the cables. We can give you the satellite receiver. Now this receives audio and television. Now you can just forget about all this, purchase our satellite system and Destroy your mind with TV if you want to. It's up to you. You can get everything from us to set up your satellite dish and receive any satellite you want, but we want you to get our programming and rebroadcast it, or rebroadcast whatever you want from anywhere you want. A Marinette's up there. I think the Freedom Radio Network's up there. Uh, you don't even have to get a satellite receiving station if you don't want to. You can just set up your own radio broadcasting station and you can be the announcer, talk show host, uh, religious preacher, anything you want to be on radio on your own station or you can buy tapes from other people and play them. Pardon? I don't know. I really don't. Okay, so now we can sell you a complete satellite receiving station for I believe it's, what is it Annie? $580, something like that? No, it's more than that. I think it's 500, between $565 and $580. But you can write us at that address and we'll send you the, the exact price. Okay? Because I didn't come here to sell you this stuff. I came here to let you know that it's available. I'm also letting you know that you can get fantastic deals from people who already have satellite receiving stations, the dish, the receiver, everything, who have gone to this little bitty dish and want to get rid of their old one. Sometimes you can pick up the whole system for 150 bucks. You see, I'm not trying to sell you ours. I'm just telling you, we have made arrangements with a manufacturer to give you the best brand new system that money can buy, cheaper than you can buy it anyplace else in the country. But you have other opportunities open to you. What I really want you to do is get one from somewhere I don't care where. If you don't get it from us, it won't hurt me. But if you get one, no matter where you get it from, it will make me very happy. Because it opens 
your horizons. It expands your horizons. You're not locked in to just the stations here or just the radio here. Every radio program in the world is on satellite. You didn't know that, did you? Rush Limbaugh's up there. Everybody. That's how radio stations get their radio transmissions now, off a of satellite. Every television program you ever dreamed of is on satellite. It's all up there. Okay? If you think cable's great, you ain't seen nothing. We sit on our mountaintop with our little remote control. We can get anything in the world, including the feeds that you never saw yet and never will see because they're cut out on the cutting room floor. We watched the whole Waco thing on KU Band, the stuff you never saw. Everything, it's all up there. The Gulf War, 24 hours a day. The Gulf War was on satellite, but you only saw 10 seconds on the Dan Rather report. Yes, Gary. Two questions. Uh, the definition of no commerce, and the other one is when you read broadcast music, is there a problem with the BMI or the ASCAP? No. If you use it as your theme song and you haven't paid the author or don't have the permission of the author, yeah, you're in, you, could, you could get in trouble, maybe. Well, not only that, but you see, if you're playing music and it's different music all the time, you're just another DJ, only you don't have commercials in between. You're selling their music for them. Commerce is when you're trading in goods. You offer something for sale. Are you charged for programming? Okay. Worldwide Freedom Radio Network charges for programming. 101.1 FM Eager doesn't. FCC has no jurisdiction over me renting a satellite transponder and putting up there whatever I want to. I can charge whatever I want to for it. But 101.1 FM Eager does not charge for programming, nor does it pay for programming, nor does it have commercials. It is a community service station, nonprofit. Big loser, if you want to know the truth, because everything is donated and everything is a cost. Nothing is, nothing comes in. Yes. No, you can't. You can't offer anything for sale as the radio station. You can carry network programming that has commercials. That's not a station commercial. You're just rebroadcasting somebody else's programming. They can't get you for that. And they can't get you anyway, Gary, unless it goes across a state line. Lake or a pond, no. Great Lakes, where there may be Canadian shipping, yes. Pacific Ocean, yep. Atlantic Ocean, yep. Gulf of Mexico, yep. Lake Pond, no. International or interstate border, yes. See, you can even engage in commerce as long as you are intrastate. You understand what I'm saying? You can't get in trouble with commerce unless you're going across a state or international boundary or a large body of water such as an ocean or the Great Lakes. The FCC is only authorized to regulate interstate commerce period. They are not authorized to regulate anything intrastate, and that goes for most or all agencies of government. Now, your state can regulate this, but so far we have not found one state who regulates radio broadcast one way. And the people to check with is your state utility commission. I can tell you right now, the state of California does not regulate one way FM radio broadcast. Period. Yes. What about UN Bodies? Is that international? 
No. Not yet. Yes, Rosemary. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You mean, it's one-way broadcast. For instance, it's not walkie-talkies. You don't have a transmitter and a receiver to which we are talking back and forth of. It's a broadcast from a central point out and nobody answers back. That's what that means. She meant for your own telephone, I believe. You know, could they call you up? Absolutely, yeah. Sure they can call you up. Can you ask for donations? Let me say this once again. As long as you are broadcasting intrastate, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. I would not recommend exceeding 100 watts. If you go across a state boundary, now you're getting into some touchy territory. You can cross a state boundary if you're not engaged in commerce. Because the FCC only has jurisdiction only over interstate commerce. Period a hundred watts and above. But just to be safe, I don't want you to go across state lines. I would prefer that you stay away from commerce. And I would prefer that you stay below a hundred watts. Don't tickle the tail of the dragon. If you want this to succeed. See, our goal is not to piss off the FCC. Our goal is to educate the American people. Keep your eye on the sparrow. If that's our goal, yes, sir. The FCC also regulates the assigned frequency. You've got to use a band that doesn't have an assigned frequency. Well, they can only assign frequencies to those that they license, and those that they license, they can only license that are engaged in 100 watts or over and interstate commerce. You can use any frequency that you want, whether it's assigned or not, as long as it's not assigned in your area. For instance, all FM frequencies are assigned somewhere. Okay? I use 101.1 FM in Eager because there's nobody broadcasting on 101.1 FM Eager or within 50 miles. You can't hear anybody on that frequency at any time ever. And I studied that frequency for a month before I decided to use it and a lot of others. And that's what you've got to do too. For instance, in Los Angeles area, it would be hard to find a frequency that you could broadcast on. Be very difficult. Because I guarantee you, there's something on almost every FM band in Los Angeles. But here in Delano, you can study all the available frequencies several times a day and during the night, and you could drive out and make trips all around studying the reception on these frequencies for about 30 days, and you can come up with a frequency that's clear that you can broadcast on that's not going to interfere with or hurt anybody else. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to interfere with somebody else's broadcast. That's not what we're about. We're about freedom, right? That's right. You don't want to broadcast on a frequency where somebody else is already broadcasting. Why would you want to do that? Well, yeah. Sure. What you want to do is do what I did. You want to find, like in our area, there's a 96.5 and there's a 101.7. Excuse me. It's 101.7. That's right. 96.5, 101.7. So people driving through that area or listening to radio will go back and forth between mm -hmm. them. And most radios have that automatic button. You punch the button and then it'll go to the next broadcasting station. I captured a huge audience who thought they were going from 96.5 to 101.7 and it locked on my frequency. And before they understood that they weren't on 101.7, they were hooked on my music and programming. So there was a method to my madness. 
And you also want to stay at the higher end of the FM spectrum because at the lower end there's a lot of, of uh, what are they, public broadcasting stations uh, on, on the lower end of FM. And they're all over the country. And a lot of people listen to them. Okay? There's also such a thing as harmonics, so you want to make sure you have a good transmitter. Now, I've already told you what you can get the satellite receiving system for. Let me give you some prices for transmitters. <laughs> this is going to frost you. I'm going to give you the price for my transmitter, the one I have. It's the only one I recommend anymore. Not because I have it, but because we have recommended others because they were cheaper, and it just doesn't work out. Okay? This one, if you put it together yourself, is $249.95. It's a kit. 25 milliwatts. Okay? This is a kit. This is a professional radio station. It's about this big. It has all the filters, everything in it. It sounds as good or better than any commercial FM station you've ever listened to in your life. When people come up to my studio and they say, where's the radio station? And I say, right there, and I point to this little box. You're kidding. Man, this sounds good. And it does. You can tune into any FM station you want to anywhere. This sounds as good or better. And I'm not joking, I'm not lying to you, I'm telling you the truth, it really does. It costs $249.95, that's if you put it together yourself. There's an export version kit, which you also put together yourself, it costs $329.95, instead of 25 milliwatts, it's one watt. But you have to send a letter telling them that you're going to export the radio. Okay? So you know what people do? They phone their friend in Arkansas. Say, I'm going to send you the money. I want you to order this from Ramsey. Send them a letter saying you're going to export this radio. When they get it, they send it to you. It's been exported from Arkansas to California. You told the truth. There's also one. It's the high power export version fully wired and tested, assembled. It's $399.95. Again, you have to send them a letter saying you're going to export that transmitter. Okay? Or they won't sell it to you. Pardon? They're just covering themselves in case the FCC gets antsy. They don't want to be blamed for selling you a radio that you might use to try to broadcast over a commercial station frequency. Uh, and, and interfere with somebody else and get in all kinds of legal tangles. That's why. It's called CYA. Are these set up to uh, just uh, hook a linear two or an amplifier two? Or, or you can hook whatever you want to. These are these are the basic unit that you can go ahead and amplify. Them. No, this isn't a basic unit. This is a really professional transmitter. Well, what I mean is, it's only putting out one watt or whatever. Can you go ahead and run a linear tube that? You can run it into a, an amplifier, okay. but you have to make sure that it's built for FM right. transmissions. You can't, I don't believe that you can hook this to like a CB linear oh, no, amp. No, 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 no. Okay. FAM is yeah. Okay, the antenna. They make an antenna that is built especially for this transmitter. It's called the True Match FM broadcast antenna. By the way, this is Ramsey. You can call them and get their catalog. Let me give you their number. It's 800-446-2295. 800-446-2295. Ask them to send you a catalog. Remember, the only transmitter that I recommend is the Super Pro FM Stereo Radio Station. That's the only one I'll recommend to you. We've tried the FM10, we've tried the FM25. If you have a super wizard that can put those together and not uh, make any cold solder joints or anything like that, um, they'll work fine. 
but we're finding out that a lot of people aren't able to do that. Okay? So, what we recommend is a Super Pro FM stereo radio station. I don't get a penny from Ramsey. They don't even know that I'm doing this. I'm sure they'd be happy if they did know. You can either get the kit and put it together yourself. You've got to be good to do these kits. You can't do any cold solders and you can't screw up the parts, okay? If you can't do that, find somebody who can. If you can't find somebody, call us and we'll give you the name and address of somebody who will do it for you for a fee and they do it really good. Or you can order the fully wired and tested export version for $399.95. You don't have to assemble anything. It's been done by professionals at the factory. It's fully guaranteed. All you have to do is write a letter saying it's going to be exported. Now don't lie to them. If you write a letter to them saying it's going to be exported, export it. You understand what I'm saying? You don't have to tell them where you're exporting it to, but export means it's going to cross a line somewhere. Okay? Tell the truth, export it, because I will not be a party to lies. I just won't be. Do they have a website? No. True Match FM Broadcast Antenna. This is a kit also. It's easy to put together. I did mine in about an hour. It is fantastic. It is really great. Cost you $39.95. It's matched to the transmitter. Now, if you want a one watt amp, which will give you more power, here's what I recommend that you do. First you go to Radio Shack. Radio Shack has a little unit that costs you ten dollars, or excuse me, twelve dollars and ninety-five cents. It's one of those things you hook up when you're running like over a hundred feet of cable between your VCR and your television set. Get the one that's 10 decibels. Now they have a 10 decibel, they have a 20 decibel, and they have a 30 decibel. Get the 10 decibel. You get the 20 decibel and the 30 decibel, you're going to screw up. Believe me. I've already tried it. I made the mistakes. I ruined some equipment. Learn from me. <laughs> get the 10 decibel inline amplifier, which means it has one cable going in, one cable coming out. There's nothing else on there. It's not a splitter. And it's built for amplifying FM, stereo, and television through cable over 100 feet. Okay? You run your antenna cable from your transmitter to this unit, and then a short line from this unit to a 1 watt amplifier, which I'm going to give you right now. 1 watt amplifier. Wired, tested, and in a case, $99.99. See, when I told you it's under $1,000, I wasn't joking you. <laughs> $99.99 for a 1-watt linear power booster wired, tested, in a case. And that's the LPA 1-watt. Now, when you get that, you also have to get the 12-volt DC wall plug adapter, which is the AC 12-5 for $9.95. That's it. You mount your antenna where you want it to be, the higher the better. You run your cable down to your one watt amplifier, everything else is in line. You hook up your mixer and your CD player or your tape player and your microphone and all that kind of stuff that you're going to use to broadcast with, and you're on the air. Now I'm not counting anything else because everybody's got that already anyway. Everybody's got a cassette deck, don't you? If you don't, they're really inexpensive. CD players today are inexpensive. You can go to Radio Shack and get a little bitty mixer, 30, 40 bucks. That's it. You're on the air. You're on the air. If you have the satellite receiving station, you can get our schedule. And when we have scheduled broadcasting on satellite, all you got to do is turn on your satellite and plug it into your mixer and uh, we're on the air. When we don't have scheduled broadcasting, you can put whatever you want to. But understand this, if you're going to have a radio station, have a radio station. If people can't count on tuning to that frequency and hearing something, they will soon not tune to that frequency. You got to have something there. How do you do that? How do you play music 24 hours a day? 
Well, you get a 24 disc CD changer and 24 CDs and you put them in there and you turn it on. You adjust your volume levels and you walk away and that thing will play music for 24 hours and you don't have to do anything. Everybody on town will go, who's watching the studio? <laughs> God watches my studio. <laughs> 24 hours a day. So there you have it. What happens if you have power outages? What happens if you have an earthquake? What happens if a volcano erupts? I mean, you can be as elaborate as you want to. If you want to, you can hook up a, an automatic starting secondary generator that will turn itself on when the power trips off. And uh, you can have a, a backup, uh, what do they call it, a UPS like computer guys do to make up for that interval while the generator is starting. And you can never have interrupted anything. I mean, it, you, you can get as elaborate as you want to. I just gave you simple basics. You can do what you want to do. You can even get people from the community to come in and write, produce, and put on original radio drama. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be a real radio station right here in Porterville, California, or Atlanta, Georgia, or wherever you want to be. Texas. So many people here from Austin, Texas. Okay. So within a month or two, I expect to have some of you people on the air. You should call my secretary at this number, 520-333-4578. It's 520-333-4578. If you're going to do this, we'll send you our package for being an affiliate station, including all the legal briefs and a whole bunch of other stuff and our schedule of programming and uh, help you in any way that we can. 3334578. Three, three, four, five, seven, eight. Area code 520. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you're right. We do have an affiliate in Ivanhoe. Yes, we do. So you've heard that station. Well, I know him, so I remember. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we do have an affiliate station just north of here, not very far. That's right. Okay, does anybody have any questions about low power broadcasting, Worldwide Freedom Radio Network, any of this that we've just discussed? I want to get that out of the way because I don't want it to interfere with what we're going to be doing later. Yes, sir? Pardon? That's the best place to broadcast from. The higher your antenna is, the farther your, trend, your broadcast will go and the less power you have to have to do it. So the higher you can get your antenna, yes, with these you can. In fact, if you get a, a, an AC-DC converter, you could drive up to the top of a mountain in your car and broadcast, set the antenna up on top of your, your, uh, your car and, uh, and broadcast from right there. Yeah, you can. Do you know if there's any height limits on the antenna from the ground, from where you're at? In other words, can you be over 50 feet, can you be over 100 feet? I don't know. You have to talk to the people in your area. Yes, Gary. There's limits on certain streets. Well, I can't tell them everything. <laughs> there's some things you're going to have to learn, folks, in doing this. And most of it comes in the directions with the kits and things. Uh, but you should, you know, do a little bit more than, than just a cursory look at this. Because you do need to ground your antenna. You do need to take precaution against lightning. You do need to make sure that when you put your antenna up, it's not near any power lines. Okay? A lot of people have been killed trying to hoist up an antenna mast and it gets out of their grip and falls against a power line and you've got crispy critters all over the lawn. And it doesn't make your wife very happy. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Well, you, you have to go out and find out. Like every once in a while, just make sure everything's operating correctly. I'll get in my Bronco and I'll drive all around the valley and I'll drive out in every direction as far as I can go and make sure that we're still operating at peak capacity. And that's how you find out, by going out and listening to your own station. And when you drive and it starts getting weak and then you can't hear it anymore, that's the limits of your broadcasting range as far as anybody can hear it, as far as the affecting broadcast, effective broadcast range is where you can hear it and understand it and it's pleasing to the ear. Okay? What if you live within a fairly large state, and the chance of Not if you're under 100 watts, no. Not unless you're near the border. I don't know any radio station that even broadcasts at 100 watts that, that, that can go 100 miles. You usually can't hear them more than 40 miles. See, 100 watts, when radio is concerned, is not a lot of power. KDNO broadcasts with what? 50,000 no, 50, 50, watts. So we're talking 100 watts here. Less than 100 watts. You know, with 95 watts, you're going to go maybe 20, 25 miles. If you're on a mountaintop with one watt, you can go 15. Just depends upon how high you can get your antenna. Okay? I think that is important, that you all know that and that you can do it, and that you not be afraid to do it. I'm going to give you my website now, write this down. If you want to learn more about this, it's all on my website on the internet, and it gives you links to go to other places so you can learn other things. It's, get ready for this, it's the big www. HTTP <laughs> colon www, no, it's HTTP colon, forward slash, forward slash, I almost forgot that, yeah. www dot, what was it? telepath, telepath <laughs> dot com, forward slash, believer, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www dot telepath dot com forward slash believer. Yeah, everything on the internet is small letters. Yes, sir. Uh, Randy also has a website. It's on the front of your cover of the magazine. Do they? No. Yes, sir. It's right on the front page and down towards the bottom. Front page. No. It's not on yours? No. If it was on mine, I would have given it to you. I've got it at home. Evidently, they haven't sent me the new catalog yet. Okay. If there are no further questions on this, let's take a short break and then we'll come back and get into some more meat of the matter. <laughs> I am routinely attacked by white supremacists, real white supremacists, because I won't support their racist viewpoint. And because I won't support their racist viewpoint, I get letters like, I forget what they call them, your children are, uh, pardon? Mo uh, mongrels, that's right, your children are mongrels. And when we take over the nation, we're going to have to, we're going to kill all the mongrels. And uh, you're a race traitor because you married a Chinese woman. All this kind of stuff. And then I get attacked from the other side saying that I'm a white supremacist. Okay. So when you enter this battle, I hope you understand that nobody's going to like you. Because in this day and age, if you stand for freedom, nobody likes you. Now I'm going to talk about the militia.
How many in here are in the militia? I am. I'm not afraid to admit it. Okay. I'm going to talk about the militia. If you're not in the militia, you need to be. If you are in the militia, you need to reorganize your thinking because I guarantee you, you've got the wrong concept of what the militia is and you're probably operating illegally, unlawfully, unethically, and probably maybe even immorally. <clears throat> and I say that based upon past experience with other militias around the country not knowing anything about your militia and with the added CYA thing that uh, I could have been wrong about that but most probably I'm right. Now, what's wrong with a militia? Nothing, that's right. What is the militia? Who said that? Okay, say it again, real loud. That's correct. That was the concept and the founding of this nation was that the people would act as their own defense. That there would never be a standing army. Why? Because they saw what standing armies could do to a civilian population to enslave them and destroy them in Europe. And they wanted to start what? A new world. They want to get rid of all of that stuff. So they gave us freedom. It's a great gift. They knew we would probably throw it away, but they wanted to give us all the tools to make sure that we could keep it if we really deserved it, and if we did, and we could hang on to it responsibly and not give it away in exchange for some imagined security or benefits from a big central government or a king or something like that, then that would be the New World Order. That would be the New World. Okay? So a lot of people think that when I tell them what our founding fathers really were, that I'm attacking them, and that, that if they really were that, they wouldn't have given us freedom and all this kind of stuff. Baloney. They understood human nature. They gave us our freedom, knowing that human nature is to give it up in exchange for promised security, even if it means we have to go into slavery. Because they understood what it took me a long time to figure out, because I really didn't understand all this in the beginning either. And usually I, I find the true answer by just looking within myself. Don't we usually spend the first 20 years of our life trying to get away from home and become free and responsible? Doesn't everybody, their big dream is, gee, I'll be glad when I'm out of daddy's house and and I can go where I want to and I don't have to be in by midnight and I can drive my car and you know isn't that true? How many of you think that's true? Good. And isn't it also true that once we get out there and understand what's really required and how responsible we are and how hard it is that we spend the rest of our life trying to find somebody that'll take care of us? Huh? Isn't that true? Good. Isn't that why a lot of guys go in the military? Oh, I'm leaving home and it's a hard world out there. <laughs> no, I'm going into service. They'll give me a bed and food and all that kind of stuff and send me around the world and I get to see everybody, have a girl at every port and boy, it's fine, huh? And then you find out what that is. The socialism. And some guys love it and they stay in for life. Some of them even convince themselves that they're doing great service for their country, which is what I was involved in, convincing myself that I was doing great service for my country. It was my plan to stay in the military forever until I figured it all out and saw what was really going on when they made a mistake and put me in the Office of Naval Intelligence and I became the briefing team member for Admiral Bernard Clary and got to see the truth I said, oh, I'm leaving and I was gone that's why you can't depend upon these guys sitting around the VFW and the veterans of foreign wars and the American Legion halls to help us in this battle they spent their life in the military. They are socialists. All they give a damn about 
and, I'm, and I don't care if it pisses you off if you're one of them because it's the truth and I'll stand and duke it out with you face to face over it if you want to it's the truth the only thing they give a damn about is sitting around in those halls getting drunk and telling lies about how brave they are and getting their retirement check every month they have been trained to be socialists and they are going to be good little socialists forever okay it's the truth absolute truth anybody who's receiving a government check is not going to help us in this battle that includes old folks on Medicare and everything else if you can't turn around and walk away from it now you're not going to help us in this battle you have been socialized Sorry if it makes you angry, but it's true, because you're not going to do anything to jeopardize your little checky-wecky, right? But the truth is, free people don't get little checky-weckies from Big Brother. They don't do it. And Social Security is not an insurance policy. It's a hook. It's a hook, along with all the rest of these benefits and things. You cannot accept the benefit from Big Brother without enslaving yourself in the process. Okay? Now I know I've just really severely made some of you angry. But I promised you I would do that when I came in and I never ever go back on my promise. <laughs> so I want you to think about that. For some of you it may be too late. If you're up into your elder years and you haven't done anything in your life to save any money to provide for your old age or your retirement or your medical expenses because you were promised Social Security, didn't think you had to, then maybe you don't have any way out of that. And I don't have any answers for you. And I truly feel for you in my heart because you're engaged in a conflict within yourself. But most of you in here aren't in that situation. And there are things that you can do to provide for your old age and your medical care and, and anything else that you're going to need as life progresses upon us all and nobody leaves this place alive and nobody ever stays young forever. Okay? Why do you think it is that over the years they have encouraged people to put the elderly in the old folks' homes? Hmm? is to take the wisdom of many many years of experience and living and learning out of the home and to hook the elderly in a social system which they can't give up you want to help your old folks get out of it take them back into your house get them out of the old folks home take them off of Social Security and all that other stuff, take care of them like you're supposed to, like they took care of you and changed your shitty little diapers when you were little children. Now, they did that for all of us. How dare we? How dare we put them on a shelf waiting to die in an old folks home? To me that's criminal. It is one of the things that's destroying this country. It takes grandmothers and grandfathers away from little children. It deprives them of the ability to see someone die in the home and be able to understand it and know that someday it's going to happen to them too. Now if you have children, Understand that under the current system, someday your children are going to turn their back on you and shelve you in an old folks home so you can die out of their sight, out of their mind, and out of their pocketbook. If you don't think that's going to happen, you don't think your own children will do that to you, you better take another look around. Because that's the norm today. It's a terrible thing. It will not happen to my parents. When they get too old, they can't take care of themselves, I will go and get them and bring them home and take care of them. And Annie's parents too, if I have to go to China to do it. That's not a boast, it's a fact in my family. And it should be in yours. If it's not, you need to do something to rectify it. 
There are a lot of things that are occurring in this country that are wrong that need to be righted and we can do it and you don't have to wait for anybody else to be able to do that. You can provide for your own, you can take care of yourselves. Now I'm going to tell you something else. In this country, it has become a disgrace not to have a lot of money. Why do you think they do that? Why do you think that that's being foisted upon us? To get you in debt. To get you in debt under their control and make you a victim. When I was a young boy, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have much of anything. But I'll tell you something, we were happy. We had each other. And it was before television seized the minds of America, and we talked to each other. And people would come over in the evening and sit around and actually talk to each other. Do you realize how rare that is today? Do you understand that the average American spends seven hours a day in front of the television set? That's on top of work and eating and sleeping. People don't know each other. They don't talk to each other. They don't know their neighbors. They don't know their own family members. These are all things we can do something about. What I advise people to do as far as the television set is concerned, find the youngest child in your family, give them a hammer, and tell them to go play with the set. <laughs> do your child a favor though, unplug it first. Let them play with it. See, little Johnny, the television set is broken. Here's a hammer and a screwdriver. Would you please go fix it for Daddy? <laughs> that child will take care of the biggest problem you've got in your home in short shrift, I guarantee you. And at first it'll seem a little strange. But after you actually get used to talking to each other, you're going to find a miracle is going to take place. You're going to become a family again. You're going to know each other. You're going to do things with each other. You're going to care about each other. You're going to talk about your problems. You're actually going to invite the neighbors over. And if they can break away from their TV set, they might even come. And if they come and find that there's no TV set in your living room, they'll be forced to talk to you. And you'll find another miracle will occur. You'll become friends. Now that's really weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But when I was a kid, that was normal. And all the children in the block would be outside playing all in the street until late at night. And nobody was ever afraid. Nobody ever got molested or kidnapped or hurt or run over or anything else. We'd play kick the can and run around with the flashlights and, and just have a great time. And the adults would be in talking and playing music and having snacks and sometimes a drink or two. And I gotta tell you, I remember it as a really great time. What I see now is not great. Nobody knows anybody. And as soon as people come home, they plant themselves in front of the TV set and they don't leave that TV set until they go to bed. And nobody talks to anybody. And everybody's afraid of everybody else because that's all you see on TV is everybody killing everybody else, right? It is absolutely true that what children and people, adults, see on TV will make inroads into their lives. It will desensitize you to accept things that you never would have accepted before because you are bombarded with it on television 24 hours a day, and so it becomes a normal part of your life. And so when it happens in your neighborhood, it doesn't bother you. And that's one of the main purposes of all of this. We've got to pause for about 30 seconds while they change the tape. like that, huh? You all heard her holler, dad you. That's her word for water. So when she hollers, dad you, she wants some water. So here's some water. 
Want some more? Okay. She's going to do that right now. If you'll all stand. What? No flag? We'll all pretend that there's a flag right over here in this corner, and Pooh can lead us in the pledge. Wait a minute. She wanted to do this, and I promised she could, and some, a lot of you have asked if she could do it. Okay, it's all up to you. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United, United States of America, America and, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. all. <laughs> Thank you, Vivian. Oh, she wants to. You want to say something? She wants to eat it. <laughs> okay. Take Allie, go back and play. Thank you, honey. The children are the, are the future of this world. They're the future of this nation. They're, they're, they are all that is important. We've all had our chance. We've screwed up our lives. We've screwed up the country. We've screwed up the world. Let's teach our children the right things and give them the, the, the opportunity to do the things that we should have done a long time ago. And let's do all we can in the meantime to make sure that they can have a free future with all the opportunity and, and benefits that we screwed up. And the truth is, is, is that we really screwed it up. And if we're not careful, we're going to leave them to be slaves in a socialist world that they're not going to be happy in. But they won't know that they're not happy because they will be brainwashed and taught that that's the way it's supposed to be and there isn't anything else. And the record of freedom will just be simply removed from history. Will be taken out and thrown away. And we don't want that. She's very assertive. Pooh, why don't you just go over there by mom? She'll follow you. She's okay. Go to mommy, honey. That's a good girl. Thank you. See how easy it is? <laughs> You can't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. But if you ask them politely, they might do it. Okay. Let's get back to the subject at hand. Militias. <laughs> Militias are absolutely necessary to a free people. The Founding Fathers knew this. They couldn't ignore it even if they wanted to because the people knew it. Who was it that stopped the Redcoats when they went to seize the arms at Lexington? The militia. The militia. How were they described by the British commander? We marched to the bridge and were met by a group of farmers with guns who drew up in a somewhat military order and opposed us. That's how they were described. They weren't military people. They were farmers who had guns and who said, uh -uh. nope. I don't care who sent you, King George, or it doesn't matter. You're not taking our guns because we know that if we give up our guns, we are no longer a free people. What is so hard to understand about that? I can't figure it out, folks, that all of these people actually believe that they can allow themselves to be disarmed and they're going to stay free. They can for all, fall for all these scams and phony statistics and everything that are lies about guns and how many children are killed with guns and how many guns are used in, uh, and it's always automatic weapons, and, and they never are. They never are automatic weapons, but they are in the press. How many of you own uh, guns? 
good for you. I personally believe that it's the duty of every American to own guns. The duty. See, I take it beyond right. I say it's a duty to maintain freedom. We must own guns, therefore it's a duty. If you don't own guns, you're not fulfilling your duty. You're letting yourself and your community down. In the face of all the propaganda and opposition and everything else, you must own guns. You must. It is a duty. You must learn how to use them, take care of them. You must teach your children how to be safe around them, how to use them, how to take care of them, when to touch them, when not to touch them. Make sure that they know. Like I teach my family. You don't ever point a gun at anyone unless you intend to kill them. And if you intend to kill them, do it. Don't hesitate, because if you do, they'll kill you. It's that simple. Don't ever pick up a gun unless you intend to use it. If you use it, use it in a safe, secure manner, like I taught you. Don't ever point a gun at another human being or an animal or anything that lives unless you intend to kill it. And if you intend to kill it, do it. Don't hesitate. So don't mess with my wife. She'll kill you. And I'm not joking. When we were broadcasting from Waco, Texas, we went to the little place on the hill where you could see the Branch Davidian Church down there, burning. And they had all these hawkers there with the uh, Jesus lives with a picture of uh, David Koresh. And uh, welcome to our Texas barbecue with a picture of the church burning. BATF bought a lot of those. And I was taking pictures of these two BATF guys buying these t-shirts. And one of them saw me. And he turned around and he walked toward me real fast and he pulled his weapon halfway out of his holster and he came over to me and he said, give me that camera. And I said, no. He said, give me the camera or I'll be forced to take it. I said, no. I'm protected by the first article and amendment. I'm a member of the press and I showed him my press credentials. And I said, even if I wasn't, you wouldn't get my camera. You have no right to take my camera. He said, well, then give me the film. I said, I'm not going to give you the film either. And by that time, everybody's looking, and some people are starting to come over. And I turned around, and there was Annie standing there with her hand in her purse. <laughs> and if he'd have touched me, she would have blown him right off the face of this earth so quick, you wouldn't even believe it. And that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we have to have militia, and militia is everybody who's capable of functioning in some capacity as a militiaman. And that includes, in my estimation, men and women, although the law only specifies men, and has always only specifies men. We have traditionally in this country allowed women to serve in any capacity that they wish to volunteer to serve in, including serving as crew members of weapons. One famous incident in the Civil War, a woman whose husband was an artilleryman, she was pregnant almost ready to give birth. He was killed at one of the battles in the Civil War. She immediately rushed up, grabbed the swab that he used to clean the cannon, or to swab the cannon with water after it had been fired, and took his place. I met Linda Thompson in Waco, Texas. While I was covering the event by broadcasting from Waco, Texas, she was trying to muster a militia to stop what we all knew was going to happen. I saw her in a parking lot holding an AR-15 above her head, dressed in fatigues, trying to muster a militia. She got about 20 guys together, started marching down toward the, toward the, uh, the uh, place where this confrontation was taken. I get all emotional when I even think about this, so you'll have to forgive me. And uh, they were quickly surrounded and disarmed and hauled off. But she tried. 
She tried. Nobody else tried. Linda tried. And she's been uh, just raked over the coals ever since by everybody, except for me. I think Linda Thompson has more balls than most men in this country have ever had or ever will have. And she stood up for the nation when nobody else would. So I support her and always will. If it wasn't for her tape, Waco the Big Lie, there would never have been any congressional investigations and most of the country would still be saying, oh, they're a bunch of religious fanatics, they deserved exactly what they got. So in my estimation, anybody that talks bad about Linda Thompson is a very bad person. Linda Thompson was the militia. Who can call up the militia? Traditionally in this country, any responsible person could call forth the militia for any responsible reason. It's still that way today. Is the National Guard the militia? Well, now you're wrong. It is the militia of the United States. You see, the California National Guard cannot ever be the militia of California. Why? Because it violates all the rules. It can be federalized and therefore could never stand in defense of the state against a central government turned despotic or tyrannical. Therefore, the National Guard cannot be the militia. It also violates the other rules. Who trains the officers of the National Guard? The regular Army. The United States trains those officers. To be militia, the officers must be trained by the state, don't they? Okay, so the National Guard is not the militia of the states. It is the militia of the United States. That's true. There's also another militia of the United States. It's the unorganized militia of the United States of America. And who is that? It's everybody between the ages of 17 and 45 who are capable of serving in the capacity of a militiaman. The law specifically says men and boys. Who cannot be in the unorganized militia of the United States of America? The vice president. The vice president, the president, any elected officer cannot be a member. Or the naval militia. National Guard cannot be a member. Any member of the military forces of the United States of America cannot be a member of the militia. Why? because they're under control of the very people who could subvert the government and become a tyrant to the people, aren't they? And the purpose of the militia is to prevent that. The militia has three functions. What are they? Who can name them off? There's only three. Nobody. Repel invasion, suppress insurrection, and enforce the laws of the Union. Actually, it says execute the laws of the Union. Repel invasion, suppress insurrection, and execute the laws of the Union. Why does it say execute the laws of the Union instead of obey the President? If the President tears up the Constitution and becomes a tyrant, it's up to the militia to enforce the laws of the Union and arrest the President, isn't it? That's the function of the militia. The same in the state. Any state, the function of the militia is to repel invasion, suppress insurrection, execute the laws of the state, and any other constitutional lawful purpose to which the governor may call them up to perform. <coughs> what is a lawful militia? 
Can you put together a bunch of guys and say we're the militia? Can you? The white shirt? Yeah. That's right. But, do you have to say they're the militia? They're already the militia. You are the militia. You don't even have to get together. You're the militia. You can get together with anybody else in here who is the militia, or who wants to volunteer to be a member of the militia, and you can form a unit of the unorganized militia of the state of California, or if the Constitution of the state of California specifies it, the constitutional militia of the state of California, like they do in Texas, the constitutional militia of Texas, okay? And you can get together and you can have meetings and you can train and you can prepare to function as militiamen. Is this lawful? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's nobody who can do anything to stop you. Period. Can you appoint yourself colonel and become commander of the militia? Why not? In the absence of appointment of rank by the governor of your state, officers must be elected by the militia. So you elect your officers. You cannot appoint yourself, and nobody can appoint you. The militia elects the officers, and they're elected to serve in those capacities for certain periods of time. Now, if in your capacity, as elected officer in the militia, whatever your rank may be, during a lawful organized training exercise, you give an order which somebody disobeys, can they be punished? Not only can be, must be. Must be. If you don't, what do you have? You have anarchy, you don't have a militia. And the first time you go into battle, you're going to have people doing what they want to do instead of what they have to do to win that battle. Don't you? So it's not can, but must be. Must be in every instance. When they elect you to be an officer, and your order was lawful and right under the circumstances, they must obey that order. If they don't, you must have some system set up to punish that member or expel that member from the militia body. What body of rules governors, governs the militia? Uniform Code of Military Justice. And every lawfully formed militia must have a copy of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And everybody must understand how it operates and what they're subject to. Must militia members be under oath? Must they be under oath? Absolutely. If they cannot take an oath of loyalty to the Constitution of the United States of America and of their state, how can you trust them? How can you trust them? The answer is you cannot. Can you substitute an affirmation for an oath? No. Yes, you can. An affirmation is as legally binding as an oath. It's the truth. If somebody says, I can't take an oath on religious grounds, can you accept them? Huh? You can take them if they agree to take an affirmation. If they refuse to take the affirmation on religious grounds, can you accept them? No! The militia is not a religious organization. It's a military organization. And you must be able to trust the members of the militia. And if they cannot be under oath or affirmation, you cannot trust them. You cannot accept them. You cannot have them in your organization. Period. Cut and dried, no. Cannot.
Can you accept a convicted felon in a militia organization? No, why not? Bad character? What if he paid for his crime and he's never done anything bad again? He can't own a weapon. Now there's two things, there's two reasons why you can't do this. Number one, he cannot own or be in possession of a weapon. So you're jeopardizing this person's life if you let them come around weapons and they're seen or a photograph is taken with them just touching a weapon, they could go back to prison and you don't want that to happen to them. Okay? Aside from the fact that they can't own a weapon, can't use a weapon, touch a weapon, or hold a weapon, which means they have to function in some administrative capacity, there is a liability propaganda-wise. If the press finds out you have convicted felons in your militia, what are they going to do to you? They're going to rake you over the coals and you don't need that. So what you do is you put these people in reserve. And you say, you are not an active part of this militia. You are, by law of the land, a member of the militia, though you can't take part in our unit. If war breaks out, you come running and we'll give you a gun, because then it won't matter whether you have a gun or not. Right? That's how you treat those people. Don't make them feel bad because they committed a crime or did something wrong in their life. And, and paid the price for it because I can assure you everybody in this room has done something wrong at some point in their life most of us have determined we're not going to do it again they got caught we didn't now if you're an exception to that rule you are really an exception I gotta tell you because everybody is human and everybody sometime during their life does something wrong. Usually when you're younger and crazier and wilder and stupider. And if you're lucky, you get away with it. Some people aren't so lucky. So let's not be hard on those people. And some of them are really good people and really have turned their lives around. They really do want to participate and help. And it hurts to say no to them, but you have to. What kind of exercises can you do with a militia? No. You can have any kind of militia you want to. As long as you state it that you are that type of militia and that you have certain goals and purposes in your training exercises. You can have a militia of artillery. Did you know that? You can have a militia of armor. You can have a transportation company or battalion. You can be a militia company or battalion or even regiment. You can be an air force. Second Continental Army of the Republic has an air force. Didn't know that, did you? We also have jet fighters. Didn't know that either, did you? But I won't tell you where. <laughs> or who flies them. I will tell you that we have them. How about an A-10? No, we don't have an A-10. <laughs> We do have a few MIGs. <laughs> we don't have any of those. No, no. You can have any kind of militia that you want, as long as it is for a legitimate military purpose, and that it's spelled. You can't change yourself from infantry to armor to artillery every three weeks. You have to establish the unit as a specific type of unit and equip and train for that mission. You have to do that. Now I see a lot of people shaking their heads when I say you can be an artillery unit. It happens to be the truth. 
The Supreme Court has ruled on it. Anybody know the case? The case was where a guy was arrested for having a shotgun parading around in public with it, and he took it all the way to the Supreme Court, saying that he, he was uh, legally authorized to own that gun and, and that they couldn't take it away from him because he was in the militia. And the Supreme Court ruled that the shotgun was not a weapon of the militia and that he was authorized to have, possess, use, and train with any weapon that is a proper weapon for a militia, including artillery for an artillery unit, armor for an armor unit, rifles for an infantry unit, etc. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> you got to read the law, folks. You got to study the law. The militia is iron bound in this country. Do you really believe in your wildest dreams there would be any militia in this country if it was illegal? They would have come after us a long, long time ago, not just vilify us in the press. That's to try to discredit us in the eyes of the sheeple for the day when the fighting starts so that we won't have any popular support. That's really what that's all about. You see, because if the militia was unlawful, unconstitutional, and we were doing something wrong, they would have come after us a long time ago. And you're right. The war would have started then. So you see, there is a legal militia. There's a lawful militia. There's a constitutional militia. Most of the militias that you see in the public eye are not legitimate, lawful militias. Is a militia that says only Christians can belong to this militia and we're going to call ourselves the 4th uh, Missouri Volunteer Christian Militia. Is that a militia? No, it's a religious army made up of religious members of some particular sect of Christianity as a whole. And if you don't believe in what they believe in, you're liable to end up fighting them. Okay? A militia is a military organization, not a religious organization. And don't ever get the two confused. You can't go to a militia meeting and turn it into a prayer meeting. And you can't go to a prayer meeting and after you get through with the sermon, have a militia meeting. Cannot do it. You can go to a militia meeting and you can have a chaplain and you can ask the chaplain to say a prayer and that's okay. But if you have one Jewish guy that doesn't like that and he wants to say a Jewish prayer, you better let him. You better let him or you're not a militia. Understand that. Militia is to protect our freedom so that we can worship at the altar of our choice. It is not to dictate to us which religion or altar we're to worship at or to say who can be a member of the militia based upon what their religious preference is. And anytime we get away from that, we are destroying freedom for all of us. Understand this and understand it clearly. If I take away your freedom, I have taken away the freedom of everyone in this room. Everyone. And everyone who allows me to do it is complicit in that treason. Take away the rights of one, you have taken away the rights of all. The instant that it's done, and anyone who condones it or allows it is complicit in the treason, and it is treason in this country. Now we must have militias. If you don't belong to a militia, you need to join one. If you don't know where a militia is that you can join, form one. Advertise. You cannot do it in secret. You must do it in public. You do not have to have all of your activities publicly known. But you must be public. You must never talk to the press under any circumstances whatsoever, period, except 
when authorized by the commanding officer to issue a statement that has been pre-prepared to be delivered by the officer who has been appointed to be the public affairs officer and he is to make no statement, answer no questions, only read what he has been given to read and then shut his stupid mouth. Now you've seen a lot of people across this country pretend to be militia. I've only seen one that was legitimate and that was Norman Olson. He was the legitimate commander of the Michigan of the uh, militia of Michigan. He was not a good choice even though he meant well. He was a preacher of a church who got religion and militia and all kinds of things confused. He didn't understand the law. Whenever he confronted the press, he said all the wrong things instead of what he should have said. And so he caused the militia of Montana a lot of embarrassment and, by association, all of the militias in the country. But Norm Olson is a good man, and he meant well, and he should not be castigated or thrown out or, or vilified or anything. He was trying to do his best. The militia of Montana is a joke. Always has been. The militia of Montana has never been anyone other than John Trockman and about four or five other people in a little room full of all the stuff that they sell. Period. That's it. When they went to Congress, they made a joke out of the militia. Instead of addressing the issues that they should have addressed and talking about the things they should have talked about and quoting the law to legitimize to the nation and to Congress the militia. What did they talk about? The government's manipulating the weather. We're all going to drown in a rainstorm. Hurricanes and... What did they look like? I'm in the militia and they look like madmen to me. And I know that some of that is true. But I also know that you cannot get up there and start spouting off that kind of stuff in that kind of situation. You cannot allow them to make a joke out of you by consenting to be on the Donovan Show, the great communist with the microphone who can make you look like an idiot. These are fools. You don't do that. You don't do that. You must maintain your dignity and your respect and whatever you say to the press and to the nation must be words that will be taken seriously and respected and will build the respect and the dignity of the militia. Must. See, they're just waiting for the fools to come along to make jokes out of them. The only other legitimate person who ever spoke for the militia during any of this time on any public media was Linda Thompson, who is, by the way, the Judge Advocate General for the unorganized militia of the United States of America, not self-appointed. And when she spoke, she said the right things then they would try to make her look like an idiot and, and sometimes they succeeded. Can you say anything to the press that's going to be put on camera or put on tape or film and expect to be treated fairly? No. What are they going to do with it? They're going to edit it, they're going to take one or two words out of context, they're going to make you look like a raving, blithering idiot. And you don't have to be in the militia for them to do that to you. They'll do that to you anyway. So what's the rule? Don't talk to the press. Don't let them put you on camera. And I'll go one step further. If they insist upon sticking that camera in your face, you stick your fist through their lens. You might get a few cuts, but by God, that delivers a pretty powerful message. Get out of my face. No, I'm not going to talk to you. Get your camera out of here. And they are the biggest liars, biggest lawbreakers you ever saw. They'll barge right in your front door. 
unlawfully. They don't have any right to barge in your house, do they? No. They'll do it. Right after the bombing in Oklahoma City, I must have been called by well over 500 different reporters, TV stations, communist news networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, Donovan, everybody in the world called me. And I had three words for all of them. Go, <laughs> Go blank yourself. That's what I told them. <laughs> Every one of them. Now, do you think any single one of them quoted me? <laughs> Not one of them quoted me or even mentioned my name. But they all wanted to talk to me because they know that I'm the director of intelligence for the largest militia in the country. And they know that I speak for an awful lot of people. So they were just itching to get me on tape so they could destroy me. So the lesson from that is when you do talk to the press, tell them something they will not quote. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you would have to ask an easy question. I first learned about Mark Kornke in 1989, the end of 1989, first couple of months of 1990, when he called my friend Stan Barrington, who was then working with me and helping me, and told Stan Barrington that he was an active duty officer of the Air Force Office of Special Investigation and he had material that he wanted to give us to leak to the American public. I was in the Office of Naval Intelligence. I know there's no leaks. So right away I told Stan, I said, don't take anything from this guy because this is BS. And ask him to furnish us with proof of his identity. Substantiate himself. So we gave him that message, or Stan gave him that message, and he sent us Waco, or not Waco, but America Under Siege or something, some videotape. This was a long time ago. And he promised us that he would send documentation that he was who he said he was. Well, he never did. He contacted us again, we repeated our demand, and he never sent us anything. Next thing I know, a couple of years have passed, and I see him on a videotape, and he's saying that he was a member of the Army Intelligence Corps, and uh, that he, he was telling all these things on this videotape. Some of it was true, some of it was not true. You have to understand, folks, you cannot function as a provocateur or a disinformation agent without throwing some honey for the flies together. They have to speak some truth. They can't just put out all lies. So part of what Mike Kornke, or Mark Kornke says is true. Most of what he's ever said has been a lie. And if you go through his videotapes and his speeches and you check it all out, you'll find that out. I don't have to tell you that. And it, and it really bothers me when you ask me these kinds of questions because all you have to do is research what they say and you'll find out that it, most of it's not true. You don't have to ask me those things. And that's what I try to instill in you. If you do this religiously, investigate what people say, you will soon find out what is truth and what is not true and who's speaking it and who's not. Overnight, listen to me, because this is true and a lot of you are falling into this stuff. Over 95% of every piece of information that's passed through the community patriot, community uh, nationwide, is fake, false, lies, rumor, frauds, forgeries. It's the truth. 
But you see, you get this stuff, whether it comes over by fax, or you hear it on the radio, and you just pass it along, not realizing you're hurting all of us when you do that. You can't pass on anything without investigating it. You cannot do that. If you're passing on false, phony, fraudulent, forgery, fake lies, what are you doing? You're helping our enemies, aren't you? Do you know that most people have left the patriot community and stopped being patriots because of the bullshit that has gone through their hands that they have ultimately found out to be fake? Somebody came up a while ago and asked me about the Tommy Buckley Treasury Gate thing. I said on the radio, it was a fraud to begin with and it's a fraud now. And most of these people who call themselves patriots bought right into it, hanging on every word. Do you really believe in your wildest dreams that somebody came over from Indonesia and just bumped into Tommy Buckley on the street and gave him a bank certificate worth trillions of dollars? Are you nuts? And he's going to cash this thing and uh, in the meantime he's collecting all his support money and selling all this information and everything. Come on, people, wake up. It doesn't even pass the common sense test. My grandmother would have grabbed him by the ear and kicked him out of the house the minute he opened his mouth. How can people buy into this stuff? How? How can you fall for it? I don't understand it. And there's thousands of other ones. When I say keep your eye on the sparrow, I mean it. Don't get off of these cul-de-sacs chasing will-o'-the-wisps and ghosts and phony gold certificates and thinking you're going to get rich. If you get rich, it'll be because you worked for it, you were doing the right thing, and God supported you. And that's the only way you're going to get rich. Not because some guy came from Indonesia bumped into some other dude on the street and said, oh, you look like a nice guy. I'm going to give you all these trillions of dollars. All you got to do is collect it. Yep, see you later. Send me a letter. Let me know what happens. Bullshit. I mean, how far gone can people be? It ain't so. Now let me say this, that 95% of everything that passes through your hands if you're in the patriot community is bullshit, false, fake, phony, fraud, forgery, lies. If you want to take me to task on that, you pile up everything you collect for the next five months and bring them to Arizona and we'll sit there and we'll go through it and investigate every single piece of paper you've got. And if I'm not right, I'll eat the whole stack right in front of you. Because I've already done this many times. Yes, baby. <laughs> Give her some water, Annie. <laughs> so please, don't do that. I promised you I'd show you the Zapruder film. How many of you have never seen the real Zapruder film in fantastic color? from a first generation copy. Okay, you're going to see it now. Bill, yes, sir. There was an article in Rakersville, California, and that's an archive now. He took it over, it's so deteriorated it can't be shown again, and uh, taxpayers have to buy that if they own They don't know what the value it is from this guy. <laughs> well, years ago, when I got tired of wondering what was really on it, because I saw so many copies that were doctored and tampered with and and were in black and white instead of color and I knew the thing was originally taken in color I started putting out feelers I wormed my way into the corporation that had the co the original copy of the Zepruder film and it cost me sixteen thousand dollars but I got a first generation 35 millimeter color copy directly off the original so I've said anything is kind of coincidence, you know. It was in the paper yesterday, yesterday in Bakersfield, California, and I'm, I'm going to get to see it now. That's, that's kind of a yep, you're going to get to see it right now. Bill, 
Yes. I don't blame him. I can't remember exactly what it was about, but I heard you today bring up the issue with Cohen. You attended a meeting much like this right out the vet hall to go there. And I'm really upset, but not because I think I want to trust Bo, but because it appears that there's a conflict there, and I don't understand why it's there, and I'd like to know. Well, then let me ask you something. If I went and spoke to Mormons and told them that I was a Mormon, went and spoke to Christians and told them I was a Christian, went and spoke to atheists and told them that I had tried all the religions, couldn't find one that I belonged to, you think there's anything wrong with that? Is that in a nutshell? No, there's a lot more than that, but that's enough. Just that alone is enough. If it's not enough for you, I don't know what to say, but it's more than enough for me. But there's much, much more than that involved. investigate. One place to start is get all of his tapes and start listening to them and remembering what he says and find out how he changes his story from day to day. It's a lot more than that. When, the, uh, when, they, when they gassed the Branch Davidians, Bo Greitz went on radio and he said, what they did is against the law. It's against the laws of war. We weren't allowed to use CS gas in Vietnam. It's a lie. I had CS gas on my boat, was issued to me, used it to break off engagements. And then, go get his book, Call to Serve. In his book, he tells a story about how he used CS gas in Vietnam, but yet he lied on the radio to the American people. Is that enough? I mean, I could go on for hours. Now, you heard him say that on the radio, didn't you? Go read his book. He also said a lot of things. He accused me in his book of stealing the Zapruder tape from a guy named Lars Hansen. He accused me of doing that and making a profit on the Zapruder tape. I have the radio broadcast where me and Bo Greitz were both on the same radio show with Billy Goodman and I have played this on my radio broadcast in his own voice a caller asks, well, Mr. Cooper, if you have the Zapruder film, why won't you make it available to the public? And you know what I said right on the radio show, and it's right there on the tape. Because of copyright restrictions, I don't want to infringe on anybody's copyright, and I don't know who this belongs to. Wright says, well, if Mr. Cooper doesn't want to make it available, I'll make it available. Just write to me and send me $10, and I'll send you a copy of the Zapruder tape. And he started sending them on everybody all over the world for 10 bucks a piece. That's the truth. And if you want a copy of the tape of that broadcast, I'll be happy to send you a copy. The truth is, Greitz is one of the most chronic liars I've ever run into in my life, and anybody that lies cannot be trusted. He has an agenda that is not good for us. And there's many, many, many more incidents. But, you know, just the fact that he changes his religion depending on who's talking to is enough for me. I gave you two more after that. Do you need a hundred more? <laughs> if you do, I can give them to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. Tex Mars was a big supporter and fan of Bogreitz until he found out Bogreitz was lying. And, and he printed his, in, in his newsletter. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make me feel the good to get up here and talk like that about somebody. It doesn't. Believe me. And I'm going to tell you something else. I was one of the biggest fans and supporters of Bogreitz that he ever had in his life until I found out he was lying. Pardon? No, this, got other stuff to do. Got other fish to fry here. You're welcome. Let, let me tell you something. What most people get caught up in with Bo Greitz is the uniform. You see, take your eyes off the uniform. Look at the person and listen to what the person says. There's a human being in there. It's not the uniform. 
If he said that he resigned his commission, which he has said, why is he wearing the uniform? If he resigned his commission, how come he's got an officer's rank on his shoulders? What's going on here? Okay, uh, Doyle, could you come up here and give me a hand, please? I need you all to get in a position where you can see this screen really well. And I don't know where that's going to be for you, so you have to determine that for yourself. Yeah, we are. That's what Doyle's coming up for. If you can help me move this table back there, I guess. And I don't know how to operate that thing, so I'm going to have to ask you to do that. And I will step down here and use my trusty little laser. How many seconds is this going to last? How many seconds? It's just a few seconds, that's right, but you're going to see it over and over again. I'm going to let you see this over and over and over again. Now we need to kill the lights up here so you can see the screen really good. And I don't know how you do that. There you go, that's good. Okay. Pardon? You want me to go forward or just let it go on the phone? Just let it go. I don't remember how long this test pattern's on here. But don't take your eyes off the screen because it starts, like, quick. And it's only a few seconds long. The first is going to be at the, uh, the normal speed, which you've never seen it at. For years, every time you've seen it on television or anywhere else, you've seen only portions of it, and you've seen it at a much greater speed than what, it, what really happened. So here, what you're going to see is the actual real speed of the motorcade. This is the best that it ever gets, folks. There are no frames missing, nothing. Now if you miss something, don't worry about it because you're going to see it over again. No, she didn't get anything. There was nothing on the, tr on the trunk of that car. She was trying to get out of there, is what she was trying to do. Okay, you're going to see it again. This time we slow it down. Now what you're going to notice is these motorcycles come ahead of the motorcade, and then they come down here and stop. Now this is really weird, because that's not supposed to happen. This was made on Kodachrome film with an 8 millimeter camera, handheld by Abraham Zapruder. And the frames on those kinds of cameras, the shutter speed was about 1 30th of a second. So almost every frame is blurred. You're seeing every single frame is here. Nothing is missing. It's all here. Right about in here is where Kennedy was shot in the throat. See that umbrella? That's the umbrella man, lower left corner. You see that he's holding his throat? Jacqueline really doesn't know what's the matter. She knows something wrong, but she doesn't know he's been shot yet. No. Okay, there was no bullet that hit Kennedy that hit Connolly too. There's too much. Yeah. Now, if you'll notice here, look at this. Somebody has scraped the emulsion off the film on Kennedy's head so you cannot see the true nature of the wound. Jacqueline goes to get out of that car. There's nothing on the deck that isn't supposed to be there. There are radio antennas, there are handholds for the Secret Service, but there's nothing else. We've blown it up and examined it. 
centimeter by centimeter. There's nothing. And she doesn't pick up anything. Notice that car blocking the underpass? It doesn't move until Kennedy's limousine almost runs into the back of it. That car belonged to the chief of police of Dallas Police Department. Is that where Dan Rather was going to take a Dan Rather? Dan Rather was, uh, I forget where Dan Rather was, but he was there. Yeah, he was by the overpass. Pardon? He was on the goal. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yes. <laughs> this is even slower, so you can see it. What you're seeing is frame by frame. Now I'm going to point out to you how this film's been altered. Either to make us believe that the bullet that killed Kennedy was fired from the front seat of the car, or to hide the fact that it was fired from the front seat of the car. We don't know which. But I will tell you this, while I was attached to the Office of Naval Intelligence on Admiral Clary's briefing team, I saw top secret documents that said that President Kennedy was shot in the head. The head shot was administered by the driver of the limousine, whose name is William Greer. No, William Greer's dead. He's dead now, yes. Died of, supposedly died of cancer. Now you can see some black stuff go across this sign. It's where Abraham Zapruder stopped the film and then started it again. And during the processing, uh, some of the uh, chemicals used to process the film were not washed off the film properly. It's not, a, it's not something someone did to the film. You've probably seen the same thing on some of your home movies and 35 millimeter film that you get back from the lab. You'll see the famous umbrella in the lower left of the uh, picture as the right edge of the sign comes. That's what I was talking about there. And there's another one too. Those are processing glitches. This film was processed really quick after the assassination by a local lab in Dallas. given to Abraham Zapruder and then later was confiscated by the uh, government who took it to the National Photographic Lab in Washington DC and that's where I believe all the alterations to the film were made. Nobody gives up stuff like this willingly to anybody. <laughs> this is history, this is valuable. Nobody gives this kind of stuff up willingly. There's the umbrella right there. See it? Now, you can see Kennedy holding his neck. You can see Agent Kellerman, who is the passenger, watching Kennedy in the rearview mirror. See him? He's looking in the rearview mirror. The driver actually slows the car down almost to a complete stop against the normal training for Secret Service agents who are supposed to immediately, once an ambush occurs on the president or any senior government official, is supposed to speed up and get the car out of what's called the kill zone and protect the lives of the occupants of the car who are supposed to get down on the floor and stay there. Now watch up here.
Now, when you blow this up and look at it closely, you'll see that the emulsion has been scraped off the film all up here in the front of this car. And it's, there you can see where a bullet hit the window. Or at least they want us to believe that the bullet hit the window, one of the, one of the two. The film has had extensive work done to it that you could never see before we actually got a copy and could blow up. You can't digitize something like this and look at it. You have to have film. So that's why we got a 35 millimeter uh, uh, positive made directly off the 8 millimeter original. So what we have is, is as good as you can get. You can't get better than this from any source. I don't know, because there's, there's some real bad stuff going on here. The wound to his throat wasn't very deep. It didn't go in very far at all. You could probably stick, you know, two knuckles of this finger, and that was the extent of the throat wound. Didn't even go into his, his trachea or, or his esophagus. And the wound in the back was below the, the uh, scapular or the shoulder bones, and you couldn't even stick one knuckle in there. It was only a half an inch deep. So what kind of a shot makes wounds like this? And there were no bullets taken out of either, two, either of these two wounds. So the, the theory that the, the, the bullet hole in his back the bullet entered his back, went up, and, and did a Z thing, and then came out his throat and, and went and, and hit Connolly and, and uh, went through his wrist and his leg and then, you know, all over the place. It's total baloney. The wound in Kennedy's back was only a half an inch deep. The wound in his throat was only about maybe an inch and a half deep. It did not go anywhere. No, he could have, the first two would not have killed him, no. They were not even life-threatening. Painful, maybe, yes. It was the head wound that killed Kennedy. And whatever hit him in the head literally blew his head into pieces. I think Jacqueline seen the driver do it, and that's why she was trying to get out of the back of the car. I think she believed her husband was shot by somebody in that car. And, and to tell you the truth, I believe that also. I believe that he was shot in the head by someone in that car and that she was trying to get out of that car. And they never established that they were going to get out of that car. No. And why? Pardon? Colony. Governor, Governor Connolly and his wife. Connolly has also made some very cryptic statements. He said that when he fell back, when he was wounded and he fell back on top of his wife, he saw and felt the shot that hit Kennedy in the head. Now, how can you see and feel that shot unless it's right over your face? I don't. I don't believe that. I don't believe that rumor because I've investigated all of this for many years, and I've never even heard anything like that. And you have to understand the loyalty of the people in these great families. They don't do that. They don't do that. They just don't do it. It would be uh, suicide <laughs> to do it. Cut yourself off and your children off. Pardon? Nobody really knows. The question is, why was he killed? Nobody really knows why he was killed. There's a lot of conjecture that he signed a bill authorizing the printing of United States notes backed by silver and all kinds of stuff. Nobody knows why he was killed. Nobody knows. Some people are saying he was killed because he was going to bring the troops out of Vietnam. Other people say he was killed because he was uh, bucking the New World Order. The truth is, nobody really knows, and anything is just conjecture. Anything that I might offer to you, or that you might think, is just conjecture. But no one knows. No one 
Well, once they killed John F. Kennedy, they pretty much had to kill his brother if they thought he was going to be elected president. Because what would be the first thing that he would do once he was elected president? He would open up the investigation and find out who really shot his brother. So they pretty much had to kill him. They couldn't allow a, his brother to become president. Sirhan Sirhan was just a patsy. We, we know who shot Robert Kennedy. It was the security guard named Caesar who shot him at point blank, put the gun right next to his head, right behind his ear, and shot him. That's who killed Robert Kennedy. We know that. Everybody knows who killed Robert Kennedy. Sirhan Sirhan is a scapegoat. And the security guard just disappeared. Sirhan Sirhan never got close to Robert Kennedy, but the death wound was right here. Barrel on the skin. In this film here, Bill, it makes sense that she had John F. Kennedy's head in her hands. And when that blast and the bullet went past, she was literally holding him when his head exploded. Yeah. And that's why she's... Yeah, see this stuff back here? These are antennas. Those are antennas. These are handholds for the Secret Service. There is nothing on the deck of that, of, of that uh, limousine at all. Nothing whatsoever for her to grab. There is blood. There's blood all over everything. You can't blow somebody's head off without getting blood all over everything. Now the guy that jumps up and gets her to go back in there is uh, Hill, who was her secret service. You see this tail light here? This has been opaqued. That's a photographic technique for blocking the transmission of light through the emulsion. That brake light was really on. There's just opaquing over it. That's, where, that's one of the places where the film's been tampered with. There are several places. One is the right rear brake light has been opaqued. You can see the other one is on. The wounds on Kennedy's head after he shot, the emulsion was scraped off the film, and there's emulsion scraped off the film all over the front of the front seat of the car where these two guys, Agent Kellerman and Greer, are doing things. The emulsion's just been scraped off. This is the... Uh, was Kellerman also good? Uh... I don't remember if he, if he is or not. Doyle? Where's Doyle? Yo, Doyle. Can we fast forward this to Dealey Plaza? I want to show them what's in Dealey Plaza. Is there some significance to that umbrella that you kept in We believe there is, but we don't really know and nobody can prove it. You see, as soon as Kennedy was shot in the throat, the umbrella opened. Now, if you have any experience with intelligence operations, that's a signal. That's saying, hey, he was hit. It's a signal. It's not odd at all if you understand these things. In the crowd, if you're going to have a signal, you've got to have a signal that will not be missed, which means it has to be an unusual thing that, that happens. And big enough for everybody taking part to see. You see, if you're going to try to assassinate a president, once you hit him, you can't stop there. So that's the signal that it's got to continue. We've got to kill this guy. He's been hit. We can't let him live because he'll track us down for the rest of his life. You know? So that's what we believe that it was. Now, don't go out of here and tell people that I said that's what it is. That's what we believe that it is. It fits. We don't really know. A guy came into Congress during the hearings and said that he was the guy with the umbrella and he was just opening the umbrella to protect himself from the sun. The guy that went to Congress is not the guy that was standing there with the umbrella. The guy that was standing there with the umbrella is Gordon Novell. I know Gordon Novell. Gordon Novell is also one of the guys that was caught, who broke in to an office in New Orleans connected with the Kennedy assassination was stealing information and, and you know and if you read uh, Garrison's 
material. You'll know that Mark Lane, how many of you have heard of Mark Lane? <laughs> Mark Lane's been connected with the CIA all his life. Mark Lane was the, remember Jonestown? Who was the minister? Jim Jones. Guess who was his lawyer? Mark Lane. Jonestown thing was a CIA mind control experiment. The congressman got onto it. He went down there to investigate it. They murdered him. See, Bo Bright said that too. It was a mind control. It was. Remember I told you about flies and honey. Yeah. Also, uh, well, is is that the beginning of the? Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. This is Dealey Plaza. This is a plaque dedicated to a man named Dealey, who was a 33rd degree Freemason of the southern jurisdiction of Scottish Rite. Dealey Plaza is built upon the site of the first fraternal lodge in the state of Texas. Remember, they always do things according to symbology and ritual. That's old Mr. Dealey. This is the intersection of Main Street and Houston. Those cars are coming or going up and down Main Street. The cross street is Houston. Now the quickest and most economical way for Kennedy to get to his next speaking engagement would have been to go straight down Main Street. He didn't. Came to this corner, made a right turn. Went to the next corner, made a left turn on Elm Street. What's significant about Elm Street? It's close to the 33rd parallel, which is one of the rituals in the, in, the, in, in the history of these people. Guess what that is? That's the parking garage where Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. It all took place in Dealey Plaza. This is, these are, this is what they never tell you. It all took place in Dealey Plaza. There's the obelisk. Screw you. There it is. Big as life, just like I've always been telling you. And what's on top of that obelisk? The signature of the philosophers of fire, the eternal flame. How about that? If you count the blocks in the obelisk, there's 14. What's the significance of 14? It's the number of pieces into which Osiris's body was chopped and scattered about the, the country before Isis went and tracked it down and through this mystical intercourse became pregnant with the child Horus. A lot of you are scratching your heads and looking up at the ceiling. What the hell is he talking about now? It's all significant, folks. Osiris represents the sun. <coughs> the sun is the manifestation of the power of God. What is God in the mysteries? The intellect, right? Fire is the symbol of the intellect. These are known as the philosophers of fire. Osiris is the representation of the doctrine. Isis, see, first fraternal lodge. Isis is the representation of the church. Isis is the feminine. Osiris is the masculine, the sun being the masculine, the moon being the feminine, reflecting the pure light of her master. Doesn't the church reflect the doctrine? And through this mystical union of the church and the doctrine is produced the child Horus, which is the full body of initiates of the secret fraternity of Illuminati. 
secret order. Pardon? My brother-in-law is big enough to Freemason me. Like no, he wouldn't like it because I'd be exposing what he's involved in. No. No, the, the highest degree in the Scottish Rite is the 32nd degree. The 33rd degree is a meritorious or honorary degree bestowed upon certain individuals. Okay? And uh, once you're a 33rd degree Freemason, then you can go into the uh, the rites of, of Mizraim, which is another 63 degrees. Then after you reach that, then you can go to the OTO, which is the Ordo Templi Orientalis. Is it possible for you to be a 32nd degree Mason and not know how... No. Nope. They're told at the 30th degree. When they reach the 30th degree, they're told. They know. If they tell you they don't know, they're lying to you. And they have to lie because they've taken oaths to keep it a secret. They can't tell you the truth, even if it's your father. They've sworn. They can't tell you the truth. Ever. Pardon? It's 96th degree is the highest that the rites of, of Mithra go. And then from there you go to the OTO for another nine degrees. That's the highest. The reason I asked the right listening to the Archbell show, somebody came on and asked me, did you say it's easy to get 99? Well, then that means he's gone beyond 96, which would put him into OTO. He's really confusing information and disinformation. Art Bell, are, are you kidding? Do you listen to the Art Bell show and you're asking me if he's putting out disinformation? <laughs> You guys mind if I say a little prayer? <laughs> Please, Lord. Pardon? Shriners, you have to have attained the highest uh, degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry or the York Rite, which in the York Rite I think is the 13th degree, and in the Scottish Rite is the 32nd degree. At the highest levels, yeah. I believe. I'd have to check to make sure. I, I don't remember the exact number of degrees in the York Rite, but it's much less than the Scottish Rite. <coughs> yeah. Earl Warren's a 33rd degree Freemason. Gerald Ford's 33rd degree Freemason. But Earl Warren, you know, during the Warren Commission, he came from Bakersfield. His father was murdered. And the chief of police of Bakersfield, that was his only suspect, was his own son. Who's that Chief Grayson? Chief Grayson. What are we seeing? This is the corner of uh, Maine and Houston. I've got to concentrate on this, folks, because there's things you've got to, to know about. So save your questions for later. This is the corner of Maine and Houston. This is the old courthouse over here. It's very old. But you're going to see some revealing things here in a minute. See, that's Houston Street. Here we go. Throughout history, these, these orders have been known as the, the Brotherhood of the Snake, the Brotherhood of the Dragon. There's the dragon. It's not a griffin, that's a dragon. That is the symbol, and you'll see this in ancient books and writings. This is the symbol of the Brotherhood of the Dragon. That's Scott Becker. He ran the Becker Satellite Network. We went to Dallas together to do this. God, I don't remember. Long time. 1992, I believe it was. Scott's a character. I really liked him a lot. But he, when it came to do business, he <laughs> wasn't too hot. Okay. 
These are the sheeple who walk through Dealey Plaza every day and don't see a bleeding thing. Don't see any, look at this. There's Osiris, the doctrine. There's Isis, the church, reflecting the pure light of her master. This reflection points directly to the sixth floor window. Also, it's on the sixth floor. Did you notice in the building the sixth floor window is the only square window in the building? Who is fond of claiming that when he raised his arm to the square? <clears throat> Isn't that what they put on Kennedy's grave? My, my. Insult, they're laughing at us. They laugh at us all the time. They rub it in our faces and laugh because we're so silly, so stupid. <clears throat> now what, is, what are these columns and pillars over here? And they're on the other side of the street Likewise, they're the quarters of the round stone temple of the sun, just like at Stonehenge. Dealey Plaza is a temple of the sun for the mystery religion of Babylon. Kennedy was killed on Elm Street. Elm Street is where traditionally they have posted the notice. It is also a grove. The sacrifice was always committed in a grove up on a stone altar when the sun had reached its zenith. When Kennedy was shot, it wasn't 12 noon, but on that latitude, the sun was directly overhead. Don't believe me? Look at all the shadows in the Zepp Ruder film. If you want to see a representation of what happened in Dealey Plaza, watch The Lion King. When the brother, Scar, takes the little cub, puts him on a rock, under an elm tree, in a valley, at high noon, and then the hyenas start the stampede of the animals toward him. He was to be sacrificed upon that rock, under the elm. Nightmare on Elm Street. They laugh at us all the time. It's hilarious. Now let me tell you something. They say that Kennedy was shot from the grassy knoll by a, an assassin with a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. How many of you are hunters? How many of you have used a rifle with a scope? How many? Okay. For Kennedy to have shot, for uh, anyone to have shot Kennedy with a rifle, with a scope on it, from the grassy knoll, simply impossible. Why? Does anybody know why? Too close to the target. The hell do you need a scope for? By the time you found his head in the scope, he would have been gone. Every rifleman knows that. <laughs> Scope is only for long distance shooting. From that grassy knoll, I stood there, and I'm going to tell you, from that grassy knoll to where Kennedy was shot in the head was about from here to the corner of that wall right there where the plant is. So, when they tell you that he was shot by a rifleman using a scope, on a rifle, I don't care if it's high powered or 22, it's no. No, no, no. No professional assassin would ever have chosen that place to shoot his target moving from left to right directly in front of him at that close of a range under any circumstances. Wouldn't do it. Just simply wouldn't do it. It's not done. Anybody who would do that is not a professional. 
would never have been hired or contracted to do the job. Period. The best place to shoot a moving target from is where? Directly ahead or directly behind or in the vehicle up close. Which is the sure thing? In the vehicle up close. Oop. Everybody close your ears. Scott is going to say an obscenity here. No, no. Shut up, Scott. <laughs> I forgot about that. I just remembered it. See, we found this place. It goes right down into the sewer. And there's another hole right down in there where you can go down and disappear forever. How long have been there? It's been there forever. And that's the view from the hole. It's not a good shot either, is it? And there were more trees and, and other things there on the day Kennedy was shot that are now gone. No, you couldn't get any lead. And when the car presented itself, it would have been like abrupt, sudden. It's not a good shot either. And this is, uh, goes right down in the sewer. Just lift up that plate and wiggle down through that hole and you're gone. Okay, uh, Doyle, can we take this one out and put the one in that has no sound? The, the, remember the one you had in first? Yeah, I'll stick that in. Yes? You're going to see, I'm going to show you. Yes. I have no idea. I don't think he was supposed to be shot. When he was, when he was uh, shot, you know what he said? He said, oh my God, they're going to kill us all. Which tells me he knew it was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. Well, no, I think that was Lyndon. <laughs> Lyndon didn't want to ride in the car. Lyndon wasn't too fond of Lyndon wasn't too fond of uh, JFK. Connolly didn't want to ride in the president's car if he was going to have a bad reception. But he actually had a good reception. Okay, yeah. Back that up. Okay, pay attention to this, folks, because you, you can see everything here. Here is Dealey Plaza. You can see it's laid out in the truncated pyramid of the Temple of Initiation of the Mysteries. The capstone is missing. There are actually three triangles here. One, uh, actually three uh, pyramids here. One big one, one and two small ones. There are three eyes over the pyramids uh, that are the underpasses under the railroad overpass. This is Main Street here. They took a right turn, went down here and turned left on Elm Street. It was shot in the throat here. Supposedly shot in the back here. Shot in the head and killed here. Three shots, three wounds. That's six. There's the sixth floor. All of this is in the, the tremendous symbology of the mysteries. Now, here's the kicker. Where was he hit? And it also explains why these two wounds were weird. In the Masonic initiation, Hiram Abiff is attacked and hit in the back or the chest, this torso area, the throat, and in the head. 
exact same wounds suffered by Kennedy. Where'd you get the footage of the overhead uh, helicopter shot? Pardon? Where'd you get the helicopter shot that they just showed? From a helicopter. <laughs> did you do that yourself? We did that. But uh, can we back that up, Doyle? Where'd you go? Don't go away. I need you. <laughs> I need you, Doyle. Isn't it nice to be needed? Yeah. I'm that color, man. Need to back that up to that, uh, what you call it? I want to point out to you what all's in there. You can see the, okay, look here. Over here, on, see this? This is part of the, t the Temple of the Sun. This is another part. Instead of all being together in one spot, they're separated. There's four of them. You put them together, it makes a stone temple just like Stonehenge. See up there? And anyway, that's what I want to show them. You can take that video out now and turn the lights back on. That's what I wanted you to see, that uh, Dealey Plaza is really an occult temple of the mystery religion of the so-called fraternal orders, which is really the ancient mystery religion of Babylon. And uh, Kennedy's assassination was a ritual assassination done in the temple when the sun was at its highest in the grove on a rock. He was the sacrificed king. And nobody really knows what the purpose of it was. <coughs> Excuse me. But the outcome was that it destroyed the political will of the nation. And it scared the hell out of everybody. If they can kill John F. Kennedy, they can kill anybody that goes against them. Isn't that a message? Who's safe from them? Oh, you're wrong. Anyone who is not afraid of them is safe from them. Not in that you're not going to be killed. You might be killed. But in that you are their most dangerous enemy. How many of you in here are Christians? If you are a Christian, what are you afraid of? I mean, serious. What, are you, what is there to be afraid of? If they kill you, what happens? Go to heaven and be with Jesus. So why are you afraid? So why aren't you doing what you know you should be doing all the time? Just getting in their face. Telling them you're not afraid of them. I don't care if you kill me. I believe in God. I'm doing the right thing. You can't judge me. God can. Death is not bad. It's a transition to a better world, actually. Now... If you tell me you're a Christian and you're still afraid, what are you telling me? You're not a Christian. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to me. I don't care if you lie to yourself, but don't ever lie to me. Lie to yourself all you want to. Don't lie to me. If you're a Christian, you cannot be afraid. There's nothing that they can do to you, period, that is bad. Nothing. Nothing! Nothing! That's why I'm the most dangerous radio host in America. That's why I'm the most dangerous thing that's ever come along to these people in their entire history because I am not afraid of them. I don't care if they kill me tomorrow. I'm going to do as much damage to them and expose them for what they are for as long as I'm living. And you know what else? And in doing that, it sort of protects me because if they come along and kill me tomorrow, what are you all going to believe? You were right. That you were right. You know, I had some doubts, but now I know he was right. <laughs> and so now they can't touch me. Now they can't touch me because of that. They've waited too long. They thought I was some silly little fool that would destroy myself somewhere along the way, and it hasn't happened. 
So now they back themselves into a corner. If they touch me now, in fact, I'll go one further. If I step out on my porch in the middle of winter and slip on the ice and my head cracks open as an accident, the whole world is going to know they killed me to shut me up. <laughs> and I was right all along. And that's why they come every window in winter and put salt on my steps. <laughs> yes, sir. That's great. That's great. And I would like you, I don't care. <laughs> you can't. You see, what is it when you're afraid of somebody? Let me, let me put it a different way that you will all understand. Let me bring it home to you. How many of you file and pay income tax? How many of you file that file and pay income tax know that you don't have to? Why do you file and pay income tax if you know you don't have to? No, it's because you're afraid. If you're afraid and you file and pay income tax and you know you don't have to, what are you doing? You're paying tribute to your master and you have admitted that you are the slave. And you are afraid, which means you're not a Christian. No matter who you tell you are, no matter what church you go to, no matter how you try to convince anybody, you know in your heart you're not. Because if you are, you cannot be afraid. And that's something you have to deal with for yourself. I'm not saying this to embarrass anybody or make anybody feel bad. I'm saying it because we have to learn to live with the truth. Whatever the truth is, no matter who it hurts or helps, even if it hurts me. See, I had to start with these same things too. And I had to do some real reckoning here with myself before I could get up here and try to reckon with you. I couldn't do it if I hadn't reckoned with myself first. And neither can you. You can't fight this battle if you're afraid of the enemy. He's already beaten you if you're afraid. You're whipped. You're finished. You can't fight the battle if you're afraid of the enemy. You can't do it. If they walked in here right now and put a gun to my head and said, we're going to shoot you, unless you say this, this, or this, I'll say shoot. Shoot. Go right ahead. Pull the trigger. And I'd look them right in the eye. And they can pull the trigger if they want to. And that's the truth. Because I'm not afraid. See, I believe in God. And I've learned in my life that if I'm doing the right thing, God's going to take care of me. And death is what? It's a transition. They can't kill me. All they can do is set me free from this body. That's all. And isn't that the ultimate freedom? Isn't it? And who loves freedom more than anybody in this room? Me. <laughs> so they can't hurt me. They can set me into another state of freedom. And if I've been doing God's work, God's going to smile at me and open the gates, and I'm going to get some rest. And it's going to feel good. You know? Whether there's really gates or that's just a metaphor for something we pass through, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I'm also an investigator. And that's going to be the ultimate research project. <laughs> and if I can, I'll come back and tell you what the results are. <laughs> Yes, sir. What is the status on the next issue of It's being worked on right now. The paper has been laid out, and we're putting stories into it. Uh, and as soon as that's done, it'll go to press and be on the way to you. We've had some tremendous setbacks. We lost our staff. Then we had tremendous compute, uh, computer failures. And uh, what else happened? The, the new editor that we got, just his wife just recently had a baby, and that stopped everything again. You know how that is. Do you have a time estimate? No. No. I, I don't have a time estimate. And we foresaw these kinds of things happening because there's nobody. 
You know who really runs this whole thing? Annie and I. That's it. <laughs> and we're doing a tremendous amount of work that everybody else says they can't do because they're just one small, lonely little person. So that's why we sold the paper by number of issues rather than per week or per month or per year or whatever. So that if we had these kind of things, we're not infringing upon breaking anybody's contract. We will deliver the number of issues that you have subscribed to. Maybe not as quickly as you would like it, but you will get them. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah, beginning, I think, uh, about the 7th of May, we'll be going to one hour a day for as long as we can. If that doesn't work out, we'll cut down to even less than that. Pardon? No. And to tell you the truth, I haven't really been looking very hard. Swiss America was a great sponsor. They paid for the, uh, the, the satellite time for my show only and for the shortwave airtime for my show only for four years. And uh, they're great people. Craig Smith is my good friend. But you have no conception of how much money that represents that he put into the backing of my show. I never took a penny from Craig. He never paid me anything. I never asked him for anything. In fact, the agreement was that if he ever paid me anything, the thing that it would be over because I don't want that. But he pay he put in to the to the payment of shortwave and satellite airtime probably three four hundred thousand dollars easily. And the amount of business that he got back, if you want to know the truth, probably cost him another three four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> because folks uh, I probably lost him more customers than he ever gained from my broadcast because of the controversial nature and because of the fact that I, I'm just not the most polite person in the world to the socialists who might have been doing business with him yes pardon No, I told him to take a flying, you know what. Oh, I sent in a, no, nothing. I sent in about uh, 500,000 Freedom of Information requests and got every piece of information that, uh, that you can possibly get from them about me and about them and how they operate and everything else. And I filed suit against them, which I'm winning. <laughs> and... Uh, they don't like me very much. Yeah. They've tried many ways to put me away forever. And it just doesn't work simply because, number one, I'm not afraid of them. Number two, I don't believe this thing that uh, the law is too hard for us to understand unless we're an attorney. And I go study the law. Whatever it is they're trying to pull on me, I go get in the law books and figure out what it's all about and I throw it back in their face. and. And they go limping away, usually, with their tail between their legs. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Your position is they don't have any jurisdiction? They don't have any jurisdiction. I'm not required by any law to file or pay income tax, and I just flat will not do it. Last time an FBI agent came to talk to me, he asked me about income tax, and I said, I don't file, and I don't pay, and you can go back and tell your lackeys that I'm never going to file, and I'm never going to pay. No, I don't need to do that. I know what the law says. And the law says I'm not required. They, don't care. Come get your they only don't care if you don't know the law. And if you don't know how to talk to them and can't represent yourself in court, then they don't care. You can win in court and they'll still come and tell your stuff. No, they won't. They won't tell my stuff. <laughs> and I'll tell you something else. I'll go even farther than that. The day that they ever try, I will defend myself, my property, and my family with a force of arms until I'm dead. And I don't care if they kill me. Let them explain that to the world. I don't think they want that to happen. They don't want to do that. 
It's hard to explain. Makes me right too, doesn't it? It's going to embarrass the hell out of them. And the whole world will see a man who's not afraid of them put his life on the line for himself, his property, and his family and stand up to him and die like a man on television. And the whole world will know that it was the right thing that I did. People know too much about me for the spin doctors to get a hold of it. That's why, you see, when the president names me in a White House memo as the most dangerous radio host in America, and Dan Rather's talking about the militia of Montana, what does that tell you about me? That I've got some power. They're afraid to even mention my name on the 6 o'clock news. I've got some power. And I know how to wield that power. I know who I am. I know how much power I have. And it's the power of information and knowledge. And they know that I'm not afraid and I will go to the wall to defend my rights. And they know that that's what every American is supposed to do. And they don't want anybody to see that. So, there you have it, in a nutshell. Really, that's what it's all about. If you're not afraid, and you have information and knowledge, you are powerful. I'm not unique, I just worked hard for this. I love my children. Believe it or not, I love your children. I love all children. I don't love all adults. But I love all children. The future belongs to them. I'm going to do my best to make sure they have the best possible future they can possibly have. And if it's not good, nobody can ever put the blame on my shoulders. Nobody. The trust must. The trust is not a natural human. The trust is an artificial entity allowed and protected by the state. The trust has to file returns. Same for corporations. Any artificial entity must file returns. It's as simple as that. But let me show you the neat part about it. <laughs> oh. Thank you. First time I've ever been piped aboard. <laughs> Let me show you the neat part of this. How many of you don't even know what a trust is? Don't be afraid to raise your hands. Okay, you need to find out. If you're interested in a trust, I'm going to tell you there's lots of them out there. Most of them you don't even want to get involved in. Most of them will hurt you. Most of them will not educate you properly. They'll give you a few pieces of paper, tell them if you fill them out and sign them and go file them here or there, that you've got a trust, and it's not true. It's a lie. And it'll get you in trouble. Okay? If you really want to get into a real trust that is solid, and you're willing to do what's required, when you're required to do it, and before the expiration date, fulfill all the requirements of the trust, and faithfully execute the paperwork and have the meetings of the trustees and all of these kinds of things you can have a trust that will be iron bound can't be broken will protect your assets for your children for as long as they live and it's going to cost you about ten thousand dollars and you can't buy it from me but I know where to send you if you're interested send me a letter and I'll send your name and address to the people who can do it for you right and who will guarantee the trust for you when it's done. But that's what it costs, $10,000. And they will train you and educate you and help you all along the way. Nobody else will do that. So if you're interested, write me a letter, let me know. Is it worth $10,000? You better bet your boots it is. Just the first year alone, it's worth $10,000, because that's what you're going to pay in taxes without it. Everybody in here, you're going to pay taxes. Most of you are going to pay at least $10,000, maybe more. Hi, Allie. 
Hi, sweetheart. You want to come up here with me? Come on. <clears throat> so let me just demonstrate to you a little bit about a trust. Come on up here, honey. Come on, let me have your left hand. Give me your hand. That's it. You can come up here with Poppy. Okay? Oh, you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> let, let me do this thing for everybody. What time is it? It's after 7? Okay, I'm going to do this real quick and then we're going to be finished, okay? And then I'll see you tomorrow at 1. In a trust, what you do is you have a family trust. Bill? Yeah. It's not going to cover anything we talked about today. It's going to be a lot of Area 51 stuff, a lot of, uh, a lot of slides. Uh, Gonna be, it's going to be really interesting is what, is what it's going to be. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a family trust. A family trust is where you take everything that you own or have ever owned and you put it in trust for the beneficiaries. Now here's where you get in trouble. The trustees can have no interest in this trust. Okay? So you have to designate beneficiaries. They should be your children. They don't have to be your children. It can be anybody. The way we have our setup is we have our children are the beneficiaries of the trust. Everything that we own has been relegated into the trust. We own nothing. I don't own this shirt. It belongs to my daughters. It's the truth. We own nothing. Ooh, what you got there? What in the world have you got? Annie and I are the trustees. We are the fiduciary agents of the trust. This trust has another trust, which is the business trust. This trust conducts all the business. The beneficiary of this trust is this trust. Okay? We also have four other trusts, all of which the beneficiary is this trust. This trust owns all our vehicles, automobiles, conveyances, whatever. This trust owns all firearms. And I mean owns them. We don't own them. If we want to use one of these vehicles, we have to lease it from this trust. If we want to use a firearm, we have to lease it from this trust for the period of time that we're going to use it for whatever purpose. This trust, I forget what's in this trust. This trust is, I forget what's in that trust too. <laughs> There's another trust over here, which is the charitable trust. Everything that's left over at the end of the year from all of these other trusts is donated to this trust and is tax deductible. Those trusts pay no income taxes. This trust is a charitable trust, nonprofit foundation, which pays no income taxes. But every year, 5% of what goes into this trust must go back to the community. This money does not belong to us. The library is in here. 101.1 FM is owned by the charitable trust. It's a community service radio station. Okay? It all goes to the community. This is how we give back to the community, to our country, to our fellow men, to our neighbors. It's not ours. We can't come and take anything out of here. If we need a loan, we can borrow money from this trust, but we have to pay it back. Annie and I as trustees are paid a salary by each trust for maintaining the trust. I get $25 a year for each trust. And he gets the same. We enter into contracts with the trusts that the trusts will pay all of our expenses connected with the education, the rearing, the supervision of the beneficiaries of the trust and for managing the trusts. It's all legal. It's all lawful, it's all constitutional, it's all approved by the Internal Revenue Service. You cannot get in trouble, period. I don't earn enough money to
to even have to file an income tax return, even if I wanted to at the end of the year. And if I did, I wouldn't and haven't for many years before we even did this, when I made a lot of money. Okay? And my daughters are taken care of. If anything happens to us, these trusts are irrevocable, perpetual trusts. They're pure trusts. New trustees would be appointed, and they would have to manage the trusts and take care of the beneficiaries just as we have always done. The trusts are the guardians of our daughters, not us. Okay? And in that sense, the trustees actually become the legal guardians of the children. There are no estate taxes, there are no death taxes, there are no nothing. The trust didn't die. And it's all done through the Constitution, through our right to contract. And if you still don't believe it, this, what I've outlined for you, is called a complex trust. Next time you look at your 1040 information, look on there and you'll see complex trust. 1041, that's right. Yeah, Gary. With the firearms, uh, the trust can actually buy a firearm, right? It has to be bought by a person. Well, we owned all of our firearms. But if you were to buy one today. If we were going to buy one today, we'd buy it as an individual and sell it to the trust. Absolutely, yes. For everything. Absolutely, yes. The family trust literally bought everything that Annie and I own for $10. Everything. We own nothing. And never will own anything. Now that's commitment. What do I need with anything? I happen to know from personal experience that if you fall in love with material things, if you can't turn your back on everything that you own and walk away right now, you're enslaved. Literally, you're enslaved. I don't want anything. I don't need anything. And I got to tell you, if our house was to burn down tomorrow and we lose everything that belongs to the trusts, wouldn't bother me a bit. We'd start over. I, of course, would be concerned for the children losing part of their security to take care of them until they become old enough to quit being beneficiaries and become trustees because that's what the children ultimately become. They ultimately give up everything that they own also and become trustees. Now this is not frivolous, and this isn't funny, and it's not something that you do lightly because you truly don't own any of it, and the law says you must take care of it for the beneficiaries, and if you misuse it, or if you're a spendthrift, you're liable to go to jail for the mismanagement of your own trust. And that's exactly the way it should be. Because you see, none of this is ours anymore, it doesn't belong to us. We have a responsibility as fiduciary agents to take care of it in their name. It belongs to them. All of it. And everything that the trusts do, everything that's done by these trusts, is for the betterment of the nation, of the American people. That's our mission statement. That's the purpose of the whole thing. Okay, thank you very much, folks. I hope to see you tomorrow. Good night, and God bless you. <laughs>
Okay, if everybody will stand and pretend there's a flag up here, who's going to lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Thank you, Pooh. <clears throat> you know, yesterday I talked uh, a lot about children. There was an awful lot of people here. Not as many people here today, but I think it's just important to talk a little bit about children before we start today, because that's really what this is all about. I'll be, gee, I've forgotten. I think 54 next month. I don't have a whole lot of more time to stick around here. And Annie and I could probably just go and, you know, make a good living and with the rest of our life just have a great time and party and, and uh, do what we want to do. But it wouldn't be the responsible thing to do because we would be living this total mess to our children who don't deserve it. It's our responsibility to leave them something else. And so <clears throat> that's what we, uh, that's why we're doing all of this. There's a lot of things that I'd much rather be doing. I have a degree in photography and that's really what I love to do. I'd much rather be up in the, the mountains stalking a herd of elk to get some fantastic shots that nobody else has ever got on film than be here doing this. But I look at my children and I, I can't go do that because it's irresponsible of me to leave the world in the condition that it's in for my children to clean up after us. And the way things are going, folks, they won't have an opportunity to clean it up because by the time they get become of age where they could possibly do anything, it's going to be all over. How many of you heard President Clinton's State of the Union address? What did he say? Anybody remember what he said? Huh? For the year 2000, why? To cross that bridge into what? And how did he put it? We're going to watch the sun set didn't he? And prepare our children for what? The new dawn. Now that went right over the head of most Americans, but if you've studied the symbology of the mystery schools and the Illuminati, and the fraternal orders that are bringing this about, the socialists, the Marxists, the communists, who all speak that kind of language, what they were saying is we're going to destroy the world as it is now and we're preparing our children for the new world order. That's what he said. Most Americans didn't understand a word of it, didn't even know what in the world he was talking about. But I did, and a lot of other people did, and every initiate on the face of this earth was sitting there with a big smile on their face, laughing at the rest of us profane fools. Cattle, they think we are. Their conception of us is a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence, are no better than animals who have no intelligence, and therefore are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent and are our lawful prey. How does that make you feel? How does it make you feel? How many of you have a 32nd degree Freemason in your family? 30 on up know exactly what's happening and they're part of it. They'll tell you that they don't. They'll tell you that I'm a liar. And you ask them to tell them what they're doing, they can't tell you. They'll tell you some bullshit about their fraternal order existing for the good of the community. And they'll point to the hospitals that they built. Okay? They can't tell you the truth because what? By the time they've gotten to the 30th degree of the Scottish Rite, and this is just one organization I'm talking about. There are many under many different names where at the highest levels they are actually members of the Illuminati. The Illumined Ones, the Initiates, the Guardians of the Secrets of the Ages. They call themselves many different things. 
They've taken 30 different oaths that they will never disclose the secrets of the order. Blood oaths on penalty of death. And you say, hey, what about these oaths on penalty of death? All oh, those don't mean nothing. They're just, you know, ceremonies. How many of you believe that grown men put on robes and walk around in secret rituals in temples without windows and take blood oaths and don't mean it? How many of you believe that? And if they'll take those oaths and don't mean it, will they mean the one where they have their hand on the Bible? Of course not. They're lying to you. They are liars. Chronic liars. One of their ceremonies and oaths give them permission to lie. If it protects the secrets of the order. And tells them it's okay. Now it's important that you know this symbolism so that you understand what these people are talking about. Because Clinton was talking to the nation in the language of these secret orders and it went right over everybody's head. They didn't even know what he said. And he gave the timetable. What was the timetable? No, he said it in days. 1,000 days. Didn't he? Recently at a press conference, Sarah McClendon asked him a question. How many of you saw or heard that or read about it. She said, Mr. President, there's a lot of these crazy people in this country talking about concentration camps and you're going to be rounding up patriots and all this kind of stuff and, and, and I just want to know if you could say a few words to, you know, to clear this up because it's hurting the nation, Mr. President. What did he say? No, he didn't say it's posh. He did not deny it. What did he say? What he said, folks, is this. He says, there's some substance to that. And they can talk all they want to. We're all going in to the new century together, whether they want to or not. Direct quote. Now, <clears throat> how clear does it have to be before somebody wakes up? How many days do we have left now? See, I told you yesterday, I'm not nice to people anymore. There's no time to be nice. No time to stroke you and make you feel good. I got to wake you up quick. And I got to get you ready to fight for your freedom or you're going to make me a slave because you won't fight with me. Or you'll make me dead because I'm the only one fighting. I don't like those odds. But whether you're with me or not, I'm going to fight for my children. <clears throat> they're talking to us clearly. We don't hear what they're saying because we don't understand the language. We don't understand. How many of you saw the movie JFK? How many of you understood what was going on in that movie? How many of you understood that Oliver Stone told us who killed John F. Kennedy in that movie in clear language? And how many of you understood the message and can tell me now who did it? Not a one of you. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> how many of you listen to my show on a regular basis and understand some of the symbology? You should have spotted it immediately. He told us who killed the president in that movie. He knows. That's why they came down so hard on him about that movie. Not because he made that movie about the, the, the CIA was involved, but because in that movie he named the killers of the president. And all of those who participated in that murder understood what he said, the rest of the nation didn't. And it scared them because there's people like me out there teaching you the language. It scared them. Oliver Stone scared them. Now, you all saw in Dealey Plaza yesterday, what was there? Those of you who were here yesterday. The obelisk. 
the penis of Osiris. What was on top? The eternal flame. It's divided into 14 blocks, right? I'm not going to put exactly 14 here, but you all know that, right? Right next to it is what? Reflecting pool. Long, rectangular. That's the vagina. This is the penis. This is the vagina. This is the masculine. This is the feminine. This is Osiris. This is Isis. Osiris represents the sun. The reflecting pool represents the moon. The sun is the doctrine, the power, the god. Represents the source of all life on earth. The feminine reflects the light of her master. The feminine is the church. Isis is the church. Remember the story? Osiris was killed by Set. Where do you think we get Sun Set? <laughs> Osiris was killed by Set, chopped into 14 pieces. His body was scattered all over the kingdom. That represents the death of the true religion. The religion of science, the religion of the mind, the religion of ancient Babylon. Was killed by what? What was it killed by? Who killed it? Nobody knows? No. Who destroyed the ancient pagan religions? The Christian religion. Christianity and Christian kings and queens. Okay? The three blows to Hiram Abiff represent this same story in the Masonic initiation. Hiram Abiff represents the master builder of the temple. The temple represents what? The salvation of mankind, doesn't it? has nothing to do with Christianity or Judaism. This is all metaphor, symbols that convey a message. He was killed by three profane workers who wanted to know the secrets of the master. They couldn't wait to be initiated and to learn in the proper manner. They killed him. They killed him and they suppressed science, intellect, and the evolutionary progression toward perfection of humanity. This is their story, remember. It's not mine. I'm telling you what they believe, what I've learned in many years of research. Okay? In secret, they gathered together the pieces of the doctrine, the knowledge of the ancient religions put them all together in one place, but they could not bring it to life. Through the mystical union of the doctrine in secret with the church, behind closed doors of the lodges, this mystical union has produced the rebirth of Osiris, the intellect that was killed, as the child, what? Horus. The sun rises on the horizon. Horus, the rebirth. The symbol of all of this together is the phoenix bird. Who suffers the death, the mystical rebirth, and rises from the ashes of the destruction which killed it. So you have Osiris and Isis represents the doctrine in the church revitalized in secret bring forth through this mystical union of the masculine and the feminine the child Horus. The 
the child Horus is the full body of initiates, the adepts, the illumined ones, the priests, This was all represented in the ancient Egyptian mysteries as Osiris was killed by Set, sunset. He rode in his boat through the underground, through the mystical union between the dead parts assembled together by Isis, except for one. There produced the next morning the child Horus, which is the rising sun, who would then go to the zenith, do his father's work in the temple, become Osiris dying, and the whole pattern would repeat itself again. It meant something different in those days than it does now. What I've given you here is the modern interpretation. And these people have one goal. They have a great plan to unite all humanity on this earth in one world government, eliminate all existing religions, and put shackles on the mob. That's their goal. They're sworn to that. Everybody in America looks around for the enemy. They can't ever find the enemy. Because the enemy is your mothers, fathers, grandfathers, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, and friends next door who belong to these secret orders. Freemasonry, AMORC, the Rosa Cruci, the Knights of Pythias, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, and I could go on and on and on and on. The ones at the lower levels don't know dip about what they're involved in. They're the fools. The ones at the highest levels are members of the adepts, the Illuminati, who work behind the veil, who are the thousand points of light, to bring this to fruition all the time. They have buzzwords and code phrases that they use to identify themselves to others. If you walk into a room and you see someone standing like this, he is a member of this secret order. He's identifying himself to others who know the secret signs. He has his feet in a 90 degree angle, and that tells every other adept in the room that he is one of them. There's another code word that a very famous man uses. When I raised my arm to the square, because when they take their initiation, they become, in the third degree, they put their arm on an open Bible on a square. Never heard that before, did you? There's a lot of other ones. Oh, are you a traveling man? Oh yes, I travel from west to east. And what are you seeking? I'm seeking the pure light of knowledge. <laughs> or I'm seeking the light of the master. How many of you have heard people talk like that? Anybody in here? And they're always going from west to east. Why? Where does the sun rise? In the east. In the lodges, where is the source of knowledge and society come from, civilization? The East. Always. Why does the master of the lodge have his chair in the East? He represents the rising sun, the new dawn, the golden age. See, when Clinton made that statement, to the Congress and to the world, he was delivering a message. 
We're going to reach the fruition of the work of hundreds and thousands of years of our secret order, and we have a thousand days left until its reality. And we are preparing our children for the new dawn. That's what he said. I've been trying to warn America for a long, long time. Time has run out, folks. It's all over. You have some serious decisions to make. You're either going to bend down and put the chains on your own ankles, or you're going to stand up and fight for freedom. And you better be making those choices now, because the day the fighting starts, it's too late to make your choice. You won't be prepared. And you're not too old, and you're not too young. Because in this battle, you can't sit on the fence. You can't sit on the fence. So here we have. What do we have in Washington, D.C.? What is this? Washington Monument. Well, if this was a Christian government, why do we have the penis of Osiris standing in our capital city? Next to a representation of the pagan goddess Isis in the reflecting pool. And what is at the end of the reflecting pool? Pardon? Well, I think you all better go home. There's two ends of the reflecting pool. And I think you better take a good look at a map of Washington, D.C. and find out what's there. Okay? That's your homework. Find out what's there. Where is the seed of the child Horus germinating? And producing the new world order. Washington, D.C. wasn't built by Christians, folks. Uh-uh. No, sir. And no, ma'am. You've all read books and heard references to the secret destiny of America, haven't you? What do you think they're talking about? Huh? <laughs> what do you think they're talking about? They're talking about what I'm teaching you right now. The secret destiny of America is to bring to completion the plan of the ages, the great work of the mystery schools to return the mystery religion of Babylon to the rulership of the world. And our founding fathers were so deeply involved in it that it makes some of you so angry because you've been taught something else that you storm off and you won't listen to anything beyond that point and so you're lost. You can't fight the battle because you don't know who the enemy is. You don't even know who you are. You've been lied to all your life. This is the age of deception. Who is the great deceiver? Even the elect shall be deceived. When are you going to learn that? How can you claim to be the elect if you're a Christian and then get insulted when I tell you you've been deceived? Your own book tells you that. You've been lied to all your life. All of us, not just you, me, everybody. I wasn't born with this knowledge. Most of my life was spent in stupid occupations and endeavors that meant absolutely nothing to anybody anywhere except in my silly mind. Until one day, I got a glimpse of the truth when they accidentally put me into a place where I had access to a lot of top secret documents that I should never have seen. And all of a sudden, a light came on in my head, and I spent the next 20 years trying to figure out what it all meant. And what it means is, like I told you yesterday, I reached a point where I had to go in, look myself in the, in the bathroom mirror and say, you are the stupidest idiot that has ever walked upon the face of this earth. And you got to stop it right now. And there's nobody who's going to escape that. And if you haven't done it yet, you're going to have to do it someday because it's true. 
You don't want to do it, but you got to do it. That's what's neat about doing it in the bathroom. Nobody has to see. Okay? You're not going to be embarrassed except to yourself. <clears throat> So look at all of this. You know what it means now. You know that they're speaking in a language that you've never understood before. Now you know how to decipher that much of it. Now go back to JFK. Remember when he went to Washington, D.C., and he met Mr. X in the Capitol steps? Remember that? And he walked along, and they're talking, and they sit on a bench. Well, in reality, this never happened. He put this in the movie so he could tell you who killed Kennedy. They sit on the bench and they're talking, and there's a close-up. They fill the frame. You can't see what's behind them. Somebody's starting to get a little glimmer. They said, well, who killed him then? Well, it had to be somebody that had the opportunity and the power. And, the, and as he's clicking this off on his fingers, what is the camera doing? The camera's panning back. I can't believe you all watched the movie and you don't even remember what you saw. The camera's panning back. As the camera pans back, what is the answer to the question? The obelisk is directly behind these two men and, and Oliver Stone is telling you who killed John F. Kennedy. He was killed by the same people who built the Temple of the Sun in Dealey Plaza on the site of the first Masonic Lodge in Dallas, Texas, where there is an obelisk with the eternal flame on top, with the reflecting pool, where the reflection of the obelisk points directly at the sixth floor window, which is the only square window in the building. Where there are the four quarters of the Temple of the Sun. Dealey Plaza is in the shape of a pyramid with a capstone missing. What is the eye on top of the pyramid in place of the capstone? It's the tunnel under the railroad overpass. Wow! Now is it starting to make sense to you? And how are they laughing at all of us? How are they laughing at all of us? What did they put on the slain king's grave, the sacrificed king's grave? What did they put? The eternal flame. They marked their territory like a dog pees on a tire. They said, we killed him, and this is a message to everybody, don't mess with us. We are the philosophers of fire. We are the guardians of the secrets of the ages. We are the all-powerful hidden force of humanity and we are going to enslave the world in our new world order, whether you like it or not. And they can do it as long as everybody remains stupid and doesn't know what's going on or who's bringing it about. If I had a 30 degree Freemason or a 32nd degree Freemason in my family, which I thank God I don't, I would knock the shit out of him tonight. And that's the truth. And the same goes for Eastern Star. That's co-masonry. And at the highest level, they're exactly the same. <clears throat> I know some of you don't want to hear these things, but it's the truth. Now I'm going to play a little videotape. And it's, uh, you saw part of it, some of you, tomorrow. Now I'm going to play it all the way to the end. And if Doyle, if you'll come up here and start that, I'll play it all the way to the end now, and you'll get to see what I'm talking about here. You're going to see Dealey Plaza has this laid out. You're going to see what's in Dealey Plaza in reality. You're going to look at it. And then at the end, you're going to see some clips from Oliver Stone's film. And it's going to hit you right upside the head with the reality of the recognition of the lesson that you just received and you're going to be staggered by it if you really care about what's happening in this country. Yeah, the one that had the... Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. 
<coughs> I'm going to come down here where I can uh, do that kind of stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, pay, pay close attention to this, folks. And uh, where it needs some elucidation, I will furnish that for you. <laughs> if you're not in a position where you can see this screen real good, I would advise you to uh, change your position now. This is Dealey Plaza. You can see that the layout is in the shape of a pyramid with the capstone missing up here. But there is a railroad overpass which creates the eye in the triangle that's normally above it. These are the four quarters that the pencil is pointing out of the Temple of the Sun, just like Stonehenge. If you take these four quarters, this is on a grassy knoll. This is right over here by the obelisk and the reflecting pool. This is right across the street, and then there's another one over here. If you put them all together, it would make a circle right in the middle, just like Stonehenge. This is Main Street here. This is Houston, where they turned right and left onto Elm. The first little X there is where Kennedy was shot in the throat. This is supposedly where he was shot in the back, and this, of course, is where the killing blow, the headshot, was administered. These are the exact same wounds suffered by Hiram Abiff in the Masonic initiation. Blow to the back, the throat, and the head. This is an aerial view from helicopter of Dealey Plaza and a couple of the uh, sections of the Temple of the Sun. That's the grassy knoll. There was nobody on the grassy knoll with a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. the corner of Maine and Houston. People go to Dealey Plaza every day and walk around and don't see anything. Right over here is the entrance to the parking garage where Lee Harvey Oswald was shot. See, everything took place in Dealey Plaza. It had to. It had to take place in the temple. And what time were they moving Lee Harvey Oswald that he was shot? You see, it always happens at noon. The sacrifice is always made at noon. Here's the obelisk. If you count those blocks, there's exactly 14. There's the eternal flame. If you notice, all the windows in the book depository building are domed. All of them, except for one. The sixth floor. <laughs> How many of you realize it was the sixth floor? where there's the only square window in the building out of which Lee Harvey Oswald is supposed to have made the shot. On that plaque you can see that it's dedicated to the first fraternal lodge in the city of Dallas. There you're looking at one of the quarters of the Temple of the Sun. Here's the obelisk, the phallus of Osiris with the eternal flame on top. First time I walked into Dealey Plaza, I knew instantly what had happened there and who did it. Nobody had to tell me. They're also known as the secret college, the secret government. And I took this shot on purpose because it divides the obelisk into two columns of darkness and lightness. Because this is a war between the forces of dark and the forces of light. But the enemy is the great deceiver. And so he represents himself as the light. 
This is Isis, the reflecting pool, the feminine, the vagina. The reflection of the obelisk in the reflecting pool points directly to this window. That's the only square window in that building. Even the ones up here have domed tops to them. They keep that window propped open all the time with a little box in there so the public will know which window Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to have shot John F. Kennedy from. However, he was not up there. This is where Oswald was shot. In the parking garage there. That's the old courthouse over there. This secret order has also been known as the, what? Order of the Dragon, the Order of the Snake. On top of the courthouse you can see their mark here, the dragon. This is not a griffin, this is a dragon. Look at all those people, oblivious. Oh look, a little, let's throw a penny in and make a wish. See where that's pointed to? If you look at the reflection, it's pointed directly at the sixth floor window. Look at this guy, he's cool. Look at her, she's taking her child to teach him something about the Kennedy assassination. See the two quarters across here? There's another quarter right over there, right behind those trees. And on this side, of course, on the grassy knoll, there's another quarter. They're marked on the columns by pentagrams. And you can see the pyramidal shape of the plaza. This is behind the grassy knoll looking at the railroad tower. There's the one quarter of the Temple of the Sun. I've stood there. No professional assassin would ever make that a point from which to shoot at anyone to assassinate them moving along Elm Street. In the first place, the target is too close. In the second place, there are trees and bushes and signs all along here. You'd have to be more than an expert marksman. You'd have to be Jesus Christ himself to make that shot. And I really don't think Jesus Christ would be up to it. That's the railroad tower where you've heard testimony about. Right over here is where Zepp Ruder stood. Right on there. See that little wall? That's where he was standing when he took his uh, famous Zepp Ruder film. Right there is where the uh, car came around the corner, turned and came down this way. Long before Kennedy was assassinated, this was built. Now, if you go back and read the writings of the adepts of this order, you'll see that there's certain things had to transpire in order to create the New World Order, and one was to sacrifice the king. Another one was to change matter into energy, and all of these things happen on the 33rd parallel all of them. Why? Anybody know why? No. As the sun traverses in its path from midwinter to midsummer, it traverses what? 33 degrees. 16 and a half degrees on each side of the equator. Isn't that true? Is that 33 degrees? You bet your boots it is. So, it begins at w its work at 30 and ends its work at 33. Coincidentally, so did Jesus Christ. So do the Illuminati. They begin their work in the 30th degree and they disappear behind the veil at the 33rd degree. And then they have another 63 degrees up the ladder that they can go. Actually, 66 degrees. 
And then from there, they can go laterally into the Ordo Templi Orientalis, which is Aleister Crowley's organization for another nine degrees. So you may see people who sign their name, and after their name, there will be 33, 96, and Roman numeral 9. Those are the highest adepts in the secret orders that are bringing about the destruction of the world as we know it. This is from the railroad overpass. Look at that. From the railroad overpass, or from down where Kennedy was actually shot in the head, you look up, that pyramid of that other building is right above the spot on the, on the book depository building, under which is the square window from which Lee Harvey Oswald supposedly shot John F. Kennedy. But Lee Harvey Oswald was never there. He was never up there. We have a photograph of him actually standing in the doorway of the book depository building as Kennedy is being shot. He's watching the motorcade go by as any normal human being would be doing. Is that the sign that they pass behind when they're driving? Yeah. That's one of them. The one that you're thinking of was actually up further. Up the that sign's been removed. There were also three hobos found in a railroad car who were arrested and then let go. One of them, of course, was who? Howard, Howard Hunt. We also know the identities of the other two. They represented the three murderers of Hiram Abiff in the Masonic initiation. Jubelo, Jubelum, and Jubela. They had to be there. Because this whole thing is symbolic, it's ritualistic. Uncle Jim will tell you, oh, we don't do anything in Freemasonry. We just, you know, just a bunch of guys get together. Really, when did Uncle Jim become so stupid? Grown men don't do that. Especially with the huge amounts of money you have to pay. Look at that to go up through the degrees. It costs a lot of money to be a Freemason, did you know that? It's not cheap. You see in each of those posts, right around, right there, there's a, a pentagram. It's on the posts of the uh, of the uh, sections of the uh, Temple of the Sun. Everywhere there's a post and the top member crosses, there's a pentagram. When it went in there for that close-up, you could have seen them very clearly. But I failed to point that out at that point. But if you go to Dealey Plaza, you'll see them very clearly. Also, if you purchase our Zapruder tape, it's on there. All of this footage is on our Zapruder tape, including the Zapruder film, including frame by frame, so that you can examine every frame any way you want to, front, back, forward, all of it. It's in back. It's another building that's been built. <laughs> There's John F. Kennedy. President in the Oval Office. I um, is there a volume on this Doyle? I don't remember. I I don't remember 
where the volume comes in, but there's going to be volume coming up here shortly. White circle is one of the symbols. It's the snake eating its tail. Usually you'll see that there's a dot in the center of the circle. That's the symbol of the phallus of Osiris also. It's also the symbol of the generative force, the intercourse between the male and the female, or the unification of the doctrine in the church, which produces the child chorus. This is the Zepruder film. You'll never see it better than this in your whole life. This is the very best copy that can be obtained anywhere. Now, it's a little off color. That's this TV set. There's a little bit too much red. But it's not going to stop you from uh, seeing what you need to see. She wasn't retrieving a part of his skull on the deck of that limousine. She was trying to get out of there. See that white car under the underpass? That car was there and didn't start to move until Kennedy's limousine almost ran into it. That car belonged to the chief of police of Dallas. I should say the Dallas chief of police. Here it is a little slower. Now the reason a lot of the frames are blurred, people complain about this, nobody can do anything about it. Home movie cameras at that time in 8mm format that used Kodachrome had a shutter speed that could only go at its very fastest 1 30th of a second. So if you're hand holding any camera, I don't care how good you think you are, and you're shooting at 1 30th of a second, you're going to have most of your photographs come out blurred. Especially if you're tracking something that's moving. Every once in a while, through a trick, see here's the umbrella. Every once in a while, through a trick of fate or accident or something, you will get a perfectly clear picture, but it's very rare. Kennedy's been shot in the throat. Somewhere along here, he's shot in the back. You can see when Connolly gets hit because his cheeks puff up and he falls back into his wife's lap. You can see up here, watch this. It appears that the driver turns around and shoots Kennedy in the head. Shortly after that, you see a big flash here. When you slow it down and examine the whole frame, you'll see glass shards falling down, which appears that a bullet hit the windshield. And we know that one bullet did hit the windshield. Jacqueline was trying to escape from that car. I don't know. If I had a hunch I was being set up, I've learned to listen to my hunches. I wouldn't have gone to Dallas. And I don't think John F. Kennedy was a fool. He certainly didn't impress me as being a fool. So I don't think he had the slightest idea. When was he shot? November what? 22nd. What month is November? What day? Add the two together, what do you get? 33. Dealey Plaza is just a very short distance from the 33rd parallel. In fact, on a very large map of the world, it is on the 33rd parallel. You get down to nitty-gritty, 
large scale maps and it's a little bit off. But it's close enough for their work because I'm sure that first fraternal lodge in Dallas was thought to have been placed on the 33rd parallel. These are just some uh, frame by frames. You see, these guys aren't too concerned. The president's been shot. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, me. Gee, what shall we do? Secret Service. They're supposed to protect his life. Do they look upset? They look concerned? No. Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? No. What's the job of the driver of a car? of an executive or a president or a member of government when he is attacked protect him and get him out of there that guy in the passenger seat should have climbed over that seat and thrown himself over the president that's his job the driver should have got that car out of there as quickly as possible they didn't do either of those things did they no. When we examine this very closely, we find some strange things. We find the emulsion scraped off the film here, here, all up here in the front seat. Up here we find, some people say that's a reflection on Kellerman's head, but it's not because his headline goes right where I'm showing you. Well, I can't hold it steady enough, but right under here. It's actually floating above his head. It's not on his head at all. The emulsion was scraped off here. It was scraped off here. Emulsion has been scraped off up here. This is not chrome. These are the visors of the car. You'll see flesh that appears to throw the same reflection as sunlight on chrome. That's impossible. All of these white places you see, this is actually where it's been scraped off, not only on his head, but up into the grass. either covering up the fact that Kennedy was shot by one of these two guys in the front seat or they're trying to make us believe that he was. We don't know because we can't tell what's there where they've scraped the emulsion off the film. Look at this. That's where the emulsion's been removed from the film. Here, here, down here. Here's Kellerman's headline right there Connolly made the statement that he saw and felt the shot that killed Kennedy what we can't see is Greer's right arm where's his right arm and what's it doing look at this Kellerman's head if that's a reflection See, here's, here's his headline right here. When you blow that up, it's easy to tell. So there's emulsion scraped off the film above Kellerman's head and across Greer's face, all across here, across Kellerman's forehead, inside the car where there is no sunlight hitting at all. There's no sun hitting down in here. It's all in shadow. So we don't know what they're trying to hide or what they're trying to make us believe. You can't tell. When the film is played at normal speed, it looks like Greer turns around and shoots the president. When I was in the Office of Naval Intelligence, I saw top secret documents that said the driver of his limousine, William Greer, is the man who administered the headshot. With, with Mrs. Connolly and, and especially her know if somebody fired a gun from the front seat, well, why would they not? Sure they would know. They didn't want to be next. 
If the Secret Service, the person who guards the president, is involved in killing him, who's safe? Who was guarding Jacqueline's children? Who still guards them? The Secret Service. If it was safe in that car and the assassins were outside the car, why did she try to get out of the car? If you're in a car, surrounded by people trying to kill you, would you try to get out? No. I'd be beating that driver over the head with my purse. <laughs> get moving, sucker! He didn't do that, did he? He almost stopped the car. The car comes almost to a complete stop, and that is absolutely against every training and order that they ever receive. This is not the way they're supposed to act in this circumstance. Now you see them ducking down. Look at them ducking down. And it looks like they're passing something back and forth down here, but the emulsion's been scraped off, so we can't tell what it is. Whatever it is, Kellerman puts it in the glove compartment right there. Look at this. This is flesh and clothing. Here's where something hits the windshield right here. See the glass fly? Yeah. And that bullet came directly in front of the car. What's in front of that car? Another car parked under the overpass in which the Dallas Chief of Police is with another member of the Dallas Police Department. It didn't come from top of the overpass because there's people up there. And nobody shot from up there. Although, there was a train on the tracks up there behind those people who were looking toward Kennedy's car. There could have been men with high-powered rifles on top of those cars with silencers shooting at the president. It's possible. And as soon as the president was assassinated, that train moved out and nobody ever chased that train to find out if there was or not. But all this is conjecture. Conjecture means nothing, at least in my world. You can throw conjecture out, but don't ever start to believe your own conjecture or anybody else's. Only believe what you can prove. Conjecture is worthless. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, can you stop that? Just stop it right where it's at. We'll take a little break. Right away. Yeah. Is Doyle out there somewhere? Okay, I've got some uh, not so good news to give you. I think most of you know by now that I'm the director of intelligence for the Second Continental Army of the Republic, which is one of the largest militias in the country. And our people are everywhere. So if anything happens, they notify me immediately. Just a very short while ago, some of the people from the Republic the so-called Republic of Texas, went into town in Fort Davis in a van and were arrested by the sheriff. Richard McLaren, who is the so-called <laughs> ambassador for the Republic of Texas, who has his home in Fort Davis and his following, got upset about this and went to a neighbor and kidnapped the neighbor and his wife and are holding them hostage and so we have a very bad situation developing.
the official position of the Second Continental Army of the Republic, I have just spoken with the commanding officer on the telephone, is that since they have taken hostages, we cannot support them in any way whatsoever. They have done a no-no. So now you know what's going on, you know our official position, you're going to have to make up your own mind what stance that you take on this. We've done a lot of uh, study into this Republic of Texas stuff and find out that where they may have some legal grounds for what they say, they have screwed themselves by lying, telling an awful lot of lies, and they're split into three factions who have three different presidents of the Republic of Texas at the present time. Richard McLaren, McLaren who uh, claims that he is the official ambassador for the Republic of Texas, was officially kicked out of the Republic of Texas by one of the other two presidents. <laughs> so, you know, at this point, when they go and take innocent hostages, they've gone beyond the pale of being legitimate. You can't do that. But that's what's happening right now. And this hostage taking just occurred just a few minutes ago. And my people are there and they're watching the whole situation. So if anything develops, we'll know about it before anybody else does. Where at? In Fort Davis, Texas. Okay, if we can uh, start this again, we'll continue where we left off. I hate to give you bad news like that. But there are no end to fools in this world. And an awful lot of them seem to be in this country today for some reason. Yeah. Who's the uh, video expert that we had? Has he disappeared? Could somebody, does anybody know where they're at? Okay, thanks. Pardon? Well, punch, to hit the button if you can find it. See, it's not so easy, is it? <laughs> ah, here he comes. Here comes the expert. <coughs> Yeah, good, thanks. Okay, here we go, good. So, we continue. You can see in the back seat now, you can see there's no, nothing's been done to Kennedy or Jacqueline at this point. Now do you think in just a second's time, all of a sudden, they're going to be reflecting light like you would never saw before in your life? Look, watch this. He's hit in the head now. Whatever hit him in the head isn't just a projectile. It exploded. This is an explosion that occurred up on impact. Now all of a sudden you can't see the wounds. And now all of a sudden there are great big reflections here on stuff that should be covered with blood and things that are not reflective. They've literally, once again, scraped the emulsion from the film. They did a very poor job here because you can still see some of the red tint to the blood. It literally blew half his head off is what happened. You see this? This is emulsion scraped off of the film, even into the grass. Look up here. The grass and the curb, the emulsion has been scraped away also. Now all of a sudden, you can't see anything. Look at all this. This is scraped off the film, folks. All of this. It's all gone. Why did they allow the film to even exist? Easy. Well, once you know the film exists, it's impossible to say it doesn't. Too many people knew. Abraham Zapruder took it to the local processing place and had this film processed immediately. And he had them hurry up and do it. And he told, he phoned all the news people. They showed it on TV that night. 
the whole world knew about it and then the government said oh god we've got to get that film no telling what it shows they took it away from Zepruder took it to the National Photographic Laboratory in Washington DC and that's where we believe they did all this alteration to the film no copies were made no do you think a rubber bullet or something did the other two wounds you said it didn't go very deep I have no idea what made them. That I fought in a war. I know what a bullet wound looks like. And I've never seen a bullet in my life that will only go like a, a three quarters of an inch in somebody's throat. A BB gun will almost do that. Look at this. That is so obvious it's unbelievable. Look at that. Just totally scraped off. No, that's where the emulsion has been removed from the film to cover up the truth about his wound so you can't see it. Now this is Jacqueline's white gloves. That's her white glove. She has blood all over her. Look at her. Look at the horror. Now that's a woman who's been protected all her life. Never been close to anything horrible. From one of the most wealthiest families in the country. Taken care of, pampered, always had money. Can you imagine what she felt there? And what did she do? Did she try to get out and protect herself? She tried to get out of the car. Connolly's laying down in his wife's lap, yelling, they're going to kill us all. She said, not me. I'm leaving. <laughs> Stay if you want to. I'm getting out of here. Now look at the deck. Look at the rear lid. There's nothing there. These two things are antennas. They're supposed to be there. These are handholds for the Secret Service. There's nothing else on the deck of that car. There is no piece of his head. She did not go back there to pick up anything. It's a lie. You can see it. Anybody see anything there that's not supposed to be there? Anybody in this room? No, because there isn't anything. You've been lied to for years by people who tell you that they're experts telling you the truth like Bob Groden, one of the biggest liars that's ever lived on the face of this earth. He claimed he was the world's leading independent photo analyst and he analyzed the Zepruder film. He never told you that it was doctored. He never told you that this brake light right here was opaqued, which is a common term for blocking out the passage of light through film. You can see the other brake light right there, clear as day. Both of them were working fine. This one's been opaqued. Because normally when they show it on television, you can't see that brake light. They did a quick job, a very quick job, blew it up, made a copy, and gave it for use on television, where you only saw that brake light. They didn't want you to know that the driver of the car, against all orders, was stopping the car instead of speeding it up. That's why. He didn't tell you about all the emulsion removed from the film on Kennedy's head and in the front seat and the driver and the face and the head of Kellerman and Greer. He didn't tell you any of that. So he lied to you and said she went back on the deck of that car to pick up a piece of his head. Bob Groden is a liar. I've said it publicly all across this country. I've said it to his face. He hasn't sued me yet, so it must be true. <laughs> well, had the driver sped up, she wouldn't have tried to get out of the car either. Well, I, I don't know. If the guy that just killed my husband and shot the guy that was riding with him in the car was in the car with me, I'd try to get out of the car. No, they're trained. You see, they go through drills. If the president is assassinated while riding in his car, you will do this, this, and this. 
They're supposed to get down on the floorboards. The driver is supposed to maneuver the car and do what he's been trained to do to get them out of the kill zone, out of the area of danger, and take them to safety. The Secret Service people following and in front of the, the President's limousine have jobs that they're supposed to do. They're supposed to pinpoint the direction of the fire and return fire and kill those people as quickly as they can. Yeah. That's right. The man who was in the front seat with Greer is supposed to climb over that seat and cover the president's body with his own. He didn't do it. This is all public knowledge. There's no secret about this. They didn't do any of it. There's the car that belongs to the chief of police. It's parked stationary under that overpass. It doesn't even move until Kennedy's car almost runs into the back of it, and then it clears out of there. What was it doing under there? What happened to the driver's career or his lifestyle after this? Did he live for a while? Yeah. Did he suddenly have a nice home in the Cayman's or something? No, he didn't uh, deviate from his normal. No, none of them did. But you see, that's not the way the Illuminati works. You do it because you're told to do it. Because it's a part of the great plan. And you've taken an oath. That you must do what you're told to do when the order asks you to do it. Whatever. The order will take care of their family. That's the promise. If they go to jail or they get killed, they did it for the greater good. See that? That's the actual top of Kellerman's head right there. This is actual Greer's shoulder right there. You can see this up here is where the emulsion has been scraped off to either hide what Greer is holding in his arm, which is right there, or to make us believe that he's holding something in his hand. You can't tell at this point. Look at that. That's obvious. You can see the top of Kellerman's head right here. And that emulsion's been scraped up not only on the top of his head, but up into Greer's face. Any photographer can just rip this to shreds. Look at the back of Kellerman's head. You can see the natural curve right here. Look at this. It's all been scraped off up there. People say, Cooper's crazy. That's a reflection off of Kellerman's head. To get that kind of reflection on anybody's head, ladies and gentlemen, would require a whole jar of Brill Cream. <laughs> you think government agents grease up their head like that? No. Look at that. There's the natural curvature of Kellerman's head. That's not a reflection on his head. It's where the emulsion has been scraped off clean above his head and across Greer's face. Can you all see it clearly? Am I telling you the truth? If you can't see it well, come up and look for yourself. Get closer. I don't want you to go out of here with any doubts. Well, I can't see it now. You're too late. <laughs> Got to be quick. This is where it appears a bullet struck the window, the windshield. And we know that one bullet did strike the windshield. That's on record. They have admitted that. You can see glass fly there. And these are reflections off shards of glass that are flying down beside the car from that bullet strike. Now, a lot of you have seen the photograph of the car in front of Parkland Hospital with the roses in the back seat. Have you, how many of you have seen that? Everybody thought that was Kennedy's car, and they said, well, there's no hole in the window. It wasn't Kennedy's car. That was not the car that Kennedy was shot in. Didn't even have any blood in the back seat. There was blood all over the car that Kennedy was shot in. How many of you have been in a war? 
Nobody in here? I'm the only one? One other man? You've seen a head wound, right? A head wound is the bloodiest thing you'll ever see in your life. Great amounts of blood flow to the head through the carotid arteries. You're shot in the head, blood goes everywhere. It spurts in a solid stream. I've seen head wounds. Head wounds produce lots of blood. That's why people get so scared when a little child hurts themselves on their head because there's a lot of bleeding. They're not really hurt, but there's so much blood coming out it scares the hell out of the parents. Look at this. Emulsion scraped off. Look at that. Look at it. Scraped off even up into the grass. That's not on Kennedy, that's way up in the grass. And the curb across his forehead where the bullet struck, his face, all scraped off. Next time you see Bob Groden and he's talking to you and you're in the audience, <laughs> say, tell us the truth, you lying sack of crap. Who's that? Who is that? Oswald, that's right. Where is he? He's in the doorway of the book depository at the moment Kennedy's being shot with all of those other people. Who's this? Lee Harvey Oswald. It's the same guy wearing the same shirt. They said he went home and changed his shirt. He didn't even change his shirt. He's got the same shirt on that he was wearing when he was standing in the doorway of the book depository building. These people have lied to us all over the, all over the place. Pardon? A reporter. Who's this? Prouty. Who's Prouty? Turn it up. Listen carefully. Nothing was left to chance. He could not be allowed to escape alive. Well, I never thought things were the same after that. Vietnam started for real. There was an era of, I don't know, make-believe in the Pentagon and CIA. Those of us who'd been in secret ops since the beginning knew the Warren Commission was fiction. But there was something, something deeper, uglier. I know Alan Dulles very well. I've briefed him many a time in his house. But for the life of me, I still can't figure out why he was appointed to investigate Kennedy's death, the man who had fired him. Dulles, by the way, was General Wise's benefactor. I got out in 64, resigned my commission. I never realized Kennedy was so dangerous to the establishment. Is that why? Well, that's the real question, isn't it? Why? The how and the who is just scenery for the public. Oswald, Ruby, Cuba, the Mafia. Keeps them guessing like some kind of parlor game prevents them from asking the most important question, why? Why was Kennedy killed? Who benefited? Who has the power to cover it up? Who? 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 He asks the question and he gives you the answer. And it went right over the heads went right over the heads of the whole nation. Did Oliver Stone know who killed Kennedy? You bet your boots he did. He just told you right there. He showed you. Could he come out and say it in any other way? And live? No. But he told you, didn't he? He did the best he could. He can't help it if we're all so damn stupid, can he? He knows what I know. He showed you. He told you. He asked the question, how plain can it be? And then he backed off the camera and showed you. Go ahead, let it go. <laughs> or I'll tell you what, let's just go into, take that video out and put in 2001 and we'll start from the beginning. I'm going to show you how they communicate all the time 
and it goes right over our heads. We don't understand it. We don't know it. We miss it. How many of you saw the movie 2001? How many of you understood what you saw? You understood it? What? Give me the message. Pardon? Yeah. Okay. Good. You got it. But the rebirth was what? As a new race in the new age. And the message was, if you can't make this quantum leap, you can't be a part of it. That was the symbol of the baby floating in space. The birth of the new root race going into the new age. And if you can't make this quantum leap and understanding that we're showing you in this movie, you can't be a part of it. You will be exterminated, rounded up, put in prison camps, used as slave labor, executed, whatever. We'll try to get some use out of you, but you cannot be in the new age with us. The new dawn, the rebirth of humanity. You starting to get the message? Are you really? Because if you don't, you have no idea how important this is. If you don't, you're lost. You won't even understand what happens and why it's happening to you. Yes, sir. What do you mean by root race? Have you studied the writings of Blavatsky or any of the New Age religion, which will be the new religion of the one world order? You need to. Everybody says, I'm not going there. It's New Age stuff. That's the work of the devil. I'm not reading that because it's not Christian. If you don't read it, how are you going to understand it? How are you going to know how to fight the enemy if you don't know who the enemy is or what they believe? You've got to. Okay, back it up. It starts with the MGM lion. <laughs> the lion is the symbol of what? The king, the ruler. Okay, here we go. Watch this carefully. Remember, Osiris, Isis, Apollo goes across the heaven in the chariot. Osiris rode across the heavens in the boat of Isis. You're going to see it here in a moment. All of the symbology is going to be played out in front of you. Watch carefully. Who is Lucifer? How out there fallen for heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What is the son of the morning? Horus, being reborn as his father Osiris, right? Actually, Hyrus, Osiris being reborn as his own son um, Horus. It's also played out in the Lion King when the little lion looks into the pond and sees his father staring back at him in his own reflection. There it is. There's Osiris riding across the boat of Isis. Isis is the moon. Osiris is the sun. Isis reflects the pure light of her master. Check it out. And here is what? The earth bathed in darkness. The home of the profane. See, you all just thought that was pretty, didn't you? Oh, that's cute. Gee. <laughs> These guys are real artists. They made some cute stuff in the beginning. It's really neat. It means something. They're showing you the mystical intercourse between the sun, the phallus of Osiris, and the moon, Isis which produces the full body of initiates, the adepts, the Illuminati. The Illuminati have a god of light. Hi, sweetheart. Then the 2001 means something. Annie, would you come and get baby? I have to do this, okay? Please. I'm sorry, honey. I can't pick you up right now. Now this is all symbolic. Here, what do you see? The golden dawn. 
This is the dawn of the golden age, the dawn of man. There's nothing here, some clouds, some ground, no green stuff growing. You can hear some insects begin to make their presence known. You see it's just mostly just a vast desert. The sun rises higher and what happens? You see things beginning to materialize. Trees, shrubs, some grass is growing. There is the phallus. The generative force is at work. You hear the wind blowing. When the wind blows, it signifies an age is passing, a long period of time, but the Spirit is moving upon the waters. That's the way the Bible would say it. Here, they say it with the wind. A long period of time is passing. Things are happening. Animals come and go and they leave their traces behind them. These are epochs. And then this little creature appears upon the scene. He's a peaceful little fellow. He eats nuts and roots and berries and plants. He lives peacefully side by side with the animals that he will later kill and eat. But now it's the age of innocence. It's the Garden of Eden. Nobody's killing anybody here. They all live peacefully together. Occasionally you'll see some grunts when somebody tries to eat what somebody else is eating, but that's about it. And it's daytime, it's peaceful, everything is cool. You can see. Even then, man instinctively knew that life came from the sun. Without the sun there would be no life. And you'll see the bones, which is the symbol that things live and things die, and this goes on for a while. Life is played out. That's about as violent as it gets. And then something develops toward the sunset. See? It's getting darker. The sun is going down toward the horizon. Carnivores enter the picture and begin to prey on man. And it's always toward the sunset that this dangerous time occurs because when do animals hunt? In the evening and in the night. The sun is setting now, the shadows are growing long. They go down to get their drink of water before they retire to their cave for the night. They're peaceful. Nice little fellers, they don't sound too sweet, but then, you know, sometimes when I'm a little bit irritable, neither do I. What do the carnivores represent? Danger. The element of danger that man could not face. Man was pretty helpless in that state. Man doesn't have big long teeth and claws. Now here they are, and another group comes, strangers, oh my god, they're just like us, but they're strangers. They might even be of a different race, right? Look, they even look different. Isn't it true that if somebody looks different than you, and you don't know anything about them, you get kind of a little uneasy when they come around you? That's the root of hatred between the races. See, they're all bluster and bluff. Nobody's hurting anybody. They say, we're here first, we're drinking. Yeah, but you had your drink, get out, we want to drink. Well, why can't we drink together? Because you don't look like me, you sucker. And back and forth and back and forth. And so they go away and let the other guys drink. That's about as violent as it ever got. In the age of innocence, living with nature. But it was dangerous. That's supposed to be the golden age? 
Yeah, the age of innocence is the golden age. When man lived in concert with nature. When things got out of balance, nature took care of it. Sun is setting. The leopard has its kill. Man retreats into a place of safety, which represents the womb. Goes in the cave. The womb. There's the womb. While he's in the womb, evolution is taking place. It's also nighttime. What happens at nighttime? Huh? Monsters come Gets dark, doesn't it? What happens when it gets dark? You get scared if you can't see what's going on around you. And if you were these guys, you'd have reason to be, wouldn't you? Anybody who says they never got scared in the dark is full of crap. It's the normal state of things. Most of us big guys aren't supposed to admit it, though, are we? They're in there. They're scared. They're all huddled together. In just a minute, you'll see another symbol. One of them is holding a baby. Look at that. See that little fella? See that little baby? Something is coming of this. Evolution is occurring. Comes the first rays of the golden dawn. A new epoch is being born. There they are all sleeping. Now you're going to hear something. Listen carefully. What is it? He hears it. You go, uh-oh, something's going on, man. I don't know what's happening. It's light outside. Not supposed to be dangerous anymore. This is weird. Hear that? What is it? Bees. Another symbol of the mystery schools. What does it represent? What is this? It's a monolith. It is the black stone of foundation. The stone of foundation that was here from the beginning. The Bible talks about it. The mysteries talk about it. There is a reproduction of it in the meditation room of the United Nations building. It is represented by obelisks. It is the generative force. It is the symbol of the truth. It is the symbol of the gift here of intellect to man in his primitive state by Satan. When this little fellow gets up enough guts, he's going to touch it. And he will be imparted intelligence. Bill, is that also called the Philosopher's Stone? The Philosopher's Stone, no, is, the perfect, is, is, a, is a symbol for the perfection of the human race. That's what they're working toward the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone, which is the perfection of the human race. Here he goes. Oh, I can think. See, I, I've heard so many explanations for this from people who didn't understand the movie. Oh, I was extraterrestrials. Well, what were they doing? Well, I don't know, but it was extraterrestrial, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, really? Tell me some more. This is the stone of foundation. The smooth black stone that you will also find in the upper entertainment area of the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. How many of you have been there? How many of you have seen up in the entertainment level that shiny, smooth, black wall that reflects everything? That's it. I don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about, and I don't have time to do it now. <laughs> okay, man, now has been imparted the gift of intellect. 
Let's see how he uses it. Let's see how smart we are. What do you think he's going to do? First thing man's going to do with his newfound ability is kill somebody. Hooray. Here he is. Oh, look at that. That's the temple of initiation. You can see the God of illumination rising above it. What is the capstone of the temple? The master mason, the initiate. He is now the first priest, the master of the lodge. He sits in the east. And he holds the power of knowledge that no one else has. He has the first original thought. He is the first priest, the first king, and the first power upon earth outside of the natural realm of the forces of nature. Whoa, did you see that? You know what he's thinking? I'm God. That's what he's thinking. I'm God. I'm God. I have the power. I am the leader. Don't mess with me because I know something that you don't know. I can think. even tide what's he eating now doesn't look like veggies to me he's eating meat he's learned how to kill his neighbors that he used to live peacefully with The buzzing of the bees, folks, is the symbol of unity, society, social evolution. You'll see it everywhere the mystery school exists. You'll see it all over the state of Utah. The Mormon church was founded upon the mysteries. The Mormon church in the secret initiatory rites of the temple practices the mysteries. Joseph Smith was a Freemason, so was Brigham Young. If you're a Mormon, I don't mean any disrespect or insult, but for me, you get the truth. How you deal with it is your business. What's the representation here, folks? One group has evolved and the other one has not. One was the hunter, one ate veggies. What is the metaphor? Cain and Abel. One sacrificed meat upon the altar, the other ate veggies. Sacrificed vegetables, right? Cain slew his brother Abel. Isn't it amazing when you find out that movies mean something more than what you thought they meant? How many of you sat transfixed and watched this and thought, oh, well, this is neat? You know, didn't have the slightest clue. Well, the first time I saw it, I didn't because I wasn't as smart as I am now. And then I'm willing to admit it. Took me years before I understood enough about the mysteries and their symbology to understand what it was I was watching in this movie. Now watch this. The mind of man evolved.
the priesthood hoarded and protected the knowledge until eventually they could produce a space station which floated in space. Can you produce a space station that can float in space? Well, with the help of the secret technology of the guardians of the secret of the ages and the buzzing of the bees, you can. If you're an initiate, if you're given the power, if you have the knowledge of the symbology, if you have the support of the fraternity, the brotherhood of man, you too can do great things. Haven't you ever wondered why some people who aren't even smart at all go so far in life and you who toil and work and slave and are six times smarter than them can't get to first base? You're not a member of the club. They're not going to pull you up. They're going to slap you down. They're going to pull their brother up. Once you understand the extent of my knowledge, you'll then understand why they hate me so bad, that they tell you such bad things about me, that you really come to these things thinking you're going to see some kind of monster until you find out who I really am. Why haven't they gone through with their symbology and created the real things? The space station and stuff, why have they stopped? The How do you know they haven't? They don't tell you everything. <laughs> You're going to find out today that most of the photographs that NASA has ever shown you are fake. Okay, we don't need to go any farther than this with this. It goes on to show man in this journey of but through space. Is it about space? No, it's about man. Who survived? Huh? This was about the survival of the fittest of the human race. Who is worthy of being accepted into the new age? The man who had the greatest knowledge. The man who could survive against all the odds. Who was Hal? Hal was a computer. What did Hal represent? the technology of man that he created through his knowledge. It was telling us, hey, we're reaching a point where we have to stop this insane advancement of technology. Because we've reached the point that the public doesn't even know yet, in secret, we have created things that can destroy us all. And on the spaceship, could you believe they built this big computer to run this spaceship and they didn't have an off switch? There's no switch to turn this thing off. And this machine interpreted the actions of the astronauts as being against the mission that the machine was assigned to perform and it began killing off the astronauts. And by the time they realized it, it was too late, there was nothing they could do, and he searched high and low for a switch. There was no switch to turn this thing off. He had to crawl up in the machine and, and cut wires and pull out circuit boards and all kinds of stuff, and he luckily made it before the machine got to him. H-A-L. Advance them one letter of the alphabet, what is it? IBM. Were they talking about the IBM Corporation? No. But what was the symbol of technology at that time? Computers. IBM. Right? What happened to him when he reached Jupiter? What did he see floating out in space? The stone of foundation. He went out and looked at it. He found a way to look inside of it, and what did he see? He said it another universe. Inside this stone of foundation there was another universe. A whole other universe. He began to develop the mental mindset, what they call what do they call it? Huh? A paradigm shift in his consciousness. 
representing the paradigm shift that is expected of all who are going to progress and go into the new age together. All of this stuff about him laying there and then looking up and seeing himself in the doorway and then looking in the mirror and growing older and all of this kind of stuff. That was his confrontation between himself to make this paradigm shift where he was reborn. See, he represented humanity. He wasn't a person at all. He represented humanity. He was reborn as the first of the new root race, floating as an infant in space. Now, we jump to 2010. Remember that movie? He comes back in spirit and talks to the next dude, doesn't he? Who says, is that you, Frank? It's me. What happened to you? Something wonderful. Bullshit. This wasn't a message to you was a message to the adepts of the world, telling them that the fruition of their great plan is coming into being. And that this is what they're going to have to do. Must be a rebirth of humanity, a new world order. What was 2010 all about? It told you how this new world order is going to come about, didn't it? Didn't it show you that? Instead of being separate nations and having a cold war, we're going to come together, aren't we? And we're going to make this giant leap together through space, which represents what? Humanity together as one, conquering the odds, preventing them from going into their new world order. So the Russians and the Americans and the rest of them on board this spaceship, they do that, don't they? When they get up there, they find the old ship. They re-energize Hal, who's willing to sacrifice himself so that they can get away, now that Hal understands. <laughs> and they see the stone of foundation appears again and starts to multiply where? Across the face of Jupiter. And they're skedaddling out of there because what's going to happen? Jupiter explodes and becomes another sun. And the children of the first son meet the children of the two sons. Children of the one son meet the children of the two sons. There was a movie about that, wasn't there? How many of you saw that movie? They communicate in this manner all the time. But it's all about the creation of their new consciousness, their paradigm shift, the new world order the destruction of the old, the disintegration into chaos out of which will come the new order. Ordo ab chao. That is the motto of the 32nd degree of Freemasonry. They have it written on everything. Their buildings, their lodges, their books, their badges, their pins, everything. You think it means nothing? Ordo ab chao. To get the new world that they need, they must destroy the old. The phoenix must be reborn out of the ashes. What do you think Clinton was talking about when he said, We will watch the sun set, and we are preparing our children for the new dawn. Do you get it yet? Does everybody get it? Do you understand it? Is anybody here who doesn't? Okay, you all get the William Cooper School of Symbology Diploma. <laughs> I'm glad you got it because it is so important that you get it and that you understand it and that you know what's happening. Because if you don't, you're helpless. You're just another person in the long line of refugees with a dead body beside the road. And you don't want to be that. Right? Yes, sir. The computer without the off switch, is that symbolic of the unchecked intellect? Yes. In other words, the foundation of everything is intellect built upon intellect. That's right. Denial of any uh, God, spirit. And soul. They want to really, literally, return to what they call the golden age. But they don't want to do it with the risks involved. 
They want to go to a simpler life where technology and the intellect and learning and knowledge is controlled by them. And the rest of us just sort of live like children in their care. Socialism, that's what it is. That's what socialism is. You give up all your rights, you give up everything, you agree to accept my rules for you, and I'll take care of you. In other words, we want the whole human race to stop being adults. You become children again, we will be your daddy. We are the only truly mature minds, and thus are the only ones who are rightfully endowed to rule. You're just profane cattle. We'll allow you to live if you'll do it on our terms. And if you won't, we're going to get rid of you. You're going to make that paradigm shift or we're going to kill you, knock you off, use you for slaves until you die, whatever. We'll get some use out of you if we can. And if we can't, we'll just simply eliminate you. That's their plan. Yes, sir. Yes. It has nothing to do with the children of under 18. It has to do with us children. The children of the new age. Because I keep hearing this children crap. Yeah. That's right. Yes, we went in there with tanks and we killed all those people for the children. To save the children. Absolutely correct. That's right. Well, it's a good thing they say in the hostage rescue unit instead of the termination team. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now things are going to get a little more interesting. We're going to see some of the technology and talk about some of that. I brought some stuff up here we're not even going to get to. I brought a copy of Black's Law Dictionary. If you don't have a copy of that, you need to get one. They've got them back there on that table. Go buy one today. Because legal terms in a court of law don't mean what you think they mean in your everyday life. The way you use terms in your everyday life have no standing whatsoever in a court of law. If you don't have that dictionary and you're reading law and trying to interpret law or trying to represent yourself in court or trying to understand law or why a court did this or did that, you can't do it without Black's Law Dictionary. You also need something else, a copy of the 1828 version of Webster's Dictionary. Because while all the rest of the dictionaries in the world change, the dictionaries for law and legislation and courts are still the same as they were in 1828. Webster's. I didn't bring it with me. Do you have it? What is it? 1-800-352-352. 3223. 3223. 1-800-352-3223. Call that number and they'll tell you how to get it. You must have a copy of Webster's 1828 Dictionary. You'll also notice that everybody tells you there's no such thing as the Illuminati. Look up Illuminati in that dictionary. Get a copy of the Encyclopedia Britannica before 1900 and look up Illuminati and see how many pages they devote to it. See, one of the things they do is they, when they gain power, they eliminate the evidence of their existence. <laughs> That's why the older books are the best. They tell you the most truth. The newest books you can buy today will only tell you psychobabble, propaganda, new age, paradigm shift bullshit. So, where should you go to buy books? In the bookstore that has the oldest books that you can find. And you better get there because they're being bought up and disappearing at a rapid rate. You would be amazed what you can find in these old books that they're now telling you is not true. Absolutely amazed. It's incredible as a matter of fact. That's right. Okay, what we're going to do now is uh, 
We're going to take a little video trip on uh, a long time ago when I was first trying to disclose to people what's going on. I made a video called Project Red Light. I thought we didn't have any copies at all until I was getting ready for this trip, and I found a copy. I also found that tray of slides. Just to go, just for this trip, I just found it. Actually, Annie found it for me in a box in storage somewhere. And uh, so what you're going to see is the first part of Project Red Light, which is just sort of a visual history of the development of the space program from the beginning of flight. Okay? And, yes, okay, he's going to change the tape. Oh. that is the most seen by the average person? Nope. 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 One red American Beauty Rose. It is the symbol of the secret destiny of America. It is the international symbol of Marxist socialism. It is the symbol of the birth of the New World Order. You need to get the song called The Rose and listen to it again. Because even when things are going against it, the seed is lying beneath the snow in the cold of winter. When their movement has to be suppressed. And in the spring, when the sun warms the earth and melts the snow, the seed comes to life and the germ begins to grow and the rose begins to open its petals pretty song, huh? you never knew it had a message, did you? it gives courage and hope to all the socialists of the world What is the message of the song? Who knows the lyrics? What's the message of the song? If you're afraid to die, you cannot grow. Who knows the song? The soul that is afraid to die never lives. It's giving courage to these people. You may have to die for the fulfillment of the great plan. Don't be afraid. For even though it is in the cold of the winter snow, the seed is just waiting for the summer's warmth of spring. Give your life willingly for the completion of the great plan. Do whatever's necessary. You see, it's going on right under our noses and we don't even know a thing about it. What did they do after they blew up the building in Oklahoma City? And make no mistake about it, they blew up the building to demonize American patriots, disarm American citizens, create draconian legislation to enable them to do what they need to do as one more step toward their new world order. They had a memorial service and you see President Clinton and Hillary holding the one red rose and they handed one red rose to everyone who went in there and they gave one red rose to all the rescuers and the police officers and everybody who took part in the rescue effort laughing at us and telling the world what it was all about. Timothy McVeigh may be guilty. 
But if he is, he was used. He's a patsy because he's not a socialist. I don't know anything about Terry Nichols, but I know that much about McVeigh. Yeah. And I think McVeigh was honestly the kind of guy, if he had known there was going to be anybody in the building, he wouldn't have done anything. I'll tell you the truth. <clears throat> Not because I know him personally, but because we have investigated his entire life. He's not a racist. He was not a member of any militia. He was an American patriot who wanted to be a member of the United States Army Special Forces. He went there. He tried out. He passed all the physical trials and tests and everything. When they ask him one question, if we give you an order to assassinate someone, will you carry out that order with no reservations and no hesitation? And he said no. They said, you can't be a member of U.S. Army Special Forces. Put him out the door, and he was recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency on the same day. Who are these people? Everybody take out a dollar bill right now. One dollar bill. Now I'm going to amaze you. You see, they always make themselves known. They always speak to each other in symbols. There is no mystery about any of this if you understand how to read their language. At the highest levels of this initiatory group, There is what's known as the order of the trapezoid. The head of the Temple of Set in San Francisco is a member of the order of trapezoid. He's also a member of United States Army Intelligence, G2. So is his top two lieutenants in the Temple of Set. What is the Temple of Set? It's the Church of Satan. They have a saying in the New Age movement, as above, so below. You've all heard the reference to the pyramid below the pyramid? What are they talking about? They're talking about the concept of the way things work and are brought into being in the world. Okay? Why do you see so many triangles everywhere? Why is everything a triangle? The food triangle, the this triangle, the nutrition triangle, the yield sign triangle, the triangle on tanks in the army. What's, what's this with all the triangles? And now you're seeing pyramids spring up everywhere, all over the place. Well, there's a method to their madness. This is the Trinity. What does the Trinity represent? How things are created and brought into the world. It is reflected in religion as the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the mysteries, it is thought, desire, and action. Thought, desire, and action. Look at the reverse of the great seal of the United States of America. What do you see? You see a pyramid. What's a pyramid doing on a dollar bill for the United States of America? This is in Egypt. Why would we have a pyramid on our dollar bill? No other reason than to send a message. Look behind the pyramid. What do you see? Come on, speak up. Light. No. What do you see behind the pyramid? Look there. What's growing there? Anything? Desert. Nothing is there. We left the old world because it was barren, wasteland. There was nothing for us there. We came to the new world, and what do you see in front of the pyramid? Things beginning to sprout and grow. We have planted the seed of the great plan, the new world order, in the new world. And it is taking root, and it is growing.
There are 13 courses on the pyramid. You can count them. The 13 courses are 13 is the symbol of the phoenix. Death and rebirth. Resurrection. You see at the top of the pyramid the eye. The eye is the reminder to everyone who sees it that we are everywhere, we see everything, there's nothing that we don't know. On the bottom course of the pyramid there are Roman numerals, what are they? No. Read me those Roman numerals in order. Read them to me. M what? Okay. I knew it, but I want you to participate. If you don't participate, you cannot learn. Thank you. What does that mean? What does that say? 1776. Everybody says that's the birth of the Constitution. When was the Constitution born? 1789. This isn't the birth of the Constitution. 1776. What else was born? The Bavarian Illuminati. Everybody says this stands for the birth of the Bavarian Illuminati. Weishaupt created the Illuminati. More bullshit. It's not true. The Illuminati has existed throughout the history of humanity. Wasn't born with Weishaupt. Weishaupt created a Bavarian order of the Illuminati and made it publicly known. That was a no-no. Wasn't supposed to happen. Let's find out what they're talking about here. Because the modern form of the Illuminati and the birth of the Great Plan occurred in the year 1110. What happened in 1110? The Knights Templars conquered Jerusalem and crowned the King, or excuse me, not the Knights Templars, but the Crusaders conquered the city of Jerusalem and crowned the king of Jerusalem. What was his name? That's your homework. Find out who was the first king of Jerusalem crowned on the Temple Mount in 1110. I'll tell you this, he was one in the line of the Merovingian kings. Nope. Okay, let's see what this is all about. Let's see if we can decipher this. I'll tell you we can and we will, and it's going to blow your mind. Let's see what this really refers to. And we'll use the order of the trapezoids formula for enciphering and the New Age concept of the pyramid beneath the pyramid, and as above, so below. Remember, as above, so below. So, what is a trapezoid? A trapezoid is a pyramid on top of a pyramid. And remember, it has various faces to it. But you don't need the other faces. Let's just plug this in. M. D, C. C, L, X, X, V, I. What have we got? What does it say across the top? MCX, what is that? 1110. I was right. <laughs> what is their goal? Is their goal what I've been telling you it is all day? Well, let's find out. What, is, what are these people up to? 
What do they want to do? Remember I told you their goal was to destroy all existing governments, all existing religions, and shackle the mob. And how do you do that? What's DC? 600. What's LX? 60. What's VI? 6. Their goal is to seat the Antichrist upon the throne of the world. And you've been carrying it around in your pocket forever. <clears throat> Who is the Pope? He is the emperor of Rome. Rome never died, never faded away. It became the Vatican. What is the Vatican? It is the priesthood of all of the old pagan religions of Rome. Built upon the deception that they are Christian. Can man change the orders of God? Can man change the orders of God? Can man elevate himself above God? No. Then why did the Pope change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, the venerable day of the worship of the sun Osiris? Why in the outer courtyard of the Vatican is there a temple of the sun, an obelisk, and a reflecting pool built as a fountain around the base of the obelisk? Because what we're talking about in Dealey Plaza and in Washington, D.C. exists also in the Vatican. And I'm not trying to insult Catholics, I'm just trying to tell you the truth. You can believe in whatever you want to believe. I will never argue with you about that or try to stop you in any way. In fact, I'll fight and die for your right to do that. The king of Jerusalem founded an order of knights shortly after he was crowned, called the Knights Templar. Their first task was to explore the caverns and tunnels below the Temple Mount and find whatever relics of the past that they could find. They became the richest order in the world. They became the first international bankers they were, to my knowledge, the first communist, actually that's not true because the Gnostics were the first communists, but the Knights Templar became the second large group of a communistic order that existed in the world. Their symbol is two knights riding on one horse. When they joined the order, they had to give up all their worldly possessions, goods, money, clothes, property, everything, to the order. And they were only given according to their need in the position that they were assigned to perform by the order. What is that? Communism. They didn't own anything. They didn't have anything. They were never given anything unless they absolutely needed it to do whatever job they were assigned. And they were given only what food and clothing they needed for that particular day or that time or wherever they were or how much labor that they were performing. They were communists. Were they created by the Vatican or by the church? No. That's the biggest misconception you could ever have in your whole life. No, they weren't. The church never even noticed them, didn't care about them, until they became powerful and rich and wealthy and started to own lands and lend money to kings and queens. Then the Pope called the head of the order to Rome and didn't ask him anything. Instead, what he did was legitimize them as a holy order of the church, whether they wanted to be or not, and gave them the red cross to wear upon their tunic. The Pope, as a mission, said that they were to protect the pilgrims going to Jerusalem. Did they ever do that? 
Did they ever protect the pilgrims going to Jerusalem? No. They never did. It's more BS thrown out for the sheeple. What did they do? They protected the church's interests. They protected their interests. They conquered. They had secret alliances with Saladin that the world doesn't know about. They brought the mysteries from the Middle East to Europe and practiced them. They created the great plan after their master Jacques de Molay was burned at the stake in the efforts of the Pope and the King of France to destroy the Knights Templar when they felt they got too powerful. Where did the pirates come from? Did you know that the Knights Templars had one of the largest fleets in the world? Did you know that one of their symbols is the skull and bones? Did you know that on every grave of the Knights Templars in Europe is the skull and bones? Did you know that when the Templars were destroyed by the Pope and the King of France, the entire fleet escaped and became the pirates? Didn't you ever wonder why the pirates were called the Brotherhood? Didn't you ever wonder why they could all sail into the same port and never fight against each other? <laughs> Didn't you ever wonder where the Templars' fleet went? Didn't you ever wonder where the skull and crossbones came from? Didn't you ever wonder why the Russell Trust at Yale University is called the Skull and Bones? George Bush is a member. He's a Knights Templar. And many other great men who have occupied high positions of this government. <clears throat> Their goal is revenge for the persecution of men of intellect and science throughout the Middle and Dark Ages by the church, by the kings and queens, by the governments, and by the ignorant mob. That's why they want to destroy all existing governments, destroy all existing religions, and put the shackles on the mob. Now, if you think they're wrong in doing this, you go back and study the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and the Inquisition. And then you come back and tell me that these guys haven't got a right to be pissed off. They do. Does anybody in here know how many people were murdered in the name of the church? In the name of Jesus Christ, who would not have condoned one bit of it. It's not the Jesus Christ that I know from reading my Bible. Does anybody know how many people have been murdered by kings and queens because they refused to be enslaved by them? Or because they had an idea that was different? Or because they read books? That's all they did was read a book. Got caught reading a book. Anybody know? Look in history and find out. It's another reason why you should never, ever let church and state become reality. Church and government have to be separate. I don't care what church you belong to. You try to make your church part of government, and I'm going to step in the middle. Because I know what happens when that happens. Members of the same church can't agree with each other. How many different denominations of so-called Protestantism is there? Huh? Did you know that even in the beginnings of this country, people had to flee from colony to colony because different colonies had different dogmas and different preachings and teachings? And if you disagreed with it or said something that was out of line with your local minister, you could be burned at the stake here in America. How many of you knew that? It's the truth. That's why I get so angry when somebody comes up and tells me this is a Christian government. Which Christian? Where did you come from? Who taught you this nonsense? Our founding fathers did everything they could to prevent that kind of thing from happening. 
and at the same time allow you to worship at whatever altar, whatever God, whatever denomination, whatever dogma you wanted to. And that's really the key to freedom and the success of the first 150 years of this country. Unless you think I'm attacking Christians, I am a Christian. But I'm a Christian that Jesus Christ would want to know. Yes, sir. In all of these situations you referred to, too, weapons was a primary key element that they had to disarm prior to being killed. That's right. In every period of tremendous mass murder, and genocide that's ever occurred in the history of the world, the target was usually, in every case, disarmed just prior to it happening. And I'm telling you right now, that's the key to the big push to disarm the American people. Is if you don't fit their definition of the mental attitude for the citizen of the New World Order, you're going to be exterminated. They don't want you here. And part of their plan is to reduce the overall population of the Earth by a tremendous amount. The target population for North America, I'm not talking about the United States, I'm talking about North America is 100 million people. They make no secret of this. They've written about it. You want your eyes to be opened? Go read The Aquarian Conspiracy. Who wrote that? that include Mexico? Who? Does that include Mexico? In no, you're, you're wrong. Who was it back there? Marilyn Ferguson. She knows. She's a part of the Aquarian conspiracy and she's telling you the truth in the book. And you know what she says in the book? We're going to eliminate these dudes. You think she's talking about moving you somewhere else? No. She's talking about you're going to be eliminated. Removed from the face of the earth. Killed. They want us out of the way. Freedom cannot exist in the New World Order. They want total control of everybody from now on. Okay? Everybody understand all of this stuff? That's why it's so important that you research the secret orders. The secret orders have existed since the beginning of mankind, when the first man learned something that nobody else knew and said, all right, I'll start the fire tonight if you'll all be good and if I can have that woman and that woman and I get the comfortable place in the cave and you all go hunt meat for me because I'm hungry and I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to come back. First priest, first king. Since that time, knowledge has been used to control other people. The common man was not allowed to read books or have knowledge or learn or go to school. It was a beast of burden. The worker. Okay? The Aquarian The Aquarian Conspiracy. Marilyn Ferguson. A lot of other things out there you, you need to read. So you pass these things by because they don't interest you. I'm not a new ager. I'm not even going in that section. I'm a Christian, so I'm not going to read any other religious books. Secret societies? The Illuminati no such thing. How do I know? Rush Limbaugh told me. <laughs> Excellence in broadcasting. Allison does the greatest Rush Limbaugh impression that you've ever seen in your life. Yes, Gary. Um, if you take the, you know, the number 666 times 3, it comes out in 1998. And, and you know, morality, I guess that means that's going to be a great year for them. No, it's going to be a bad year for us. It's going to be a great year for them. We don't have much time left. Clinton gave us the time label. He said a thousand days, and that was on the night of his address to Congress on the state of the nation. He told us, 1,000 days. We're going to see the sunset and we are preparing our children for the new dawn. 
Now you better take what he says seriously because he's not joking. He's not lying this time. State of the Union message. I played it on my broadcast just so to make sure everybody got it a second time. And I'll probably play it again just so that they get it for the third time. And you'll be surprised how many people still won't get it even then. Circus act and all that. Yep. Circus act and all. Those other guys like Dole and them, they, they knew what he meant? Absolutely. Bob Dole is a 33rd degree Freemason. You really think he's on your side because he calls himself a Republican? Read Hegel. Read Hegel. It's exactly the way they corrupt the nation. You vote for him because he's a Republican. And you're a Republican, conservative, upstanding, American, traditional, constitutionist, right? So you're going to vote for the Republican, who happens to be a lying piece of crap, who's not a Republican at all. He's an Illuminist, pushing us into the New World Order. Most people vote Republican because their parents were Republican. They don't even know what the word means. And if you took the meaning of Republican and applied it to any of the candidates who call themselves Republican, you'll see that they're not even close. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Seventeen seventy six. Novus Ordo Seclorum. Literally what it means is announcing the birth of the New World Order. The birth of the new secular order. Read it. Septus. Annuit Septus. Announcing the birth of. Down below, the new world order. The new secular order. It's been on our dollar bill all this time. If you'll notice, one of the words have been intentionally misspelled so that there would be exactly 13 letters. <laughs> intentionally, because there had to be 13. Everything there is 13. 13, 13, 13, everything is 13. Pardon? No, it's Seclorum that was misspelled. Seclorum was misspelled intentionally so that there would be 13 letters in Novus Ordo Seclorum. Pardon? Do you have a list of recommended yeah. readings? Pardon? Do you have a list of like recommended readings? Or you know where to go? No, but I did a tape in the Mystery Babylon series that has the whole hour as a bibliography. I did it on tape. Yes, sir. <clears throat> no, they're secret orders. Unless the member lets it be known who he is, the only other way to tell is by the symbology of their language or what they do. But see, who's who, when they ask somebody to be in who's who, they ask them to provide a list of all of their organizations and associations and degrees and all that kind of stuff. Bob Dole gave it to them. It's right in there. You want to know who they are? Go to who's who and start looking in there first. If you can't find out, call their office and say, I would like to have a list of the membership organizations to which congressman so-and-so belongs to. And if it's not listed on there, call him up. Or go and talk to him. And when you walk in and talk to him, give him the handshake of the Master Mason. And say, are you a traveling man? And if he gives you the handshake back and says, yes, I'm traveling from west to east, you got your answer. That's how I verified that Bo Greitz was a Freemason. I heard him say it on the Billy Goodman show one time. And then I heard him say it 
at a speech he gave in Las Vegas on Ju in July of uh, 1990, I believe it was. Pardon? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Yeah, but I'm talking about when I heard him say, he said, I'm a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. And then later he denied it. Well, he didn't know that I knew what that meant. And so that night, he came into the ballroom there, and I was standing there, and I thought, I'm going to give this guy the test. And you know why I was there? Because I loved him. I was one of his greatest followers. Everywhere I went, I said, listen to Bo Grites. I walked up to him, I gave him the handshake of the Master Mason, he immediately grabbed me, took me into the five points of fellowship and whispered Mahabon in my ear. You know what I did? I said, Mahabon my ass. <laughs> Pushed him away, I walked out, and that's the last time I've ever said anything good about Bo Grites. So I know how to play their game. You don't know how to do that. You can learn though. Get in those old books and it'll teach you exactly how to do it. What the signs are, the passwords, the symbols, the handshakes, everything. You're not supposed to have access to those books, but if you visit enough old bookstores, you'll find them. Is Morals and Dogma probably one of the best? Morals and Dogma is one of the best for understanding the, the real intent of the order because right in there Albert Pike admits that their God is Lucifer and that they are a religion. He says it in clear plain language. Okay let's take a short break folks I know you all need it. Let's take a short break and then we'll get into some other videos and slides and uh, well I'll tell you what let's do this first. Let's go through the beginning of this this uh, evolution of the space program and then we'll take our break, short break before we get into the other stuff. So if we can, uh, Doyle, who's the uh, video guy? Who's the video senior expert par excellence dude that does the video? Here he is. Thank you, sir. It's in there. It says bibliography. Just get the list from my wife. Pardon? Story, yeah. The New World Order was created on the basis of a paper written by Sir Francis Bacon called The New Atlantis. Yeah. Okay, this doesn't require any narration, just... Uh, it has been made with the best equipment. Truth is not very much. Please take that into consideration when viewing this tape and understand that we have done the best possible job that we can do under the circumstances to bring you a quality documentary. All footage is authentic, and all aerial shots were taken over the test site. Introducing General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur, with portions of a speech delivered before the Corps of Cadets of the United States Military Academy at West Point on May 12, 1962. The General spoke without a prepared address, without even notes. You now face a new world, a world of change, the thrust into outer space of the satellite spheres and missiles mark the beginning of another epoch in the long story of mankind. In the five or more billions of years, the scientists tell us it has taken to form the Earth. 
in the three or more billion years of development of the human race, there has never been a more abrupt or staggering evolution. We deal now not with things of this world alone, but with the illimitable distances and as yet unfathomed mysteries of the universe. We are reaching out for a new and boundless frontier. We speak in strange terms of harnessing the cosmic energy, of making winds and tides work for us of creating unheard synthetic materials to supplement or even replace our old standard basics, to purify sea water for our drink, of mining ocean floors for new fields of wealth and food, of disease preventatives to expand life into the hundred of years, of controlling the weather for a more equitable distribution of heat and cold, of rain and shine, of spaceships to the moon, of the primary target in war, no longer limited to the armed forces of an enemy, but instead to include his civil population of ultimate conflict between the united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. Thank you.
everybody, my name is Keith Ranch, and tonight we're here in Las Vegas, Nevada at KBEG radio station, and we're here exploring the UFO phenomena that is exploding in Las Vegas. We're here with Mr. Billy Goodman. How you doing, Billy? Fantastic, Keith. Welcome to Las Vegas. We are really excited, <laughs> really excited tonight. We're, uh, we're going to go out to uh, a place called Groom Lake, right. where thousands of people have been calling in reportings of UFOs. Oh. Can, you, can you tell us about the happening and what is going on with this explosion out here? It's unreal. What has happened is, first of all, the way it occurred is that we found out through Bill Cooper mm -hmm. that there was some activity going on at a location called Groom Lake, which followed up with this UFO hotline out of Los Angeles. Right. That corroborated that there was something happening. So, we talked about a lot of building been happening, and one thing led to another, and people said, we want to go out there. So we right. said, okay, let's put together a little trip. And we did. And a couple of Saturdays ago, you, you had to see this, Keith, to believe it. Mm -hmm. Over 100 people sitting in a circle, in folding chairs, with cameras in the middle of the desert. Like, you've got to visualize cars and trucks pulled off to the side, vans, everything, buses, mm -hmm. all pulled off to the uh, side, look. and they saw these lights all over the place. And now we left, because we had to get the bus back mm -hmm. to Las Vegas, but people stayed overnight, and they saw over 20 other sightings overnight right. of lights and activity that is unexplainable. You have to understand the area of Groom Lake is off limits to regular air travel and to Air Force and Navy. Mm -hmm. So no other planes are going to be flying over there except what is happening at Groom Lake. And yeah, I, I understand that you can actually be shot down yes. if you if you fly in that airspace. I can't, because I won't do it. You know, I'm not, I'm not about to fly over there. Yes, if anybody from uh, the Air Force, the Navy, or uh, commercial airlines, yes, they will be shot down. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. Uh, who, who is Bill Cooper exactly? Bill Cooper is a gentleman who was an ex-member of the Naval Intelligence Briefing Team. Mm -hmm. And he was honorably discharged in 1972 from the United States Navy. While in the Navy, as part of the Pacific Fleet, he spotted UFOs literally coming out of the water while he was on watch. Not coming only out of the water? Out of the water while he was on watch. Not only did he spot the UFOs, but other members of the Pacific Fleet uh, also saw what he saw. Mm -hmm. Now, these UFOs not only came out of the water and flew around and did some tricks for them, they didn't do it once, they did it a number of times. Out of the water, back into the water, come out and do some flip-flops for them, and then back into the water. So, this man knows for a fact, number one, he saw them with his own eyes, mm -hmm. but that's not all. That's not all. The other part is that while he was in the process of being a part of the Naval Intelligence Briefing Team, he had the opportunity to look at some top security papers, and he saw in writing that, in fact, there were UFO craft in captivity and aliens in captivity. Actual aliens. Actual aliens in captivity over the years. Okay, well, listen, uh, I guess we're going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, one more question. Have you been out to Grim Lake yourself? I was there. And what did you see? I saw lights up in the sky, zigzagging. That's all I can tell you. In other words, could they have been our aircraft? Did they act like something no, like they have? No, 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 no. Planes don't do that, but I know of. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying we don't have something that we don't know of mm -hmm. that's going on at Groom Lake. But you don't see planes zigzagging up and down, flying uh, horizontally, going up and coming down. You don't see those things, as far as I know, right. the, the planes that I'm familiar with. Right. Not that much into aeronautics, don't get me wrong. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to go out there and check it out for ourselves. Do it. So, uh, thanks for the interview, and we will talk to you later. The only thing I regret is I cannot be with you folks, but I was there, and now it's your turn. Okay, well, we'll let you know what happens tonight. I know you will, but Charles Ellery will be out there, and Charles Ellery is my guy, and he's the one who brought us out to. 29 and a half mile marker mm -hmm. on Route 375. Well, you hit us You're on the air, Billy. Oh. He's on the air. Well, no, I'm not. But I guess we'll, <laughs> we'll catch up with it. As far as UFO activity and unsolved mysteries decided to go into it, 
and to look into what would happen at Roswell, New Mexico. I want to read you a little letter that's dated September 21. As a matter of fact, I just got to the radio station today. It took a while to get here. I don't know why. Perhaps she did not mail it. But listen to this. In the late 40s, early 50s, my father was a civilian employee at Wright Air Development uh, Center, now called Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. He was air eyewitness to several pictures of the craft as well as uh, documents that were circulated among the key personal personnel that is, in the government. What is being told now is something I have grown up with. My entire family has known of this since I can remember. But we, like the others, were sworn to silence. We were all too aware of the problems my dad would face if we said too much. Can you believe this, Dave? I'm, it goes on and on. Even though we knew that things from other planets did exist, she's not saying think. She knew things from other planets did exist. We tried to deny it to ourselves because even a few years ago, to mention such things in public would have bought us one-way tickets to the funny farm. That, that, that's only the beginning. There's more uh, with this letter. I mean, there's so much more. This is nothing compared to the mail that I just received today of people telling us that finally the fact is that they have seen or they know of UFOs. Favor, zoom in on this little puppy. Take a look at it. Can you hear that noise in the background, folks? And camera four, zoom in on this. This is, I, I don't exactly, I guess it's a Tesla coil. Is that correct? Anybody nod here? This is the Tesla coil. Now, you've heard me talk on the air about Nikola Tesla. Well, somebody, Ted Rice, brought this down tonight. Look at this. Isn't that something? That is fantastic. All I'm doing is touching it with the tip of my finger, and you hear that. I'm touching this. It looks like a crystal ball type thing. Well, it's not a crystal ball. And there's a lot of electronic stuff, and all it is is plugged into the wall in restaurants. I think I'm seeing the very same thing, where you see them sort of flowing out. And you probably have seen these at the Elephant Bar and uh, shenanigans. And But this is something else. Hey, camera four, zoom in on this puppy. Look at that. Oh, wow, I feel like I'm electrified. Are the rumors that presidents have been briefed on aliens and UFOs true? Has a president ever said anything about extraterrestrials or unidentified flying objects? Let's see. But I've often wondered, what if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space, from another planet? Wouldn't we all of a sudden find that we didn't have any differences between us? When I left Vietnam, I was sent to the USS Charles Berry 1035 for a short period with NIS Naval Investigative Service to conduct an investigation on board that investigation. How many of you ever listened to Billy Goodman when he was on KVEG in Las Vegas? He was absolutely insane. He was a lot of fun. Everybody loved him and everybody listened to him for 11 states all over the place. And I was a guest on there a lot. Okay. All I gotta do is jig this across. There. Okay, everybody get where you can see the slide now. <clears throat> this is going to be a little bit fun, a little bit crazy, very educating, and extremely interesting. I think. See how far off we got by jiggling this table around. Yep, I knew it. Okay.
Well, if everybody uh, believes there's UFOs and there's extraterrestrials, why don't they land? Nobody knows the answer to that. Nobody knows if they even exist. UFOs, however, we know are real. This photograph was taken in the early 50s over the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. There were headlines in the newspapers talking about the great UFO flap and the pictures that were taken of UFOs over the nation's capital. This is a part of history. It's real. It's not a joke. This is uh, another one of the same bunch. Now, some people claim that these photographs are fake. They were published in the newspapers. Hundreds of thousands of people who lived and worked in Washington, D.C. saw them. This is an ad that appeared in a magazine, Look Magazine, as a matter of fact. It said, flying mobile camper of the future may be electric powered, plugging into any electric outlet for recharging. Now, why would somebody put an ad in Look Magazine with something like this if they didn't think that this was possible? Does anybody know? The truth is, at the same time, during the early 50s, in all of the scientific magazines and in the scientific journals of the day, in, in the popular electronics, popular mechanics, all of those, there were people publishing articles about the use of electromagnetic force fields to create craft that could fly with what appeared to be anti-gravity characteristics. It was no secret then that people were working on this stuff. It was also no secret then that there was a lot of talk and a lot of articles written about technology that the Germans had perfected in their secret weapons program just prior to and during World War II to come up with new types of flying machines and weapons that could be used for Hitler's socialist conquering of the world. And the Germans had developed disc-shaped flying craft that they had developed to the point where they were test flown and witnesses had, had seen them. And we, when, when we went, <clears throat> getting tongue tied here, when we went into Germany and started to capture German facilities and manufacturing plants, we found the plans and disc-shaped craft in various stages of production and brought them back to the United States. So did Great Britain, so did Canada, and so did the Soviet Union. And the United States, at that time, this wasn't secret. Somewhere during the middle 50s, it became secret. And the reason it became secret is because they perfected it. They made it work. When that happened, you no longer saw any articles appearing in any magazines, scientific journals, or anything else concerning this type of technology. You also saw patents that had been applied for and granted to people like Nikola Tesla and others classified as top secret and disappeared from the files of the patent office. This is fact. Look Magazine, a blueprint for flying saucers. This was, anybody read that date for me, June 14th, 1955. This is the uh, table of contents page for the cover of the magazine that you just saw. There it is. Is this the real flying saucer? This article was written by a journalist who had interviewed a general in the United States Army who described for him this flying saucer, piloted by a human being, built by the United States Army, and in operation at that time. You can get that magazine and read this article. Now, if you'll notice down on the left-hand side there, that picture of the airport of the future, where is it? No, that's not Area 51. It's underground, though, isn't it? 
It's underground in a mesa. Now, if you take that picture and cut it out of that magazine article and go to Dulce, New Mexico, and stand at the east side of the Archuleta Mesa, on the south side of the San Juan River, and hold that picture up, that is the Archuleta Mesa in Dulce, New Mexico. Part of it's on the Hickory uh, Apache Indian Reservation. The other part is on the Southern Ute Reservation in Southern Colorado. Start talking to these Indians about UFOs and they shut up, look at you like you're crazy and get away from you real quick. Stick around at night. Sometimes you don't see anything. Sometimes you see the most fantastic contraptions flying out of that mesa that you ever saw in your life. Belongs to the United States government. This is a very early 50s safety poster that was taken off a bulletin board in a United States Air Force installation. This is a United States official Air Force photo of the Avro disc in 1955. Avro was a deception presented to the public and the press to get their eyes off of the real secret projects. That's the real Avro car when it was finished. If you want to see this, it's displayed outside the Air and Space Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. You can go there, you can see it, it's right there. It was a disc-shaped craft, it was piloted by a human being, but the only thing that it could do was hover precariously on a tarmac and uh, look like the pilot was drunk. And we believe that that was an intentional portrayal in order to ridicule the concept that we had ever built anything like this that was effective and flew. But we know better than that. This was found in a uh, junkyard. United States Army junkyard. Nobody knows what it was or who built it. It was just sitting in the junkyard and we photographed it. Pardon? What was what? Um, I don't even remember the year. It was quite a while ago though, I can tell you that. It was nothing recent. This is uh, a photograph that someone made of something that was being tested in a wind tunnel. And it was being tested by NASA. NASA says it was a nose cone, but there's no aircraft that this nose cone fits on. We don't know what it is. But it appears that there were testing the aerodynamics of a disc-shaped object. If they were testing a nose cone, the nose would be pointed into the tunnel. It wouldn't be sideways to the tunnel. This is a saucer-shaped craft that was built by the French Air Force, was operational and flown on many occasions. It's piloted by one man belong to the French Air Force. There's another view on it. So when people tell you that these come from outer space, I'm telling you that the chances of them coming from outer space are pretty slim. It's like going in, turning on your TV set, and you can't get a picture. So instead of looking in back to see if it's plugged in, you fly off to New York to find out what's wrong. There's something flying around in our skies. Why should we automatically assume that it came from somewhere light years away? It's not even logical. Especially in light of the fact that we can find no proof anywhere upon the face of this earth that extraterrestrials exist in space, much less have ever visited here. There's all kinds of circumstantial evidence if you accept that what you're seeing is extraterrestrial rather than saying, hey, it's flying in our atmosphere. The logical conclusion is it was built here 
and it belongs to us. Now, I'm not telling you there's no such thing as extraterrestrials because I don't know, and neither does anybody else. I am telling you this, there is no evidence whatsoever that extraterrestrials exist anywhere, much less have ever visited this earth. And there have been millions of dollars offered as a reward for anybody that can furnish any such evidence or prove that any such evidence exists and no one has ever stepped forward to claim those millions of dollars of reward. Simply because there isn't any evidence at all, period. This is a UFO that was photographed from which some kind of luminous substance was dropping and, and uh, disappeared. Is this what's going on? Is it? Are we being visited by space people who look at us as little babies in the playpen of the universe? who looks back at the aliens and sees them as insignificant little twerps with a lot of technology. Because I'm going to tell you, if there really were extraterrestrials and they were really visiting here, it wouldn't be ignored and it wouldn't be treated so lightly by so many people and so many governments and so many scientists. It would be the discovery of all time. And everybody would want a piece of that pie. But that's not happening, is it? Some of the photographs you're going to see that I'm going to show you, and I always take them from official NASA publications. You can get the same books with the same photographs and examine them for yourself. Okay? Some of them came from exploring space with a camera, an official publication of NASA. Some of them came from a NASA publication called The Moon as Viewed by Lunar Orbiter. Some of them came from the Atlas and Gazetteer of the Near Side of the Moon, an official NASA publication. Who are these people that tell you there's no near and far side of the moon? NASA would know, wouldn't they? If they know, why would they publication publish something talking about the near side of the moon if there is no near side of the moon? Have you ever seen any other face of the moon than the one you look at? No. So these people that tell you there's no such thing as the far side of the moon, they're full of crap. You've never seen any other side of the moon, have you? Now I've been all around this world on Navy ships. I've been in the Indian Ocean. I've been in the Sea of Japan. I've been in the South China Sea. I've been in the Arctic Ocean and I've been in Antarctica. And I'm telling you, all around the world, the same moon that you say here, I have seen everywhere I've been. Some of them were taken from lunar photographs from Apollos 8, 10, and 11. Now, if you don't think there's any symbology of all of this NASA stuff, what was the first craft that we ever had that actually landed on the moon? Manned or unmanned? No, that was manned. Then it wasn't Apollo 13. How about Apollo 7? First unmanned craft landed on the moon was Apollo 7. What was the first craft that landed on the moon that had men in it? Apollo 11. 711? Coincidence? No. What is the system of gematria in the Old Testament of the Bible? Seven. What is the system of gematria in the New Testament of the Bible? Eleven. What was the Apollo craft where they had the disaster that ended the space program? Apollo 13, the symbolic death and the resurrection of a new order in the space program. You're beginning to understand they're running the show, folks. If you don't know what gematria means, I don't have time to teach you today. You'll have to look that up. 
Some of them were taken from space images published by Lustrum Press, which were made from official NASA photographs, which they considered to be fine art. Here's a bunch of bumbling dudes in spacesuits up there, not using any brains whatsoever to take these pictures, and these jerks call it fine art. This is the moon from a long way away, they tell us. If you look real closely, though, you don't see any stars in the background, do you? No. You won't see any stars in the background of any NASA photographs taken of any of the Apollo moon landings. Now, let me tell you something, folks. This old bit that you can't take photographs of stars on the moon or from the moon is a crock of crap. Stars are out there. Without an atmosphere to filter the light and diffuse the light of the stars, the stars and the sun are extremely bright in space where there's a vacuum. They were using Hasselblads. Most of the time they had those Hasselblads set on infinity, which means anything in the frame would have been in focus. The light was so bright, they had them stopped down to the lowest f-stop that they could possibly have because light in space is overpowered. Okay? How come, if they were using the finest cameras, the finest lenses known to man, stop down to the lowest f-stop that provides you with an unlimited depth of field, With the focus set on infinity, there are no stars in any of the pictures taken by these guys. This is a picture of a crater on the moon. Now look very carefully at that bottom crater. Right in the center of the crater, you will see something white that is extremely tall, that casts a long shadow. See it? This was taken, ladies and gentlemen, by Lunar Orbiter 4. Lunar Orbiter 4 had cameras with a resolving power of one mile only. If it was less than one mile in size, the camera could not even photograph it. So everything you see here is at least one mile or more in size. So whatever that is in that crater is over a mile high. Can you imagine that? We're using NASA's own statistics that they have given us. They told us, when we asked them, what is the resolving power of the lenses and the camera on Lunar Orbiter 4, which took this photograph? They said, nothing less than one mile. Look at this. You see those tracks on the moon? This also was taken with Lunar Orbiter 4. Lunar Orbiter 4 cannot resolve anything with its lens less than one mile in size. That's what NASA tells us. Whatever made those tracks is over a mile in size just to be able to see it, which means this is a lot more than one mile. And the arrow is pointing to whatever made the tracks. Are they telling us the truth? They can't be, because this is crap. You understand what I'm saying? They want us to think that there's somebody rolling around up there on the moon. If you ask NASA what this is, they say it's moon rocks shaken loose by lunar quakes. Look at those tracks, ladies and gentlemen. It comes out of a crater, goes across the ridge of a hill at the top, down into another smaller crater, and rolls uphill. Moon rocks, several miles in size, shaken loose by a moon quake that roll uphill. I don't think so. Here you see a crater on the moon, and on the 
close edge, the edge nearest to us, we see something that is anomalous on the edge of that crater. You can't tell what it is, but it doesn't belong there. And you see this all over the moon. Things that should not be there are there. There's nothing that could put itself on the inside rim of a crater like that that was made by the impact of a meteorite or something striking the moon. And you can tell that it's a solid object that is raised above the crater floor on that rim by looking at the shadows in comparison to the shadows in the crater. Can you all see it? Where's my little, uh, I've lost my little laser thing. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, where, oh, where is my laser thing? Hi, baby. Did you hear her say, hi, Bill? <laughs> there it is. I found my laser thing. <clears throat> okay, right there. See that? Now, here's how you determine whether something is a hole or whether it's a bump. If you look at the crater, the sun is coming from over there somewhere, the sunlight. It's falling like this. So the inside of the crater on that side is dark, and on this side it's illuminated. The outside of the crater rim is dark over here. Over here it's illuminated. But this sticks up, and so it's struck by the sun on this side, and there's shadow on the other. Can everybody see that? Okay, now I have a degree in photography, so it's easy for me to determine these things and see things that maybe you have trouble with, so you have to talk to me if you're having problems. This is, see right here? See the tracks? Lunar rocks? shaken loose by lunar quakes. Look at the path of the tracks. It goes in and out of holes, up and down hills. Do you think that's possible? No. Of course not. Here we are again. Lunar tracks on the moon. Where does it end? Right here. With something that throws a shadow, which is what? An obelisk. That is an obelisk. We have found obelisks all over the moon. All over the moon. Now who do you think put those obelisks there? Huh? Are they on the moon? Or are they in these phony photographs? They're in these phony photos, folks. There are no obelisks on the moon. These are fake photographs. Lunar Orbiter 4 could only resolve things that are one mile in size. Now how tall do you think that obelisk is if Lunar Orbiter 4 could only resolve things one mile in size? Which means just to be able to see the thing in its tiniest form, it's got to be one mile in size. Do you believe there are obelisks several miles tall on the surface of the moon? Well, I don't either. What do we have here? You know what? I need somebody to jump up there and right back there, see that opening in the back of the stage? My piece of paper fell down there. I need that piece of paper. It's a yellow piece of paper. 27. Right here on this photograph, you can see some things that don't belong on the moon. Can anybody pick it out? Can anybody see it? Talk up loud. Look right in the center of the photograph. 
Thank you. Anybody see what I'm talking about? Isn't there a cross right there? Flanked on both sides by rectangular and square objects right here. Can everybody see it? What are the odds against a perfect 90 degree right angle occurring in nature? occurring in nature anywhere. How many right angles are in that cross? There are 12 that I can see and that's only if it's a two-dimensional object. If it's a three-dimensional object there are at least 24. Come, if you can't see, there are going to be small things in these pictures, get up here where you belong. And don't complain to me if you can't see, if you insist on staying back there. Get up here, there's plenty of chairs, nobody's going to bite you. Okay? Come on up here and you'll be able to see them clearly. If you want to sit on the floor right in front of the stage, be my guest. I want you to see this, so come up, find a chair, get comfortable. Can you see it right there? Can you see it now? Right there. If it's a two-dimensional flat object, like a piece of paper, there are 12 at least right angles on the cross alone, not counting the rectangular buildings that are on either side of it. It's absolutely impossible does not happen in nature ever. If it's a three-dimensional object, then there are at least 24 right angles on the cross alone, not counting the right angles on these buildings and these buildings over here. Now which is the cross you're talking about? I'm, I'm still lost. Right there. See that cross? It's just like a... Like this? Yeah, a cross, yeah. Oh, all right. I see it now. It's right in the center. Okay. Right the there we the go. Every, anybody else having problems? I want you. I want to help you see this. If you don't see it, come on over here. What is that? A bunch of buildings? Come on over here. Get right in front and look right there. See where I'm pointing? That's about as steady as it gets. Everybody see it? Okay. Now I want you to understand, and if you doubt me, go to as many experts as you want and ask them what the odds are against finding one right angle in nature. And then build it up to the 12 that you can clearly see there if it's a two-dimensional object. And they're going to look at you like you're nuts. And I'm going to tell you right now, we have blown that up even bigger than this, and it is a three-dimensional object, and there are a minimum of 24 right angles on that cross. So NASA wants us to believe that something's on the moon that cannot occur in nature, which means it's got to be built by intelligent beings. And what's the resolving power of Lunar Orbiter 4? one mile. Can you conceive of how big those buildings are? Bigger than anything ever built on this earth by man. If they're really there. This the front side or the back side? <laughs> Near side. Yeah. Now take a look at this. You'll see some more things that are just absolutely incredible. Anybody see anything unusual in this picture? What do you see? What do you see, gang? 
Look in the craters and you will begin to see letters. Yeah, there's letters in some of those craters. It doesn't say anything, they're just letters. Here you can see again tracks on the moon. Photographed by Lunar Orbiter 4. Now look at this. This one comes out of the bottom of a crater. Rolls up to the top of the hill and then down the hill and then across and stops right there. This one comes over here, down inside the rim of a crater, up a hill, and then down a hill, and then up another hill, and stops right there, and throws the shadow of an obelisk. Pardon? I forget what altitude Lunar Orbiter 4 was, but they say that it only had a resolving power of one mile. It was one of the earliest uh, unmanned orbiters that we sent up to orbit the moon. Um, in fact, it was the fourth, the only one that really ever sent back good pictures of the early attempts. Now take a look at this, folks. What is that hovering on the edge of that crater? Anybody know? What is this? It's a crater, but it's not the natural crater of a meteor impact. Pardon? A lunar doodle bug. Nope, not a lunar doodle bug. It's an artificial crater, folks. Look at the craters made by meteors. And then look at that. That's an artificial crater. Who made it? It wasn't a meteor impact. Meteors impacting do not make craters like that. Photos, not all of them. No, what I'm telling you is that I know these photographs have been altered. You don't know that. Okay. I know it because I've studied them. I've compared them to other photographs of the same areas of the moon, taken at other times by other orbiters and things like that. I know that these photographs have been tampered with. What I'm trying to show you is that somebody is trying to make us believe that something's happening on the moon that's not. In other photos and this absolute area right here, those things are not there. Look at this. What is this? What is that, folks? What are these? What's this? Doesn't that look like an airplane junkyard? <coughs> Looks like a bunch of planes all piled up on top of each other. Is it? And what's this right here? See this huge X? Looks like another airplane. Look at this huge X right here. There's one cross, another cross. Okay, now this is a cross, and just like the other one, it's going to have 12 right angles. All crosses have 12 right angles. Two at the end of each arm, and one at each intersecting angle in the center. Now I gotta try to remember what this is. It's 32. Is that 32? Let me. Yes, 32. This is mislabeled. Well, I don't remember what this is. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, I don't remember what this is. There's something in here, but I don't remember what it is. What stuff? I have no idea. But it's it's not anomalous. Is it where the black dot is and all the all the lines come out of the black hole right there? No, I've forgotten what's on here. There's something on here. Some of these sometimes. Pardon? Are you having fun? Do you want to stay here? You keep screwing around with me, you won't be here. Okay? Do you hear what I said? Okay, this was supposed to be the last one. What you're seeing here is something very strange. Whatever made these tracks here entered the crater here and gouged out a portion of the crater's rim. Moved down while it was gouging out the crater's surface, came back, crossed its own track, went up and gouged out another portion there. Can you all see it? Now this would not be significant and you wouldn't be able to tell that this was artificial if it had not crossed its own track. Does everybody see that? You can tell where it entered, came down, came back, crossed its own track, clearly overrode its original path and then went over the rim of the crater and everywhere it entered or exited it took out a portion of the rim. Now this, we don't know, has been tampered with because we've seen these things in, in, in other photographs in the same spot all the time. It's like there was a great excavating machine moving around. These are things that road graders do and things like that. This is the crater Kepler. Kepler was a famous astronomer and this crater was named after him. You can see that this is anomalous. It is not a natural crater that was made by a meteorite. When something impacts the surface of the moon, moving at tremendous speeds, it vaporizes everything and throws material out away from it and leaves a perfectly round crater. What you're seeing here is something that has been artificially created here. How was that done on the moon? When the only thing that can change the moon's surface is the impact of a meteor. They tell us there's no atmosphere, don't they? Well, there can't be wind erosion if there's no atmosphere. If there's no water, there can be no water erosion. Is that correct? We've never seen a volcano on the moon. There's no evidence that there's ever been a volcano on the moon that we can find. So the only other thing would be moon quakes, and this does not look like the production of a quake. This row here, when you examine under high magnification, are four round somethings directly in a row. This comes down here, and there is what appears to be a wall or a, an abutment here. There's no proof that it's made as a wall intentionally. You just can't tell. It's just not normal. It's not natural. Here you see again the tracks made by objects on the moon that come up out of craters. Can everybody see that? You have even illumination from the sun on the moon. So that deep shadow area is inside a crater. They came up out of a crater. So they're not rocks broken loose by moonquakes. What are they? I don't know. Again, and we do this so that you can see that it came out of the NASA publication, Lunar Orbiter 4, 
page 73, I think that is. And you can go get that book and find this same photograph on that same page. And it's official NASA photograph. Why do we insist on doing this? Because when I first started, I wasn't that careful, and people told me I faked the photographs. So I have to do this. So that you can go get those same photographs out of those same books and make sure that I'm telling the truth because that's what you need to do because I could be lying to you. Oh, wow. Now this is very interesting because right at the base of that cliff is an object that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight right angles and that's if it's a two-dimensional object. Can that occur in nature? No. no. If it can't occur in nature, can it occur on the moon? No. no. So it's artificial. It's either on the moon, put there by somebody who can make right angles, or it's a fake photograph. Here you can see a pyramid right here. And it's not too far from what I just showed you, which is right there. These are in the crater Copernicus. Oh, I forgot to show you something else. Right over here, you see that? It's a huge cross, like a Christian cross. There's a tall spire, and right at the top, there's a cross. Over here is a tower. These were all taken by Lunar Orbiter 4. See that tower right there? Miles high. Miles. This is uh, Kepler up here that I showed you. This is, these are the tracks. This is nothing. I mean, it's something, but we're not concerned with it. There's a, a close-up macro photography of whatever it is that makes the tracks. This is an antenna rising straight up out of the lunar surface. Where does that come from? Right here on Earth. How do you like that? Just think how many miles that's got to be. But we don't know that this was taken with Lunar Orbiter 4. This came out of Space Images, which is the art book, that these people took official NASA photographs and published them in that book as art. Anybody see anything artistic about this? It's like a radio tower. NASA just will tell you that it's uh, anomalies on the lunar surface and it's boulders uh, shaken loose by uh, moon quakes and are, are, are you crazy or, are you, or something. They will not admit that there's anything there. I, I heard or read one time that when the, one of the missions they made up there that they set off some detonations on the surface of the moon. They did. They measured it and they claimed that it was hollow from what I read. Well, I never heard that NASA claimed that it was hollow. I've heard other people say that it was hollow based upon those explosions. But NASA has never said that. Uh, what is this? Oh, yeah. This is another one with the, uh, the antenna. This was made from right there. What appears to be an antenna. I don't know that it's an antenna. It just looks like an antenna. This is really interesting. You know what this is, folks? It's like a choo-choo train. It looks like a choo-choo train, doesn't it? Because those are puffs of smoke or vapor coming out of vents in the moon's surface. Every place, there's a vent there, 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 and there. And what's coming out of these vents is some kind of smoke or vapor. Now, is it possible to have vents in a straight line like that in nature? Yes, it is, as a matter of fact. If the Earth's crust is moving over an active volcano zone, you will get a line of craters that are in a straight line. That can occur. But 
if we're talking about the moon and there's no atmosphere on the moon, can you have clouds of vapor like that? Can you? No. Because the vacuum of space would suck that vapor out of that hole and dissipate it. Immediately there would be no cloud, no puff, and these have to be tremendous in size, don't they? So, if those are really on the moon, then there has to be an atmosphere on the moon, doesn't there? What would be proof of an atmosphere on the moon? Water. If you find water on the moon, that means there has to be an atmosphere or water could not stay there. It would dissipate into the vastness of space. It would just dissipate and become a part of space. Didn't they just recently announce that there's water on the moon? that they found water on the moon. Didn't NASA publicly release that just recently? The answer is yes, that they did. They said that they have found water on the moon and ice on the moon. And I'm telling you right now, there cannot be water or ice on the moon unless there's an atmosphere on the moon. If there's an atmosphere on the moon, then what we're looking at could be actually on the moon. Pardon? No, that was the moon, the Earth's moon. They've always known for many, many years that there is water on the moon of Jupiter known as Europa. Here's another proof that flying saucers are not in the realm of fantasy, nor do they have to belong to extraterrestrials. When they announced this, they had been using it in secret for many, many years. It's not a new development. So they've been using battlefield flying saucers as remote controlled vehicles for reconnaissance. I have seen these flying all over the Tickaboo Valley in Nevada. Just six or seven feet above the ground. Sometimes they follow me around, Are they silent? and they take pictures of me, and these guys know where I'm at all over the time. Are they silent? Yeah, I absolutely. Saw, I saw one of them in the absolutely silent. I drove right up on it. I turned my lights off. The smallest I've seen is six feet in diameter. I've never seen any smaller than that. I've seen, I've seen ones larger. Pardon? Why would I shoot one? Pardon? They don't want you in that valley finding out what they have. They want to know where you're at. They don't want you going in and photographing things inside the installation. But I've done it. See, I've been going there for many years before anybody knew the existence of this place because I found out about it in 1971 when I was on the briefing team for Admiral Clary. So long before anybody ever heard of 50, Area 51 or even thought that it, it even might exist somewhere in the world, I was making trips out there taking pictures. Most of those pictures nobody's ever seen, simply because if I show those pictures, they'll know that I've been in places that are restricted, and you're not supposed to be in those places. That's just an extension of that same article. Whoa! 1961! They said they found water geysers on the moon. Houston. NASA. Press release. Ten miles of water clouds around the Apollo instrument. from the Santa Ana Register, October 16th, 1971, NASA press release. Now, why would they be faking all this stuff and trying to make us think that extraterrestrials are coming here? Anybody read the report from Iron Mountain? You should. Those of you who have read it probably know the answer. The re
Ooh. Space research can be viewed as the nearest modern equivalent yet devised to the pyramid building and similar ritualistic enterprises of ancient societies. It is true that the scientific value of the space program, even of what has already been accomplished, is substantial on its own terms, but current programs are absurdly and obviously disproportionate to the relationship of the knowledge sought to the expenditure committed. All but a small fraction of the space budget measured by the standards of comparable scientific objectives must be charged de facto to the military economy. Future space research projected as a war surrogate, in other words, replacement for war, would further reduce the scientific rationale of its budget to a minuscule percentage indeed. Here you'll see credibility in fact lies at the heart of the problem of developing a political substitute for war. This is where the space race proposals in many ways so well suited to economic substitutes for war fall short. The most ambitious and unrealistic space project cannot of itself generate a believable external menace. It has been hotly argued that such a menace would offer the last best hope of peace, etc., by uniting mankind against the danger of destruction by creatures from other planets or from outer space. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-of-our-world invasion threat. It is possible that a few of the more difficult to explain flying saucer incidents of recent years were in fact early experiments of this kind. I'm telling you right now, that's exactly what they are, were, and are going to be in the near future. Where was Roswell at? 509th Bomber Wing. What was the 509th Bomb Wing? The people in the Air Force who had the highest security clearances in the nation had dropped the bomb on Japan, felt tremendously guilty about all of the people that they had killed, and so were ripe for somebody to come along and say, let's fake a flying saucer crash, we'll get some monkeys, and shave their hair off, chop off their ears and their nose, do a little surgical invention, intervention intervention, sprinkle their bodies on the desert, and let some people take a quick glimpse, and then we'll say the whole thing never happened. And at that exact same time, what was the government trying to do? They had created the United Nations in 1945. The headlines of all the papers across the country were blaring about the United Nations becoming a world government, debating whether it should have its own armed forces and police force, and the American people weren't going to buy it. They needed an external threat. So they invented one. And it wasn't hard to produce UFOs from outer space from the super secret technology that they were developing out in the deserts of the West. All they had to do was take off and fly around so people could see it. The face on Mars. There it is, folks. And just to the left of the face on Mars over here, you see a whole bunch of pyramids. Now, if we know NASA's faking photographs, why in the world should we believe what they tell us is on Mars? You show me one fake photograph and tell me it's your family and I find out it's some woman living in Hoboken, New Jersey and never heard of you before. What makes you think I'm going to believe it when you show me a picture of your grandma and grandpa? There it is, the face on Mars. Now, look up here. You ever see a square crater? <laughs> Must have been made by a square meteorite. Look at this arrow. It's all the black dots. The black dots, they, NASA tells us, is where the transmission of the picture fell out and being transmitted from Mars back to the Earth. There are dots that weren't filled in by the transmission. Now, 
NASA tells us that the atmosphere on Mars exists, but it's only 2% of the Earth's atmosphere. Then why does NASA have on its books plans for a Mars plane? If the atmosphere around Mars is only 2% of the atmosphere around Earth, no plane, I don't care how they built it, could fly in such an atmosphere. Yet this is an official NASA photograph of the Mars plane that they have planned to send to Mars to fly around in its atmosphere and take pictures and all of that kind of stuff. Again, there's a face on Mars to the left of the pyramids. This is all that stuff that What's-His-Name is talking about. What is his name? I've forgotten. Richard Hoagland, that's right. Now, if all of these pictures are real, then all of his theories could be valid. But if these are fake pictures, then everything he says is based upon a lie. Is he a part of it? I don't know. Don't even care. Mars photographs which appear to have the remains of agricultural terracing. This is supposed to make us believe that at one time on Mars there was a tremendously successful civilization that had developed to the stage where they perfected agricultural terracing in order to feed the populations of their civilization. For years, when I made up this, these slides, NASA had been denying that there was anything called an aurora. So had the Air Force and everyone else. We now know that it exists. They've admitted it. So this is a moot point here. Now, let me give you some food for thought here. If you think I'm full of baloney, and if you think these people haven't been around for a long time, this 1917, upon a visit by the Imperial Japanese delegation headed by Viscount Ishii, John Dewey, the author of our extremely destructive educational system, destructive to the minds of our young people, said this in a speech at the dinner for Viscount Ishii and the Imperial Japanese mission. Quote, Someone remarked that the best way to unite all the nations on this globe would be an attack from some other planet. In the face of such an alien enemy, people would respond with a sense of their unity of interest and purpose. 1917, John Dewey was a member of the Illuminati. There it is, blown up so you can read it for yourself. Years later, during the Reagan administration, Reagan said on at least eight different occasions the exact same thing that John Dewey said in 1917. And you heard one of them on that tape. This is one here. Remarks of the president to Falston High School students and faculty. Falston High School, Falston, Maryland, December 4th, 1985. This is what he said. I couldn't, but one point in our discussion privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but to say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held. If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries, and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. <coughs> is this what's going on? Does anybody know who that is? That's the creature from the Black Lagoon. Remember that movie? That's him. He doesn't look so fierce. I think he looks kind of neat. Myself, friendly, cuddly, cute little feller. He's just looking for love. <laughs> this is the, up in the upper left is the city of Tonopah, Nevada. 
to the right and down are portions of the desert where some of this testing takes place and at the lower right corner you'll see part of the Nellis test range. Here you see a huge expanse of the Nevada desert where they test these things and just see that writing that slants up like this toward the top right? It says Saucer Mesa. We were going over the geodetic, coast and geodetic survey maps of the area. We found Saucer Mesa. And that's, you know, I'm just pointing that out. And we don't know what it means. It could be innocent. There might be a mesa there that looks like a saucer. But in light of what they're testing out there, it's logical that it's named for something else. This is a letter sent to me by someone who worked out there, who saw crates labeled Project Red Light, and who saw the craft fly. Another one, same stuff. You read it, they're telling me. And you see, I go by things that they say in their letter and dates that they give me that I can cross-check from other sources and determine whether or not they're telling me the truth. These people are telling the truth. They really did work out there. They really did see these things fly. They really knew what they were talking about. It was ultimately based upon these letters. A couple of years later, I went out there, snuck into the test, fight, the test site, and actually took photographs of, of these things hovering in daylight above the flight line. This is the Nevada test site, and you can see Where is it now? I believe it's right down. That's Groom Dry Lake right there. Down here is Papoose Lake. You can read all you want from Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar is full of crap. He never worked in Area 51. He never worked in Papoose Lake. He never was a physicist at Alamogordo at all. Bob Lazar was in the phone book at Alamogordo under the physics department his name is listed but he was not a physicist he has a contract with Alamogordo or not Alamogordo but the uh, trying to think of the name of the laboratory Los Alamos he has a contract with Los Alamos National Laboratory with the physics department to develop the film from the dosimeter badges to tell whether anybody has been exposed to radiation. That's why his name was in that phone book. Bob Lazar is a liar, one of the biggest liars that's ever walked upon the face of this earth. He has never ever worked in Area 51 or Papoose Lake. He never saw flying saucers, never worked on back engineering or anything else. This is, uh, what, what is, oh yeah, this is uh, Highway 93, take a little jog here, go over Hancock Summit, down to, this is Highway 375, zip across here, this is the Tickaboo Valley, this is Groom Dry Lake, everything takes place over here, over this valley, and up in this area up here, if you go out there. That's Groom Dry Lake. There are underground tunnels which go to other government and military installations. We have marked two of those tunnels on this map. You're not going to see the tunnels, they're underground. This is a satellite photograph of Area 51. We went to the United States government, asked them if there was anything there, and if there was, what was it? They said there's nothing there, period. It's just a dry lake bed and desert. The United States Air Force said the same thing. There's nothing out there, dry lake bed and desert. There is no such thing as Area 51, period. So we went to the Russians and got satellite photographs. Now what does that tell you? Who are they hiding it from? If they tell me it doesn't exist and they know damn well the Russians have photographs of it, who are they hiding it from? From me, not the Russians. They know about it. That's who we got these photographs from. And 
This is the Groom Dry Lake Area 51 facility, taken by Russian satellite. That is a landing strip. It's one of the longest landing strips in the world. It's over 35,000 feet long. Uh, I used to know, I don't remember. Again, satellite photograph. Now at the time that this photograph was taken, afterwards, after these photographs had been taken, they have extended the runway even farther than what it is there. I can't hear you. Groom Dry Lake, they started construction uh, to our knowledge in 1954, <coughs> right about the time that they begin to perfect this anti-gravity and electromagnetic drive stuff and begin to classify it and make sure that nobody ever wrote about it again. They also developed the U-2 here and the SR-71 and a lot of other secret aircraft were developed and test flown from Groom Dry Lake. They have one of every kind of MiG that the Russians have ever developed at Area 51. It's another photograph from satellite. No. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. <laughs> This is another Soviet satellite photograph of the Groom Dry Lake facility. Pardon? Yeah, they're gigantic tunnels. Yeah, they have huge tunnel boring machines that the American public is generally not aware of, yeah. These are some of the facilities and they're, what they actually are that we've been able to identify. Is that runway incline, not level? No, it's level. Text or remarks by the President to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations, New York, New York, September 21st, 1987. In our obsession with an antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside, listen to what he says, perhaps, and he's talking to the United Nations, remember this. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Is this what's happening? You start reading New Age publications and they tell you that the benevolent space brothers are here to help us. And, uh, you know, if everything falls apart, they're going to pick up the best people in the world, the good New Age people, and take them aboard their flying saucers and whisk them away to their planet. Are you kidding me? Somebody from another planet came here and took one look at what we're doing on this Earth. You think they'd take us back to their planet? Huh? Not a chance. Is this what it is? Or is this what's happening? <laughs> Are those aliens a decoy for something much more terrible? You better bet your life they are. I don't know. I found this in a magazine and decided to take a picture of it. I thought it was great. I don't even remember what magazine it was. It was a long, long time ago. And that's the end of that trick. We just got a few more slides to go here. Okay, lights again. 
Here's one of the best photographs of a UFO flying saucer type craft that I've ever seen. The guy who took this was on vacation in Hawaii. Do you think he was looking at the UFO? No, he was looking at those beautiful hula dancers and that's all he cared about. He didn't even know that he had taken a picture of a UFO until months later when he was going through his pictures and just happened to look away from the girls and see it. He never knew it was there. This is what it is. That is a genuine photograph of a real UFO. It is not a fake. And the guy didn't even know he had it. Yeah, his wife was there too. She really was there. Pardon? I don't know if they showed it on the news or not. Now, here's something extremely interesting. Don't they tell us that Venus, the planet Venus, is covered with huge, miles thick, dense clouds of chemicals and acid and all kinds of vapors and, and that the surface of Venus is extremely hot. No life could live on it. Don't they tell us that? Well, this is a radar, a cloud-penetrating radar map of Venus. That's what they tell us. They sent an orbiter up there that had cloud-penetrating radar, and they tell us this is what the surface of Venus looks like. And look how they try to perpetuate the hole at the pole theory with that silly little dimple up there. My father's flown across the poles, folks. He's a pilot. He's brought back pictures of the North Pole and the South Pole from his flights. He was at one time with the United States Air Force Weather Service and that was his job, was to fly into the places of the world with the worst weather and make scientific uh, recordings of temperature and wind and all that kind of stuff. There are no holes at the poles, I can assure you. So all that hollow earth stuff is bunch of bunk. Yeah, that's what it says. But that's not what the lunatic fringe picks up. What they pick up is that there's a hole in the pole of Venus and they're trying to hide it by saying that they couldn't scan it. I'm, I'm not kidding you. That's what they say. I've heard them. I get letters from them. Bill, this is proof that there's a hole at the pole in Venus. So the hollow earth theory is correct. I write back and say, no, the orbiter couldn't cover that area of the planet. And it's just a place where they didn't map. No, no, they're just saying that because they don't want us to know there's a hole at the pole. <laughs> No. Huh? Now look at this. If they're correct about Venus being covered with thick, dense clouds of chemicals and gases and vapors so that they couldn't photograph the surface from space, they had to radar map it, how did the Russian Venera space probe land on the surface of Venus and take this picture of its own leg sitting on the surface of Venus? Can anybody explain that to me? I can't explain it either. Neither can NASA and neither can the Russians. Here's another two views. The surface and portions of the lander taken by the lander on the surface and the radar mapped image of the supposed surface of Venus. This is Neil Armstrong stepping down upon the lunar surface for the first time. Anybody tell me who took that picture? Anybody here? Tell me who took this picture? <laughs> Official NASA photograph. Nobody was on the moon. Who took this picture? Official NASA photographer. <laughs> well, you are right. It's an official NASA photographer who took this picture in a studio somewhere in the Mercury test site of Nevada where they made all of the damn pictures. 
Check this out, folks. This is really hilarious. <laughs> folks, all of the light on the moon comes from one source, doesn't it? The sun, right? How come the whole surface of the moon isn't equally illuminated? This is a studio photograph made with spots. Now look again, look here, look directly in the center of his faceplate, you'll see the other astronaut. There was only two of them. The other astronaut supposedly took the picture. If you blow that up, you'll see he has no camera. No camera whatsoever. You can also see the shadow in the faceplate going toward the astronaut who supposedly took the picture who's directly in front of him and you can see his shadow on the moon going somewhere else which means the picture in the faceplate is artificially inserted this is as fake as it comes folks and you don't have to have a photography degree to see it I'll tell you something else about the moon in space, the sun and the stars are so bright, ladies and gentlemen. Illumination is even over everything. There are no dark and light, except in shadow. When they did this, they had no latitude in the best film that we could produce. Exposure had to be perfect. So if those cameras exposed to see detail where the light is hitting, you would see absolutely nothing in the shadow because the film had no latitude. If you're exposed to get some detail in the shadow, all of the places where the light hit would be totally washed out. You wouldn't see anything. It would be overexposed. This is a studio shot made by a professional photographer who set up the lights so that he could get an even exposure and detail in the light and the shadow. Yes? You've got to talk real loud. Yeah. And something about you could see a building in the background. <laughs> it's all fake. The Apollo moon landings were faked. All of the film, video, and pictures that they have shown the public are fake. They're phony. And it's easy to find out. Look at the shadows. Look at the difference between the light and the dark areas. Could not possibly capture that on film. Not only that, folks. But look at the shadow that he's casting on the surface of the moon. How come you can't see anything there? Because somebody is standing over here with a fill card. If you're a photographer, you know what that is. It's just a white sheet of cardboard that reflects some of the light back into the shadows of the astronaut, but they're not bothering to reflect any down onto the shadow that he's casting from the spotlight behind him onto the artificial ground that they've got there. I have no idea, but they didn't accomplish it the way they said they did, if they've accomplished anything, or with the vehicles or the spacesuits that they say they've accomplished them with. Have you seen orbit our planet? Yeah, we can orbit our planet. But with the vehicles that they say have gone to the moon, they couldn't even get through the Van Allen belt. The Van Allen belt is so radioactive that those craft that they say they went to the moon in do not have enough protection to shield them from that radiation. Period. Besides the temperature up there is hot. You better believe it. 2,500 degrees. You can send unmanned vehicles anywhere you want, yeah. 2,500 miles. The problem is getting a man out there. The problem is just getting a man through the Van Allen belt that surrounds the Earth without making crispy critters out of them from the radiation. Aviation Week and Space Technology. This was uh, November 21st, 19 what, 88? 
This is the text page of an ad that appeared in there. An Amico ad about oil. There's nothing in this ad that would suggest that the facing page, a part of this ad, would be this cute little fellow. We called Amico and we asked them, where'd this come from? It's a neat ad. We really like it. We want to compliment you. Where did you get the model? Oh, it's a 12-inch high statue that we had an artist make. But it's not. This is not a photograph of a 12-inch high statue, even though they say it is. And I'm going to show you why. If anybody that wants to can get up there as close as you can, you can see hair. You ever seen the hair on a baby's butt? Real fine, silky hair almost microscopic. Go up there and look. It's on his neck. It's on the neck of this thing, the same hair. You see it? Yeah, it's there. This is not a 12 inch high model of anything. Whatever this is, is much more complicated than any model. You see it? Barely, but it's, it's there, there, right? There. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be smooth. Anybody back here want to come up and look before I switch the slide? If you do, come and look now. Get up close, Seth. Right on the neck, where it's sunny, where it's lit up. See it? Is it there? See, folks, I wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Let me ask you again, was it there? It was there. You heard it, right from the horse's mouth. Look at this, look at the detail on the head. Look at the moisture in the eye. Look at the folds of the eye. No, I'm not going backwards, I'm only going one way. You wanna see it real quick? Jump up there, get up there, hurry. Hurry up, go. Anybody else? Real quick. You see the hair on the neck? You think an artist could produce hair like that on a 12 inch high model? No, they lied to us. Could they produce hair like that on a 12 foot model? Maybe. Maybe. But you're going to see there's not much phony about this. Look at the moisture in the eye. Look at the little folds around the eye. Look at the detail in the skin, the lips. Look at the creases on the neck. Why would they put that in the magazine and tell you that it was a photograph I don't know. of a model? That's the question. Why would they do it? It has nothing to do with Amico or oil. Why is it even in the ad? It has nothing to do with the text on the page that I showed you. If you read it, it had absolutely nothing to do with it. They just put it in there. Look at the moisture and the mucus inside the nose. Look at the lines and the bags under the eyes. Now, if I had to make a bet, folks, I would bet that this is something they created in the laboratory and it's alive. If I had to make a bet. I don't think, in 1988, they could make anything this realistic that wasn't. I just don't believe it. I've never seen a monster in any movie that looked real to me. This looks real to me. They can do some fantastic things in movies, can't they? But I've never seen one, ever, that looked real like this looks. Now, I'm not telling you that this is alive or this is real. I am telling you that they have genetic laboratories across this country where they are experimenting on cloning and on creating life different from life as we know it. and where they have been experimenting on the human genome to identify all the genes 
I also know that all over this country there have been mysterious cattle mutilations where portions of cattle have been taken in the middle of the night, mysteriously, and some of the things that have been taken have been cow's eyes. Does that look like a human eye? No. Does it look like a cow's eye? Sure looks like a cow's eye to me. Is it? I don't know. And I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying this is really weird. <clears throat> Who's this character? Jacques Vallée. How many of you have heard of Jacques Vallée? One of the great wizards of ufology. I call it ufology. He's identifying himself here as a member of the Illuminati. As his portrait was taken, he put his eye in the triangle. He's saying, I am one of the elect few. I am Illuminati. Oh, this is Dr. Uh, Kurzweil, Stephen Kurzweil. He called me up one time and said, Bill, you're never going to believe this. I said, well, first place, tell me who, who, who are you? I don't even know who you are. He said, I'm a dentist, or excuse me, a doctor in New York City. And I was recruited by Bud Hopkins, who's one of the so-called well-known abductee researchers who writes books about this stuff to be a member of a research team to record the progression of mind control experiments on people to make them think they've been abducted by aliens. And the guy that recruited me is Bud Hopkins, who's identified himself to me and shown me his identification as being an agent of the Central Intelligence Agency. And I said, well, did, you know, are you going to do it? He said, well, I already did it. And when I saw how these people were being treated, and then just dumped out in the street, not knowing what happened to them, and having their minds all screwed up by these people, I objected, and now they're trying to take my medical license away. So he sent me all the paperwork for the Medical Board of New York City and all this kind of stuff, and the testimony and everything, and uh, I investigated it, and I sent a whole stack of research that I had to the Medical Board, and sent them a copy of my book and we managed to save this man's license and prove that Bud Hopkins is a member of the Central Intelligence Agency. And there's Stephen Kurzweil's affidavit and this is all on record in the state of New York for anybody who wants to investigate it. Read that. <laughs> it's incredible. And it just verifies what I wrote in my book that everybody at the top of the pyramid in the ufology movement are all Central Intelligence Agency operatives, including Stanton T. Friedman, Bruce McAbee, who has already admitted after I named him as a CIA agent, and everybody said, Bill Cooper's full of crap, he's calling everybody CIA. Bruce McAbee then admitted that on a regular basis he gave briefings to the higher echelon of the Central Intelligence Agency on what's happening in the UFO movement. John Lear has admitted that he has been a member of the Central Intelligence Agency for most of his life, flew drugs for Air America in and out of the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia, and still works for a CIA proprietary airlines based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And on and on and on and on and on. I could go on and on and on. It's incredible. Ah, this is, uh, what's this? Oh, this is verification of something I wrote in my book. This guy sent me a letter. And he verified that when he was in the Air Force, he also saw the message from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which ordered all members of the Armed Forces not to take any further orders from the White House. That was during the Nixon coup. Only it wasn't Nixon taking over. The Joint Chiefs of Staff took over, cut off all communications to the White House, 
ordered all military units not to accept any orders from the White House, and then they just went in and told Nixon to resign. Nixon had no choice. He couldn't even call up anybody to help him, because who controls the communications for the White House? The military. I was the first one who told the world that that had happened. There's another guy who came out and told his story. It's in my book. That was Randall Terpstra. And then I got the letter from uh, Mr. Uh, David Jones here, and is signed by two witnesses down on the bottom that he saw the same thing. And since then, there's been others who've come forth. But Nixon didn't resign. That was a military coup. Yeah. Ford's a 33rd degree Freemason. You all know that, right? If you didn't, you do now. Not that we, we can't find any proof that Nixon was a Freemason. We can find proof that he was CFR and all this other stuff. I threw this in here because I keep hearing this stuff that I'm just one lonely, helpless human being. There's nothing I can do. I don't have any money, I gotta support my family. And then I have other people who come up and say, Bill, do you have any heroes? There's my hero. It's my hero. My hero, I love that man. He is an example of what a hero really is. That's Tiananmen Square. One lonely, solitary, helpless, broke, enslaved individual had the guts to stop 17 of the biggest, most terrifying, most dangerous killing machines that have ever been built in the history of the world by himself. Can you imagine how lonely and how scared he is standing there? He's my hero. He's not even an American. He's a Chinese boy. Pardon? Who knows? But they didn't. Maybe they were as impressed by him as I am. Of course. You think they would let him get away with that? They threw him in prison. Why did they stop and not run over him and squish him? They were probably embarrassed and just as impressed by his bravery as I am. Warriors are impressed by bravery. I was impressed by the bravery of the Viet Cong when I fought in Vietnam. I couldn't believe that they were doing what they were doing when we had the weapons that we had. And they're running around with a little pouch of rice on their belt and sandals made out of tires with a little pith helmet on their head when they had it. And most of the times they didn't unless they were North Vietnamese regular army. And an AK-47 and a few bullets in a pouch. They impressed the hell out of me. I was impressed. I'm still impressed by what they did. God, I had a $500,000 patrol boat under me. I had three 50 caliber machine guns, a 3.5 inch rocket launcher. I had an 81 millimeter mortar. I had Honeywell grenade launchers, shotguns, M16s. We had so many guns, we never used half of them. And these guys are running on, taking us on at close range on a riverbank with no protection whatsoever. Because they believed in what they were doing. That's why I know we can win the war that's coming. Because you can't beat someone who's not afraid to die and believes in what they're doing. And we're going to be facing troops that are only doing it for a paycheck and the promise of a retirement. Mercenaries. Mercenaries don't fight when they start to experience casualties and the casualties outweigh the value of the paycheck and the promised retirement that will never come if I get lucky.
And I'm a damn good shot, so I know I'm going to be lucky a lot of times before they get me. I don't have any illusions that they won't get me. But I'm going to get enough of them that they're going to wish that I was never born before they do get me. Yes? Do you think Ho Chi Minh, uh, I, I've always kind of admired him, but do you think he's part of the plan too? you think he was a game player, or you think he was really someone who was squeezed out? Ho Chi Minh would have been on our side if we had not snubbed our nose at Ho Chi Minh our best and had not done what we promised him. See, we promised Ho Chi Minh during World War II. He fought with us against the Japanese. We promised him that we would help him liberate his country and that they would be a free country and have their own elections and their own government. We double-crossed him and gave it back to the French. And he said, screw you, I'll get help from wherever I can get it, and I'll be whatever gives me that help. And Russia said, we're, your, we're, we're yours. What do you need? He didn't ask for much. No, he didn't ask for much. He wanted to be free, just like me. Just like me. That's something we never understood. What the hell were we doing there? Had nothing to do with the Constitution or freedom or this country. Nothing at all had to do with big business and world politics between nations and deals we knew nothing about. We were just cannon fodder. That's all. Cannon fodder. And some Vietnam vets get mad at me about that. But you see, I'm a Vietnam vet. I can say whatever the hell I want. I was there. I fought. I earned my right to talk about it. We were lied to, misused, and abused. If you want to pretend that what we did was heroic and wonderful, you go ahead and do that. Me, I don't like lying to myself. It's just not true. Most soldiers who ever fought in the history of the world were used, abused, and were cannon fodder, thinking they were doing the right thing. We all thought we were doing the right thing. We had noble aspirations when we went. Like I told you before, nobody sets out to do wrong. They believe in what they're doing and they wouldn't be doing it. That's right, we were all young boys, stupid young boys. Me, about as stupid as they get. Yeah. This is what? I need lights off. This is a b -b 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 introduction to the initiating group. Oh, let me see, what is it? Oh, this is from the Rand Corporation. They were, it's about a colloquium that they got together to do, the greatest scientists in the country, in cahoots with the United States government. And they put together from May 13th, 1958 to April 25th, 1959, the Proceedings of the Lunar and Planetary Exploration Colloquium. It lasted for a year. And it was sort of uh, organized and overseen by the RAND Corporation. Proceedings of Lunar and Planetary Exploration Colloquium, October, this is from October 20-something, 1958, Volume 1, Number 2. I have stacks and stacks of volumes from this. I just want to show you a few things. Isn't it strange that they tell us that there uh, it's hard to focus this. Oh, this is what I'm looking for. It says uh, power for a lunar colony. Where to land on the moon? Observation on Mars and Venus. I didn't even know we had any observations up there on Mars and Venus at that time. But apparently they did. Program of lunar and planetary experiments. And for some reason they considered the crater Line to be extremely important. could be. And this is just another thing from that Flying Saucer article. And that's it. Did you ever 
One of the strange things I thought I brought, I thought I had it in this slide tray, but I didn't. In, in one of the uh, contents of one of these colloquium proceedings, they talk about the atmosphere on the moon, which is something they've always denied. But that group of scientists didn't deny it. It was listed right in the proceedings that they were studying the atmosphere of the moon. So that's that. What time is it? We all need a break at this time, I think. Toast. Damn blue. Glue? The blue that Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to give you a choice. There is no limit to how long we can keep this room. I have two videotapes, one of which we're going to end with. Both are two hours long. Let me tell you what they are. And but before we start, I'm going to let you ask questions if you want for a little while. And then if you want to see the videotape, whichever one we decide by popular vote to see, the ones who want to see it can stay and watch it. Anybody who needs to leave can go ahead and leave. Okay? So, <clears throat> we'll take the vote now. And then we'll have a short question and answer session. For any of you who may have any questions on anything that we've talked about today or yesterday, that I might be able to answer for you. And I can't answer everything. I don't know everything, but I'll try. Okay? We have two videotapes. One is a two-hour tape that I made for researchers. It's not an entertainment tape. At some parts, it sort of drags out because it's to give information to researchers who want information about Area 51. It's called Project Red Light 2. You saw a part of Project Red Light. Not the whole thing, but Project Red Light 2 is the second one that I made about Groom Lake. It has an awful lot of uh, essential footage in it for people who are just interested in researching Groom Dry Lake. has a lot of videotape of the craft in flight, both at night and at the end, one huge craft that you saw at the beginning of Project Red Light 1, hovering over the desert and actually moving off into a cloud. It's a different filming of the same craft at a different time under different circumstances, but it's the only footage like it of its kind. And you'll see the whole area. You'll even see Groom Dry, Dry Lake. Yes, baby. You'll even see Groom Dry Lake filmed from the top of what we call Whitesides Daddy. Mountain, which the Air Force has Daddy. now... Yes, baby. Daddy. Hi. Daddy. Want to say something? I won't. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, you can't take those pictures anymore because the Air Force has seized that mountain. You can't get up there and you can't take the picture. The other one is what we call the last will and testament of the Branch Davidians. And everybody on that videotape is now dead except for one black woman who lives in England now. Most people don't know that the Branch Davidians made a videotape <coughs> while they were under siege inside Mount Carmel while they were surrounded by tanks and armored personnel vehicles and uh, the, the, the might of the establishment that was reigned against them. You can see their wounds and listen to them in their own voice, tell why they're there and what they're doing and why they're not going to come out. <coughs> the American public was never supposed to see this videotape. It was made by the Branch Davidians for the FBI. 
to prove that nobody was being held in there against their will like the FBI was telling the world. Remember they said Koresh is holding them all hostage and won't let them come out? Well, that's a lie. And it's about two hours long. And all of the Branch Davidians who are alive at that point, including the children, get in front of the camera and tell their story. So you got your choice. We could do either one of those two, and you can vote on it right now. Okay? How many of you want to see Project Red Light 2? One, two, three, four, five. How many of you want to see the Branch Davidians? Okay, that's the one we'll see, and that's a good choice. That's the one I was hoping that you would make because it's much more important. Okay? Before we start that videotape, if anybody has any questions, this is the time to get it out because when this tape ends, after two hours after it starts, I'm exhausted from doing this for two days. And if you don't think this is exhausting, try standing up and talking for six hours to people two days in a row. So after this tape is over, I don't want to stick around and have questions from people. What I want to do is take my family to dinner and go to bed. Because I have a long drive tomorrow, okay? So I don't mean it as an insult or, or a slant against anybody, and I'm not brushing you off. It, it, what I'm telling you is true. I'm really tired, okay? And I have problems with my legs anyway. So if you have questions, let's get them out now. I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability, and then we'll go to the tape. Yes, in the back. What kind of solution can you offer to this mess? <laughs> the first solution to our biggest problem. What at first, what is our biggest problem? Lack of knowledge. The vast numbers of American people are ignorant. They don't know what's happening. The number one solution and the biggest goal we have in front of us right now is to educate them, get them information, but not like people normally do it. How are people normally getting information to the American people? They're getting stuff on the facts and over the phone and they're hearing it on the radio and they're just repeating it and passing it on. Is it true? 95% of it we have already proven we know is false. That's got to stop. We have to educate them with the truth. Things that we can document and back up. And if we can't, we have to tell them we can't. Be honest. If it's opinion, say, this is my opinion. Okay, like I do. You've all heard me do these things. If I can prove it, I tell you. If I can't, I tell you. If it's my opinion, I tell you. I don't leave you sitting there guessing. <laughs> and you shouldn't do that to other people either. And if you get something, if you don't know it's true, don't pass it on. Period. Don't do it. If I can verify things, so can you. I'm no different than you. I'm one lonely, broke, solitary human being with a family that I have to support. I'm no different than anybody. My brain is no bigger. Okay? Whatever I can do, you can do. Somebody tells you you can't do it, laugh at them and point to me. And say, if he can do it, I can do it, because I'm as smart as he is. And it's the truth. You just don't know it half the time. <laughs> People don't tell you that in high school. They tell you, well, you got to learn your ABCs and at least learn a little bit of reading so you can get a job working for somebody else. They don't tell you, learn all this stuff so you can go out and start a corporation and be all that you can be without joining the Marine Corps or the Army or the Navy. They don't tell you that, but that's what they should be telling you if they were worth their salt as educators. Yes, ma'am. The uh, Chinese Navy being down there, I mean, Long Beach Naval Shipyard. They're not going to be in Long Beach Naval Shipyard. No? No. The lease was torn up, withdrawn, thrown away. And, and is, is there any other areas besides that that they're doing that? Yeah, both ends of the Panama Canal. They have agreements to put in a big, huge, multi-billion shopping center in Southern California and a whole lot of other things. Clinton is a communist. He's opening this country to communism because that's his job. Yes? Where did the religions uh, concerning Isis and Osiris originate from in what geographic region? Well, if you're talking about Osiris and Isis, that's Egyptian. 
but they didn't originate it. It originated somewhere else under a different name. Babylon, and what was it called there? Nimrod. And Semiramis. And who was the child? Tammuz. And it's the exact same story. Exactly the same. They have them all over the world. Same exact story. Different names. Same story. Yes, ma'am. The disappearance of that, that A-10 bomber. Um, the bomber's been found and the body of the pilot has been found. They can't bring it out yet. So they say. Pardon? So they say. Unless I can prove otherwise, they've said that they found it and I have no reason to believe otherwise. Yes. Don't you think now the Chinese, though, can take this canceled deal to the World Trade Organization? The World Trade Organization is going to say, hey, you can't renege on a lease to get China back to the court. Well, I wish they would, because that would be proof positive that the United States is not a sovereign nation. And I've been waiting for that proof to flash in front of the American people so that they can't laugh at me when I tell them that. I think that's what they'll do. I think We're not sovereign, folks. But until they do something overtly that can be seen and understood by the American people, I can show them all the treaties and, and charters and documents and, and uh, laws and everything else that say that we're not sovereign anymore, but they're not going to believe it until it absolutely happens. If we're a sovereign nation, the World Trade Organization can't tell us what to do, can they? But they can. And if you studied NAFTA and GATT, you know that they can. Yes. We have not been a sovereign nation for a long, long time. We ceased being a sovereign nation when we signed the United Nations Charter, and it became the supreme law of the land. Well, we didn't ratify that until Reagan, right? Pardon? The United Nations Charter? Certainly we did. We didn't ratify that until Reagan. Yes, we did. Before yes, we did. Before yes. The United States created the United Nations, in case you didn't know that. No, you're talking about United Nations resolutions. The United Nations Charter was ratified in the 50s by the United States Senate. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any knowledge of the process which levitates the flying saucers and what fuel they're using to power them? No. All I know is it's something to do with electromagnetic force, whatever that is. It probably has an awful lot to do with an awful lot of patents that Nikola Tesla applied for and obtained many, many years ago. Yes, sir. In the, one of the last chapters, the last chapter of 2001, uh, about Lucifer's star rising. Uh huh. Talk about that. What, I mean, why, why is that put in there? What are they alluding to? <laughs> Besides the very obvious. Well, a Lucifer's star rising. Well, let me, gee, I hate to get into that because it's a whole other lecture altogether. <laughs> In fact, I'd rather not because it'll take up an awful lot of time and we don't have all of that time. Yes? One of my big concerns, while I, took, I understand what you say about militias, uh -huh. uh, I am concerned with affiliating myself self with people <coughs> that either don't have all their brains together or could possibly be infiltrated by government agencies. So how do you... How do you organize yourself with people who are wise enough to follow your advice about militia? Well, that's a tough one because people being people, you can't always be sure of anything with people. We've all learned that in our life. People will tell us something for six years and then prove exactly the opposite the next day. You know? And how many of us have been married to people or have been in a personal relationship with someone we thought we knew and then all of a sudden we find that's not the person we thought they were at all. How many times has that happened to all of us? How many times have we been betrayed by a best friend? There is no certainty of that. What you have to do is bring the militia into being and then educate, 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 educate. 
Uniform Code of Military Justice, Constitution, the laws of the state and the nation. Spell it out. Make them understand. And anyone who doesn't understand or demonstrates they want to go contrary to the law and the intent of the Founding Fathers in the formation and the, the organization and operation of the militia, you have to say, you're out of here, bud. And if the rest of the membership goes against you, then you have to get out of there. Because you can't be a part of something that's not right, that's not lawful, that's not constitutional, with a bunch of people who might do something stupid like these assholes down in Texas who have now taken a hostage and shot somebody. I forgot to tell you, they shot the guy in the shoulder. Stupid! These guys have sealed their fate. They're going down. And ain't nothing in the world can stop it from happening. Because they're wrong. And no one can support them when they're wrong. Yes, ma'am. Do you feel that the flooding in the Midwest that's going on right now and they're evacuating people, are they in there to take weapons and people in camps? Or what? No. It's really flooding. It's really flooding in the Midwest. They're really losing their homes. They really need help. No, it's, it's not a scam. It's, it's real. If you don't believe me, call there. And if you can get somebody to answer a phone that's three feet underwater, you'll find out. It's real. Tied in with that is I hear things about the harp system where they can control the weather and knock your cars out and communication. Yeah, but see, here's the, here's the thing I'm trying to get across to you. You hear these things. When you hear them, why don't you turn to the guy or the girl who tells it to you and say, can you prove what you just told me? Radio stuff. It doesn't matter. You can call that radio station and talk to that person and say, can you prove what you just said on the radio? Well, uh, blah, blah, blah. then why are you saying it? I've heard it in a couple of forms. One was from a guy that worked on the system. The HARP system... Did you give it any credibility? Give what credibility? The HARP the experiment is there. It's an experiment. Nobody knows what it can do. Because it's just started. They've only turned it on twice that I know of to conduct atmospheric tests with people who have ham radios to see if they could receive the signals that they were transmitting from the Alaska HARP site. HARP is designed to heat up the ionosphere and create a lens effect. They don't even know what it will do. They have some theories. They have told us what their theories are. If they're telling us the truth, it won't do anything harmful. But they don't know what it will really do, and neither do we. We know that they're fooling around with Mother Nature, and they're changing the nature of a layer in the atmosphere by heating it up to create a lens effect whereby they can transmit radio signals and other things to places where they normally couldn't do it much easier. This is what they tell us. But if you heat up the atmosphere, what are you affecting automatically, whether you want to or not? You're affecting the weather. So we know that whether they intend to or not, whether it's their purpose or not, they're going to have an effect on the weather. That's scientific fact, and you don't have to be a genius to figure it out. If they heat up the atmosphere, it's going to change or affect the weather. Is it going to be a big change, a big effect, or is it going to be minor? We don't know, and neither do they, because the experiment has just started. And all this stuff you're hearing people say is bullshit. They don't know what they're talking about. They're the fear mongers. They're the people who want to sell you some book or something. It's crazy. Somebody asked me, not somebody, counting yesterday and today, about 50 people have asked me about Val Valerian. How many of you have heard of Val Valerian? How many of you have heard of the Matrix? Matrix. Well, somebody is in here because somebody in here asked me about it. I got the answer I was looking for. Okay. Val Valerian, when he wrote the Matrix, was a captain in the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigation Counterintelligence Division. 
He's a close buddy of John Lear, who is an operative of the Central Intelligence Agency. Together, they wrote The Matrix. Now, what does that tell you? What does it tell you? Disinformation. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what a question that is. And then they wrote a whole bunch of other ones. Val Valerian was transferred from Nellis Air Force Base to Washington State, where he still publishes the Matrix 2, Matrix 3, Matrix 4, and all that kind of stuff. And it's full of crap. The rule is this. Don't hear something and go ask somebody else if it's true. You do the research and find out. If you're too lazy to do the research, quit listening to the crap. Or else, become a Looney Tunes, listen to it, believe it, and do whatever you want, but don't come to my seminars. <laughs> yes, sir? One thing I think was in text and, and folks, when I say this, I don't mean anything personal. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to get us into reality. That's all. Yes? And one of Tex Mars' newsletters, I believe it was, he talked about a little look for plutonium on a satellite that's headed for Jupiter, and some scientists think that the plutonium could ignite the atmosphere and, and create a new sun. I said that years ago. I believe it also. He said that too. So, so and that's roughly what, year 2000, when it should hit. When they talk about Lucifer's star rising, they're talking about the possible ignition of Jupiter by an experiment called Project Galileo, which is the Galileo spacecraft, which is already there. His first mission is to photograph all the moons of Jupiter so that they'll have a record before and then they'll be able to go back and see what happens afterward. Galileo is carrying two opposing banks of plutonium in the spacecraft with a hollow place in between. And it's built structurally sound so that it will not implode until it plunges deep into the atmosphere of Jupiter. When it plunges deep enough into that atmosphere, the tremendous pressures of that atmosphere will collapse that spacecraft with an implosion. The same thing that triggers the atomic bomb. Do you know how an atomic bomb is made? Two opposing banks of plutonium with an explosive around it. Hi, baby ignited to implode with, with equal pressure from all points. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. So that's the same thing that's going to happen with the Galileo spacecraft. And NASA will admit to you. They've admitted it to me and many other people who've asked them. What's going to happen to it? Well, after it photographs the final moon, which is Io, closest to Jupiter's circus, our surface, it will go into a decaying orbit around Jupiter. And around December of 1999 was the date they gave me, it will plunge into Jupiter. When it reaches the depth where the pressure is great enough, it will implode, driving these two banks of plutonium together. And it will create an atomic explosion. They said your computer turned off that day, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But here's the danger. See, an atomic explosion on Jupiter is not enough to ignite Jupiter into a sun. But if that spacecraft is deep enough within the atmosphere to cause that implosion, and the atomic explosion takes place at a depth in the atmosphere where the pressure is strong enough to hold that explosion, it will turn from a fission reaction into a fusion reaction and Jupiter will become a sun. I have talked to scientists who say yes it can happen. I have talked to scientists who say it's ridiculous, it could never happen. I have talked to scientists who scratch their head and say I don't really know. I have talked to Arthur C. Clarke who wrote the book about this really happening and he said that when he wrote the book NASA was extremely interested. Allison, stop. Come here, right now. Thank you, baby. I love you so much. Go with little Pooh. Go with Pooh. You got her? 
Pô. É eu. Go with Pooh. Ok. Bye bye. See you later. Arthur C. Clarke said when he wrote the book, he was grilled by NASA. Now, how do we know NASA's in all of this stuff? Look at the dates of the NASA programs, the landings on the moon, manned and unmanned. Compare them to the symbolism of the mysteries. And then take a look at old Kleindienst. You know who Kleindienst is? He was the man who was the head of NASA during the Apollo space program. Who is Kleindienst today? He's the Supreme Inspector General of the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. How's that for a kick in the butt? <clears throat> Yeah. He's the big cheese. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, concerning the people who, who are uh, dealing with the obelisks and the reflecting pools, are these people behind this actually enslaved to this religion, or are they, or are they just using the symbology as a way to communicate? They're not enslaved to it. They believe in it. They believe that they're, what they're doing is the best thing for all of humanity. It's their religion. And what is that religion? All of these things, the symbols, are just a way of expressing a metaphor. And the metaphor is this, that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God. He was set free by Lucifer through his agent Satan with the gift of intellect, the use of which mankind will conquer nature and the universe and man will become God. So it is secular humanism. It is the religion of Marxist socialism and communism and has always been that religion and nothing else. The enemies of freedom hide behind many different veils and occupations and names and organizations, but when you come right down to the very bottom of it, they are always socialist, communist, secular, humanist. That is their religion. Always. The obelisk is the symbol of the generative force, the intellect, thought, desire, action. Remember what I taught you? Okay, any other questions? Yes. Okay, when we had the Apollo 13 disaster and the Challenger disaster, how, how widespread has the knowledge of the I don't know to tell you the truth, but it would have been in the upper echelon. The, the very number of the mission would have told the initiates what was happening. It was the death of the space program, wasn't it? Never went to the moon again, or anywhere else for that matter. And a new NASA was born out of that event. And they went to the shuttle program. The death, the rebirth the resurrection as something different. A question on the obelisks. Um, do, do they all work in concert, people in South America, talk with people in South yes. America, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. In all the great cities of the, in big cities of the world, there are yes. obelisks. So do they all mean exactly the same exactly thing? Exactly the same thing. You had the opportunity to see them in a lot of countries, but never knew what it meant. Let me tell you how widespread this is. <clears throat> how many of you know about the Gorbachev Foundation? Hmm. What is the flag of the Gorbachev Foundation? A green cross on a white field. What was the flag that Columbus planted on the sand on the first time he set foot in the Americas? A green cross on a white field. How about that? Why did he do that? Wasn't he sailing in the name of the Queen of Spain? Didn't she finance his exposition? Wasn't he supposed to claim those lands for Spain? 
Wasn't the first flag planted supposed to be the flag of the royal house of Spain? But it wasn't. It was the flag of the society which he truly represented, using the Queen of Spain's money. How many of you have been to Las Vegas? How many of you have seen the MGM Grand from the air? What is it? A huge green cross. At the entrance, there is a huge lion's head. And what is the lion head staring at? The Luxor. Staring directly at the Luxor Hotel. What are they building out there? I mean, what is it? It's supposed to be. It's supposed to turn out to be. <laughs> yes, sir. Admiral Borda was murdered. I mean, have you heard, heard any more? Uh, do you have any more information than that? I've got lots of information. We published the whole story in our newspaper. It might be over there. He shot himself in the heart twice. That's tough anyway. Oh, it's really tough, and a military man would never shoot himself in the chest with anything, and especially a thirty-eight. Admiral Burda, if he was going to shoot himself, would have shot himself in the head with a 45. And he wouldn't have gone out on the lawn to do it. And he left supposedly two letters, which they won't let us see, because they weren't signed. <laughs> You'll leave a letter for your wife. Are you not going to sign it? Huh? You leave a letter for anybody. Are you not going to sign it? You're going to type it up and leave it laying around? and then go outside, shoot yourself in the chest twice with a 38 caliber pistol? A career, lifetime, military man? Not on your life. Admiral Burda was murdered. I don't know why he was murdered, but he was murdered. First he was set up to be discredited, and then he was murdered. Yes? Me too. I'm thoroughly confused. Do the, do the people behind this man, do, did they truly believe that there was a man of Osiris? No, these are metaphors. You're getting the symbology mixed up with the message. These are, you know what a metaphor is? There's your problem. Where's a dictionary? Your homework is to look up the word metaphor. Okay? But are all these obelisks just truly only symbols of the stages of mankind and they're not, they don't... No, the obelisk is the symbol of the generative force, the phallus. Okay? You know what a phallus is? When you go home tonight, take off your clothes, look in the mirror. <laughs> We're dealing with a young man over here. I'm not making fun of you. I know you have questions. I think he's doing great. I think he's doing wonderful. And, and I commend him for being here because the future belongs to him. But these are some things that you're going to have to look up. Your problem is not with what you're hearing. Your problem is that you don't know the meaning of some of the words that we're talking about. If you knew the meanings of those words, you wouldn't be having a problem. But we're beyond the point where I can spend any more time on that. Otherwise, I certainly would. But uh, if you'll write me a personal letter, I'll make sure you get enough material to keep you busy for a long time, okay? So if you'll do that, I'll take care of you. Yes, sir? What's, uh, could you give us some kind of an idea of what your future is as far as radio, satellite, or whatever is going on? Because I've listened to you. I did yesterday, spent over an hour on it. <laughs> can you give me a brief, like, All I can tell you is I'm on satellite GE1, transponder 7, 7.56 audio right now where we have a worldwide freedom radio network. We are putting together a network of low power FM stations across the country which are rebroadcasting our programming and other programming and even programming of their own. And uh, we're on uh, WRMI, worldwide shortwave radio out of Miami, Florida. That's 9955 kilohertz. 
We're on Monday through Friday, 5 until 7 p.m. daylight standard time. We'll go to only one of those hours. I don't know which one yet on May the 7th. From what time to what time? 5 to 7 daylight Eastern. Yes? Terry Reed, any idea on what's happening here? I don't even know who Terry Reed is. So he wrote that book, Compromise? I haven't even read it. <laughs> Never heard of him. There are people I've never heard of, just like there are people you've never heard of. I'm just like you guys. I don't know everybody. I know some people. But I'll tell you this. If I don't know the person, they're not way high up in patriot, real patriot community, I can tell you that. Because I know all of the high up people in the real patriot community. Many of whom none of you will ever know. Okay? But that doesn't mean he's not a good person or he shouldn't read his book. I don't know who he is, never read the book. Any other questions? Then we're going to start the video. One more, yes. What kind of support are you willing to accept or what kind of support? How can you be supported from our community? What kind of support are you talking about? Whatever it takes. I mean, it's, it's not cheap to run a radio station. It's not no, it's not. If, if anybody wants to make a donation, they can make it out to the Independence Foundation Trust, which is the only trust that we have that can accept any kind of a charitable donation. And then can, it, the purpose of the trust is to save the country. Every penny that goes into that trust goes toward doing that, educating the American people. Okay? If you want to contribute to the phone uplink fund to the satellite uplink for the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network, you can make those donations out to Harvest Trust. Those are different kinds of donations from the listenership of the, of the network. If you want to contribute information, just send it. Don't ever call me and ask me if I want something. The answer is always yes. And I don't even care what it is. If it's information, I want it. If it's a book, I want it. If it's a newspaper article, I want it. If it's something that came off the Patriot Facts Network, I don't ever want it. Never. Okay? Yes, sir? This entire program going to be on uh, audio or video? It's on video. You can order it right back there. It's $45 a day. It's two tapes, six hours each day. Uh, and I think there's $5 postage and handling. If you want both days, it's $100, including postage and handling. I didn't set it up. I didn't do it. I'm just telling you what it is because you want it. <laughs> See Doyle. He's the guy handling all that stuff. I came here by invitation. Yeah, we're having a conference in the state of Arizona from June 30th through July 4th, and including that night. And uh, that's intense. That's five solid days from the time you get up in the morning until midnight. You're, you belong to me. That's Kaji and the Intelligence Service, yeah. What do you require of people that become Kaji members? I know how the process to get in, but once you're in... Are you we put you to work, we require you to work. It's not like other things where you join and you pay your dues and, and uh, you get some benefits and you don't have to do anything. If you join our organization, you must work. If you don't, we'll kick you out. Simple as that. We're, our, our focus is something different. We want to save this country. We don't want to mess around. If you don't want to be a part of us, we don't want to mess with you. We don't, at the same time, mean that you're a bad person or anything else. We just don't have time for it. We want people who are committed, want to work, want to produce, want to do something. Who had a question back there? Yes, sir. Are the Native Americans being involved? Yes, I'm one. You're looking at one. 
Not all the tribes, no. You'll find on every reservation, amongst the Native American communities, there are two types of Native Americans. One is the traditionalist that loves freedom just like me and has been fighting forever to gain it back and keep it. Okay? Those of you who have read about some of those battles, you know. The other is the hang around the Ford Indians. The hang around the Ford Indians have been bought and paid for. They're socialists. They want their blanket from the government every week. They want their little paycheck so that they can go to Indian heaven, which is Walmart. <laughs> and uh, they want the government to take care of them. And they'll do anything to please the government, including ratting on the traditionalists and even killing the traditionalists or anything else they have to do. <clears throat> and yes, the traditionalists are with us, whoever we may be. The hang around the Fort Indians, <laughs> no, no, they're socialists.